Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks for joining us on this November 5th. Who's General Theme is Youth and Public Empowerment. Thank, thanks also to the speakers for having us back to, uh, accepted to share their know-how and experiences with us. I would like uh, also to warmly thank the team of the French Pavilion of the COP26. During the next hour and a half, we'll be exploring the following question. How does climate education strengthen citizen awareness? That's the question. Reflecting on this question is essential in order to propose an upward path out of the double crisis we are going through that is both democratic and environmental. Today, the environmental crisis is increasingly perceptible. The summer's climatic disasters have impacted large parts of the world's population, including regions that were previously only slightly affected by climate change. This year's uh, famine in Madagascar, the first one caused by anthropogenic global warming, has left more than 30,000 people starving and 1.8 million malnourished. The consequences of these disruptions on our human activities are also increasingly being felt, as the IPCC reminds us in the first volume of its sixth assessment report. I quote, climate change is already affecting all inhabited regions of the world, with human influence contributing to many of the observed changes in weather patterns and climate extremes. End of quote. In the last 18 months, due to the COVID crisis, the lives of many people on all continents have been disrupted, making the vulnerability of our systems to any disruption visible and noticeable. There is growing concern among the population, especially among young people. In the world of climate associations, we often hear of anxiety about future crises and about the capacity of our societies to change our lifestyles to build a future that is livable for all. This phenomenon called eco-anxiety is increasingly widespread among the population, especially among young people, as defined by Alice Debiol, who is a public health physician. Eco-anxiety is, I quote, the anticipatory anxiety that can be caused by the various scenarios established by scientists, such as those of the IPCC, on the viability of the planet in the coming decades. End of quote. According to a study published in The Lancet in September 2021, eco-anxiety affects young people all over the world, and particularly in the South. Among the countries studied, the Philippines, India, and Brazil are the countries where the feeling of eco anxiety is the strongest. 85% of young people in the Philippines say they are very or extremely anxious about climate issues. This phenomenon also strongly affects the countries of the north, particularly in Portugal, where nearly 65% of young people suffer from eco-anxiety. In order to get out of this eco-anxiety, which can lead to deep depression, some people, like Alice de Biol, recommend taking action. Climate education is therefore a fundamental tool in this transition to action and a way out of the lethargy induced by eco-anxiety. However, in France, education and climate issues is still not taught in the educa educational programs of students up to the baccalaureate. Education for citizenship, on the other hand, is taught in three ways in the national education system. Mm -hmm. Through civic education, traditional courses of French on French institutions. Uh, second, the participation of pupils in the governance and, and life of schools. And third, citizenship project that makes students active in associative projects within or outside the schools. Citizenship education is mainly focused on this first axis of top-down courses. This is unfortunate, as research shows that for citizens to be engaged throughout their lives, engagement must start at school and be reinforced throughout their studies. The voluntary sector can help to overcome can help overcoming these shortcomings. Indeed, climate education 
as it has developed in recent years, is never content with being a top-down course but mobilizes the skills needed to develop civic awareness among participants. Moreover, involvement in associations in one's neighborhood, city, or even a national or international scale appears to be an effective lever for better living or even overcoming feelings of eco-anxiety. Finally, making climate education accessible could meet both an individual need for audiences suffering from eco-anxiety and a collective need by raising the civic awareness of trained audiences and enabling them to take action. Through the experiences of our speakers, we will sketch out an answer to the following question. How does climate education help to strengthen civic awareness? In order to answer this question, we have the pleasure to welcome four panelists, as, such as Sofia Chiani, who is the founder of Climate Cardinals, an association that aims at translating information on climate change into over 100 languages. She also represents the United States as the youngest member of the United Nations Secretary General's Youth Advisa Advisory Group on Climate Change. Uh, sitting next to her, Cedric Ringenbach, president of the and founder of the Climate Fresco and CEO of Blue Choice. Mm, sitting next to him, Manon Boris, head of energy and climate at the RESES, Réseau Étudiant pour une Société Écologique et Solidaire. And finally, William Face, the president of Climate. Just to, for a good start, I will uh, give the floor to Sophia. Sophia, uh, what's, your, what's your initiative about? Can you uh, present it? It's, oh, can you guys hear me? Okay, there we go. Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Chiani and I am a 19 year old climate activist from the United States. Uh, I was inspired to become a climate activist and to really act on the issue of climate education when I took a two month trip to Iran, which is my parents' home country. Uh, when I was there, I was struck by how horrible pollution was, so bad I couldn't even see the stars at night. Uh, and I began to talk to my relatives about the issue of climate change, and I realized they knew almost nothing because there was a severe lack of climate education available in Farsi, which is Iran's native language. So I worked to translate climate information into Farsi to teach my relatives about climate change, and I was able to witness how increasingly alarmed they became and how they really wanted to act on the issue and to educate those around them. And so in high school, after organizing with groups like Fridays for Future and Extinction Rebellion, I decided to start Climate Cardinals, which is an international youth-led nonprofit working to make climate education more accessible to those who don't speak English. So we translate climate education into over 100 languages, including Yoruba, Somali, Swahili. Um, and so we really believe that by making sure that those who need access to climate education the most, by giving them these resources, we can empower them to understand these disasters that are destroying their communities so they know what they can do about it. Now, Cédric, Presse du Climat, Cédric. The microphone doesn't work. On the bottom of the microphone. I, um, I work on climate change for uh, more than 10 years, and I uh, quickly uh, used to organize uh, trainings and also um, conferences about climate change and one day I decided that uh, top-down uh, conferences are not enough and it's nice to have something where people can participate because it's a much more efficient way to learn climate change um, so we 
uh, I decided to try a, a format for teaching, which is uh, which later has been called the climate fresque, and it's um, it's uh, it's based on the fact that uh, you you will have to put together cards and make the connections between cause and effects. So I tried that one day. I put a card. So, uh, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I put some drafts of IPCC report uh, on the table for my students. Thank you, Emma. And um, I asked them to put uh, connections between cause and effect. And I looked at the people playing, and I realized that the discussion were really the one you need to have. I understood that what was going on in their head was precisely how you learn about, uh, about climate change. So I improved that uh, workshop day after day. Now it looks like this. It's a set of 42 cards. And the principle is still the same. It's very simple. Just put the cards on the table. People need to make the connections of cause and effect. And this exercise is very, very efficient to learn about. So what do we get when we have people do this, uh, this workshop? At the end. Most of the people say, I thought I knew about climate change, but in fact, it's uh, much more uh, serious than what I was thinking initially. And so it's a shock for many people. And um, after having put the cards on the table, we have a discussion of one hour to talk about the climate. What can be done at the personal level? at my company's level, uh, at uh, the political level in my country. And then when they, when they go back, uh, they, they feel they can do something about it. They feel a bit overwhelmed, but still they think they can do something and they, they can start to work about, uh, about this topic. Um, and so what happened next is that uh, many people played the game and wanted to become facilitators. So I trained a few dozens of facilitators. Then I trained one, two, four trainers of facilitators. And it, it went viral. It, uh, it had an organic uh, growth, very, very quick growth. Uh, that was three and a half years ago. Uh, so at that time, only 1,000 people had played the game. And today, it's more than 200,000 people, and we expect to reach the first million during next year. And so the point is we need to reach billions of people. So if you want to reach billions, billions of people, you need to rely on an exponential of this kind, this kind of rate of uh, deployment. And uh, so we, I don't know how it happened, but it works. The, the workshop works very well. The people like it, the people get trained. And, uh, and we are still on the same exponential, which is that we double all the figures every six months. Uh, so we, one of the conditions to, to change things uh, globally is the scalability of the solutions. So I will leave the floor for, to the next speakers. And I, I propose that we, we talk about how to scale up all the initiatives you, have, you are working on are very good initiatives, and they need to speed up and to reach the global level very soon. So that's what I propose to talk about. Merci beaucoup. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Cédric. So I'll give the floor again to Manon. She is responsible for the uh, climate energy. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, I'm working in the civil service within our network for an ecologic and solidary uh, society. I'm in, in charge of everything that's related to energy and climate, which is, among others, why I'm uh, with you today. Our aim is having 100% sustainable um, cam campuses in France and to have 100% uh, students committed w into environmental projects. We, we try to train uh, students using uh, different tools, such as Fresque, Fresque pour le Climat and other ones, 
There is also a, a part, a lobbying part. We are uh, making a bit of advocacy uh, to make our voices heard because very often what happens is our voices, the students' voices, are not heard enough and we can observe that here at the COP26. So we try to gather students and various associations dealing with solidarity or environment uh, which allow us to create good uh, good tools and to make good voices heard for all these people can cooperate and go towards more tangible changes. So we are uh, present in more than 140 universities in France. So it, it keeps growing day after day and we do hope that someday we'll meet our objectives, which are quite, we, we, we set the bar, the, the bars quite high, but we'll get there, we'll go about it. Thank you, Manon. Now I will give the floor to William Faith, the uh, climate uh, chair. Thank you, Luca. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a student myself, uh, strategic and international relations in policies and uh, advocacy. And I'm, I'm the chair of, the, of one of the initiatives in which I take part. It's a laboratory, it's a think tank and an action tank upon the climate issues, what we want is to make uh, playmakers and players from students and not only beneficiaries. We have three main leverages, which are advocacy, uh, bearing uh, youth, youth's voices, uh, awareness raising through climate education. So we have two main tools. Uh, we have uh, international negotiations workshops. It's a when uh, students play the role of negotiators, such as states or other parties, uh, energy um, panels or agriculture panels, so they, they, they play the role, uh, they, they, like actors, they play, they play negotiators and they try to come up with uh, compromises, with agreements that are a bit above the real ones. Then we also um, work upon Heat waves. It's a more of a local initiative, and here as well, uh, students play the role of uh, civil societies, associations, NGOs, in order to uh, find solutions concerning the heat waves. And we have one last tool, which is uh, popular, uh, popular science, making science accessible to the wide uh, public. There are two other tools, two other projects. There is IHO for France, which is it is quite complementary. Uh, it's, your vo it's named Your Voice Counts. Uh, in May 2022, there, there will be a summit in France and we want youth to be represented over there and we want youngsters to take the floor and we want their voices to be heard by uh, French presidency. Uh, as a student, I'm also, I also work, I'm committed and determined um, in another initiative that aims at uh, facilitating intergenerational work. It's called Make Some Space for the Youngsters, Faites Place aux Jeunes, uh, the aim being to develop tools for youngsters to have some space for them within, in, within instances, within companies, so that together with people that are present, we, we can create relationships and cooperate to favor uh, space for youngsters within projects. Thank you. Um. Sophia, je... William, Sophia, uh, it's one of the, study, the, the things you study, uh, education and uh, raising awareness about the clim climate. Could you give us your point of view on, uh, on the subject and the challenges international, uh, on the international scale? I would like you to, uh, to, to tell us more uh, about these challenges. Is it working? There we go. Uh, so right now I am currently a student. I'm a first year at Stanford and I'm studying science, technology and society with a concentration in politics and policy. Uh, and so I care deeply about education, furthering my own education and making sure that people around the world have access to quality climate education. Uh, because I think that I'm often asked, what can I do about the climate crisis? And people often feel 
powerless because they don't understand the scale of the issue and they also don't know what are tangible actions that I can take. And the reality is that the climate crisis is a systematic issue. And so no matter how much personal behaviors change and how much consumers alter their personal consumption habits, we're still going to be faced with the roots of the climate crisis, which is ingrained in climate policy. And so I love to teach people about climate change because then they can understand, well, then the power of my vote counts. So they learn about climate change, they start to care about climate change, and then they'll go out and they'll vote for climate-friendly candidates, candidates that pledge to take action on the climate crisis. Um, and so I, I think that climate education and education in general is so influential in empowering people to feel like they, they can make a difference and that the, the work that they're doing matters. Thank you, Sophia. Cedric. Uh, we, the Climate Fest has been already, already translated in 35 languages, but uh, we would be happy to reach 100 languages, maybe, if you had. Uh, so do you think our two associations could work together about that? Yes, we would love to. I mean, it's so important, especially because 35 is already amazing, but considering most NGOs only do like the six UN languages that accounts for less than half of the world's speaking population, I think the issue of language accessibility is huge. So that's awesome to hear you want to work more on it. OK, great. So we will talk about it later. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Thank you very much. By the way, uh, uh, Cedric, I had a question for you. The uh, education for the climate, you can answer in different ways. In the first, you have different, you have tools that mobilizes the, the participants that are engaged during uh, the, the whole workshop. Could you tell us why these tools do work? Uh, why did you take this choice? What do you do uh, with these tools? How, how, how come these tools work so good? I. I think one of the reasons why it works well is uh, that it's interactive, it's not top-down, and uh, the, the neuroscience tell us about uh, edu education that, uh, uh, I mean, at least people who are uh, specialized in pedagogy, they tell us that uh, you remember things better when you act at one point. And so that's the reason why the fact of putting several people around the table doing something and doing it together uh, is a key to success. Is the fact that uh, <coughs> you you learn by uh, try and fail. Uh, you you put the cards on the table. You make a mistake. You you correct it. You disagree with people. You argue. When you argue, it's very important to have to to look for the right words. Uh, and um, and by doing that, you you really need to reorganize your thoughts. And um, and by that you you learn a lot. Uh, it's like when you know when we say that uh, when you teach something, uh, it's uh, it's a very good way to learn to learn it. And uh, so it's it's a bit the same kind of uh, of uh, mechanism. Uh, but then um, then apart from that, uh, I, I I didn't really do it on purpose. The climate fresh, I just tried something and I realized that it works. So then I improved it. But I, I did not. Um, I was maybe I was not able to, to, to do it on purpose. So that's like like many things that succeeded. That it's uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, an accident. And now why it's working? I think it, it the, the the fact that it can scale up. That's because people like the experience, and then they are very motivated to become trainers and facilitators themselves. And the rate of uh, transformation between a, a, a player and a facilitator, this is key for the for the growth. Um, and then, um, well, that's that's mainly based on the fact that uh, they had a good experience. And all it's also one reason for us to keep the right level for moderation. You need to have very good uh, facilitators who who bring a good experience to the players. Si je peux me permettre de réagir, Lucas. Euh, moi, j'appuie totalement ce que vient de dire euh, Cédric. If I may allow to myself to react, we are not 
in a defending model. What I'm saying, for some, it works. We, we all have our ways to understand things. Some appreciate the, this model. We in climate, this is what we have rise to. This is the, the cooperative model. When people work together, looking for solutions uh, on challenges, whether it's uh, uh, the international neg negotiations or uh, within the city to, to fight against uh, a wave of heat. So we reinforce the legitimacy. So the youngsters, uh, they can play the role of, uh, of a deciding person. So I take a position. So once uh, my, uh, uh, I rose my awareness, I, it reinforces my civic uh, conscience. This is how I understand it. How do I uh, imply myself for the good of the society in which we, I am? So it's reinforcing the legitimacy, legitimacy of the youngsters and to understand I'm able to and then to go uh, speak with the, the, with politicians and tell them, this is what we did, uh, this is what we've imagined, so why don't you do this? Of course, the challenges may be different, but the youngsters are able to take decisions and to find measures that are in, uh, innovative and that have an impact. Thank you, William. We've been talking about the uh, modalities, about the way these games uh, function, these games, these, uh, these workshops, these trainings, uh, I'd be interested in uh, knowing to what kind of people this, uh, for what kind of people these trainings have been created, and how about the, uh, the to what extent they are interested, and what type of people are, are taking part in, not in terms of quantity, but in terms of commitment. Yeah, I'll keep on talking uh, in French. Uh, Within the fresque du climat, there is a question that is often raised and asked, being the one you asked, to whom are you speaking? What, uh, we often talk to people who are already climate activists, that's true, and the social media make we live within bubbles, so it's very difficult to make this, uh, this scope wider. And this is a huge challenge for all the activist associations to make them voice their voices heard by people who don't think the way the, the think the, the way we think. It doesn't concern only ecology and environmentalism, but other uh, from a political point of view, is the same thing. And uh, environmentalism is uh, a political ideology. So, and you have to um, to uh, to make it to other. You have to make to. Sp speak up with uh, people who are not used to, uh, to hearing your, your, your voice and with people who don't agree with you. And it's far harder, and that's a huge challenge, of course, because some don't hear us, some hear us but don't agree with us. That's right. Uh, within the RESES, we, we'll, we, we speak mainly to students and we struggle with uh, speaking with, uh, with other people. And I also have the feeling that the only people who hear, hear us already agree with us anyway. So what's tricky is to uh, make our voices heard by other people that are even more uh, affected by climate change, even more vulnerable, uh, but lack access to education and sometimes are less aware of climate change, quite paradoxically, and uh, sometimes don't agree with us or sometimes don't hear our voices and, and feel a bit left behind and not legitimate when it comes to this fight that is sometimes seen as something uh, elitist or taken um, or being um, a thing for the, uh, for the richest, for the most educated, uh, for the high degree students. What, what we, we want to show is that it is everybody's story Climate change is not a story that, that, that is to be read only by a few. I would like to underline one thing. We want to uh, make our voices heard by people who lack access to education. We don't want to speak only to those who do have a s access to education. Uh, we, ha we want our voices to be heard and by the right as well, to, s to speak in political terms, not only by the left. So, um, so it, it, it takes crossing uh, the walls between bubbles uh, on social media. Uh, that's a fact. So it's sometimes it's not a, a, a story about a lack 
of access to information, but a lack of access to some other kind of information, because everybody has a kind of access to some information, but within a, within a given bubble. We are also live in bubbles. We have to be aware of that. Uh, Sophia, uh, are these questions, do they look the same way for you? How is it in your, in your situation? I think for me, what I often think about is that we operate within echo chambers, like you were saying. And so, especially for climate activists, even when you're posting on social media, most of the people are following you because they like your climate content. And so how do you reach people outside of this bubble that you've created? I think that it, it, part of it is about engaging in dialogue with unexpected actors. Like you said, we do need to be reaching across the table, like left and right, both political parties. I think that everyone needs to be engaged in these dialogues. And especially on the issue of translation, that's helping us to access new populations that might not typically be engaged in these conversations, especially when you consider 75% of the world doesn't speak English. We have translators for this event right now. Um, and so I, I think that it is something to be very mindful of, especially for young people, because I do think we tend to say the same things over and over and talk to the same people, um, especially because we tend to talk to students or we tend to operate with other students. But we need to really also enforce intergenerational dialogue, reaching out to new groups and seeing where are different places where we can make a difference and reach these populations that maybe they know about climate change, but they don't understand how extinguent the issue is and what we can do about it and why people should care. I'd like to react upon, uh, to build upon what has been said. Uh, I would like to say that I, I strongly agree uh, with you. We all have uh, the will to make our voices heard by uh, a, a widespread, a wide scope of people, both politically, uh, when it comes to age, when it comes to uh, languages. But when it comes to, to youngsters, the access to information and the understanding of, of topics is different. And that's the first issue. Uh, it would be a lie to say that uh, the, the scope of people who hear us, who, is f who follows us, who follow us, is wide. It's not wide. We would like to make it far wider, but uh, I'm afraid there are, there are strong and solid and quite um, sealed information bubbles. We, all, we, we tend to, uh, to stay within these bubbles and we have, to, we have to come beyond, we have to jump out from our bubbles uh, s through creating partnerships with associations that are specialized in uh, talking to, to, to youngsters um, no matter what their political options are. And that's, uh, that's reinforcing uh, conscience. It's about creating uh, links with other, um, with other associations more committed, uh, which is what we do with Comicite, it's a civil, civil society initiator. We are developing an engagement path with uh, this association, with, with, with Contratac, with Comicite. We are training, uh, we're training people in the f on in the field of taking the floor of speaking uh, publicly, such as we are doing now. So you, this is a way to speak to people that you you wouldn't be speaking to uh, beforehand, before because th they are not within your bubble, but you you build links that way, uh, and that's that's what it takes. It's about finding a, a path towards people you you wouldn't reach. Add is that. Um, I think one of the problems is also that we shouldn't only focus on young people, especially because a study six years ago found that 40%, two out of five adults in the world, had never heard about climate change. So increasingly we see that young people, the younger generation, were getting access to quality climate education. Finally, schools are implementing climate curriculum. But what about the people like 20 years removed from us, older than us, who never had access to clim quality climate education and might not be as informed. Uh, and so I think we definitely need to take that into account in our approaches of like, yes, we are making like climate curriculum available in schools and we're talking a lot with young people, but now the young population is energized and has a great understanding of climate change. So how do we now reach the older generation that still might not know much about climate change or might still be climate skeptic? Um, 
Um, Thank you. What I, what I see here is that we're talking about initiatives touching uh, different audiences. When you, do we have examples of itineraries of people that uh, life changes after workshops? Uh, we with different uh, workshops uh, in town. Do you have examples of people who started with by uh, by uh, some a workshop and then who uh, who became much more involved, concretely involved, uh, whether it's in within the uh, the, the association or an, or a, a public institution uh, in order to uh, to participate and to change the world. If if I may. I think there are hundreds of examples, but I think it's very important to, to remind that uh, it's my personal opinion. I'm not sure that one workshop will allow to transform. It's like a, like a, like a crop that will have to grow. It takes time. It's relationships, contacts, discussing with people, uh, with people who don't who disagree with you, meeting people and uh, mutually uh, train each other and uh, be among young people, uh, among generations, between generations, we can, we can do things. I will take an example that I met uh, in climate, uh, Pauline, uh, who may be looking at us today, who entered uh, into climate by accident. She, uh, she was on Facebook or something and who, who became uh, very engaged on our side. Then she's learned about the, the challenges and she's so uh, engaged with us and we, she works on a, for an uh, excellent event that we are organizing in, in December in Warsaw. And she's a voluntary, she's re really, uh, it's, uh, it strengthens her uh, engagement. I think that the workshop is some sort of pretext that will uh, start and reinforce the, the knowledge. But then, next, it's the links that you tie with other people that will allow you to go further. I am convinced that is through the cooperation that you can uh, wake up the civic conscience, awareness, and to work together. I'm not in contact with all the people who, uh, who made the first because they are very numerous. But I heard opinions from people uh, there were people who clearly told me that was a trigger. I'm not talking about anyone, someone who's completely changed his life, his job, who loved, he left his job and who dedicated his life entirely to, uh, to this type of activities in order to change the world. I am I'm very touched to see these things like that. You are absolutely right. It's like a grain that you put in the, in the soil and it will grow up, it will become a crop and it will grow as a tree. And then you'll join the community, you'll engage yourself and, uh, and so on and so on. We've, we've had uh, absolutely incredible examples. Many persons who m met uh, the fresh, at the beginning of the personal transition, so it's been, it became like an accelerator of the, this transformation. They came to the first because they were asking themselves uh, questions about the, the, the issues. So they were actually already changing their jobs. And the fresk became a new job, a new way of life. And they became uh, professional moderators of the, of the fresk. It's one of the, the things that I uh, see as incredibly positive uh, with our project. They are associative. Uh, they allow to people to make their lives, to uh, to make money uh, while working for a client. Uh, the, the uh, I mean, you, you don't have to be a voluntary uh, worker. You can you can you can make money on it. Just gain. It, yes, the, I, I think it's cool. It's excellent uh, that the association allows a lot of to a lot of young people to to make money with their activity. I fully, I fully agree, uh, the, 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 the agree with the, the story of the grain and growing and so on and so on. But as we youngsters, we not need to be accompanied to, uh, 
as you were saying, Cedric, uh, there's lots of uh, job connected with the environment. We, uh, we propose, uh, we invite professionals to, to, they come, they talk about what they're doing, they propose scholarships and all sorts of uh, uh, activities. So we have lots of feedback out of it. People telling that it was extremely useful and it shows you th that you can uh, engage the directly and uh, for the future through this small work, shops and so on and so on. Thank you very much. So as we've seen, there are pathways that have been modified. There are life pathways, professional path paths that have been, that have changed and changes for everybody are an important thing. But Cedric has asked how to upscale initiatives. There is uh, a Paris Initiative member that is to join us for the last, last half an hour. But until then, I wanted to ask you how within initiatives you manage to scale up projects to, uh, to ensure their maintenance and how do you grow things? How do you grow things Sometimes very quickly, by the way. I think I'll start because I have kind of a funny story about this. So my nonprofit, I started it about um, a year and a half ago, and we launched through a TikTok video. Uh, so I had one of my friends make a video explaining like what the concept of our nonprofit was and inviting people to volunteer with us. And so the video ended up going viral, and it reached a couple hundred thousand people. And now, today, we have over 8,000 volunteers in 41 countries with an average age of just 16. And so we were able to very successfully leverage social media, the power of just organic word of mouth engagement to mobilize thousands of people to join us. And so I think that in the current age, leveraging social media is so critical for getting people involved in the fight for climate action, especially because I think even with the rise of youth climate activism, so much of the strikes, so much of like the words of activists is spread through the media, through press, through social media. Uh, and I, I think that because of this, it's so critical for us as climate leaders to be engaging on social media to make sure as many people far and wide can hear our message. Um, merci, Lucas, for cette Thank you for this question. Uh, it is a, a crucial one indeed. I think that there, there is a question about growing within activities that is to be asked. Uh, how do we do in order to engage as many people as it takes? I have also a very concrete example. Uh, high school students in Sable in France, it's a very little town. Um, one of our volunteers um, led a, a training over there uh, they didn't know a thing about heat waves in cities, but they, get, they got some, some degree of awareness thanks to the workshop, and they started to organize themselves workshops in other classrooms, in other classes, in other schools. So it's, uh, it grows then exponentially. I've been trained, I've taken part in a workshop, I found it to be interesting and important, so now I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going about it and making the same thing on my own to, uh, to, to train to other, other youngsters in my age, and that is the force of, uh, it's a culture, it's, it's a common culture, it's the feeling of being part of a, of, a, of a team. It's about strengthening links between people, between activities, between projects. It, it's not always, it's not only awareness raising, it's meeting people, it's, m it's connecting with people. It's about human relationships. It's about making friends. And uh, I, I like very much this compari comparison between uh, this uh, love relationship. Uh, you discover, first you, first you are afraid, but you, you take a look, you discover some, somebody, and uh, y it's, it takes time, but you, you, you straighten some links. And this is, this is about growing. It's growing human relationships, hu growing ties between people, like in a, 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 an, uh, a romantic relationship or like in friendship, because it's about friendship, it's about community, it's about team building uh, for the message to be heard as 
widespread as possible. Uh, I'd like to build upon what has been said as well. Uh, we've been talking about th the fact that we have to make a living out of our main job sooner or later. And if we have, should we have to grow, it can only be, we, can on we cannot have only um, no cash in hand volunteers. You know, it has to become a job. If you want to have a proper tool, you have to ask the, um, the question about the business aspect of things. And I do talk about it with, uh, uh, with uh, some friends from other associations, um, with Kemet Interactive in France, and uh, with uh, quality leaders, that some tools have to be available uh, free of charge. But sometimes it is not possible to sell anything, and that's a bit of a glass roof. That's a bit of a limit. You can't go very far without making something wi wi when everything is free of charge. Uh, I, I mean, it seems nice on paper, but if you can't pay anyone for anything, it becomes a bit of a barrier, in fact. There are things that should, could sh should be usable by companies, uh, and they would, uh, and they would, uh, they would pay, for example, ten percent for our association. Ten percent is enough. If we were to take ten percent, we would, we would, we would, we could live on, and we could have people who work for our association uh, on an everyday basis, five days a week, uh, and that would be, uh, and then it, it would be a bit of a virtuous cycle because the more we would grow, the more money we would raise the more money we would raise, the more we would be structured, and the more we would grow, and we would become more professional and more eff efficient. I've been having a chat with uh, a, 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 a friend from the Climate, climate Loyalty Leaders. They train hundreds, if not thousands, of people. There are 48,000 people th who have been trained in, uh, in the scope of um, workshops leading. It's a huge and extraordinary project, the, the biggest uh, popularization project that has been organized lately. But there is a limit when it comes to their business model because they are not allowed to make that kind of, to perform that kind of things for money. And that's a pity because some people could become professionals. And, and when it's coming to it, you can only get become a specialist when you become a professional. And it's a, it's, a, it's a question of legal framework, in fact, it's just forbidden. That's the law. Um, because of uh, f contracts that have been signed that way, uh, it's, it's a sign that you cannot raise money, you cannot make money in that project. We, we asked in France the national um, fiscal authorities for to in order to become a non-profit uh, association. We didn't become one, so we, we do pay taxes. Um, but I and it's it sounds bad on paper. Oh, you poor, poor, poor to it. You have to pay taxes, but it's good because we we are able to raise money. So it has downwards and it ha it has its qualities. So it's quite interesting. It's a constraint, but it gives you a d certain degree of freedom. You pay taxes, but you have the right to uh, to get some money every now and then. I propose one thing which is to uh, think upon changing business models, but perhaps we, we would have to, uh, to merge with another trust trust. Because sometimes if you don't do that, you can't grow exponential as the way we do. And sometimes we need our partners to grow as well as, uh, as we do. Uh, it will take time. Uh, but if, if we can inspire people, if we can give people some uh, degree of momentum for them to grow as, uh, as big as we did, it would be good news. Thank you very much, Cédric. Sophia, uh, I will uh, ask first of all if uh, the audience has any questions to our speakers, as long as Sophia is with us. And then, uh, yes. Thank you so much for your uh, intervention. 
have the translation. It's a bit weird in my ears. Sorry. So actually, I was I was really impressed about all the the languages you've been working on. I, I think I heard Swali, Yoruba. So really, that's a great work. And I was wondering if your organization was considering also to translate um, in another way than written, because uh, you do have 800 million people that do not read. And in many of the countries that you actually talked about, there have been some NGOs that have developed other type of actions, such as street theater, uh, drafting, re you know, in order for a larger population to be uh, sensitivized to these, uh, to, to, to these actions. And for now, actually, there's nothing about climate change. They do it for elections, for instance. They do it for other topics, uh, for gender equality, but nothing on, uh, on climate change. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a super, super important point. Part of the reason why we focus primarily on written translations is because of dissemination issues. Uh, and so right now, the way that we, we uh, work is that we partner with groups like UNICEF and the UN Environmental Program. So they publish like reports um, and different documents. And so we translate those documents for them so that they can then put it on their website because they already have a built-in audience of millions of people who are going on their websites, accessing reports. And so for those to be able available in different languages, then more people can read those reports. But you're absolutely right that there is a huge gap that's missing where it's that there are a lot of people who can't read and write. And so you, they need to be communicated to verbally. And when I was first translating information, I didn't know how to read and write Farsi. I'm taking Farsi now, so I'm learning. Um, but when I was like 12, I didn't know how. And so the way I was communicating it with my relatives was out loud, like with through spoken word. Um, and so that's something that we definitely want to work on in the future. But it's like you were saying, it's a matter of capacity, funding. Young people are very, very rarely funded. It's so hard for young people to raise funding, especially because like I'm 19. Teenagers in the US like are not always taken very seriously. Um, and so I, I think that's part of the reason why it is so critical to give youth activists the support that they need so that they can take on initiatives and take on projects like the one you mentioned. Um, I'm a Spanish tech facilitator, and I just want to add one point. We have translated the climate threats in Spanish languages for the deaf people. So we are, we are expanding the, the, the scale of the communication. Any other questions? Other, other, other questions from the audience? Um, uh, Co-founder and CEO at Climate Science. Uh, I have a question for you. We have 140 translation volunteers as well, and one of the things we find very difficult with translating our content is to ensure that the translations remain as accurate as the originally written pieces. Uh, you mentioned that the average age of your translation volunteers is 16, and it's incredibly impressive that they succeed at translating reports from UN organizations, which are very hard to translate, I would assume. I'm really curious what your process is to validate that those uh, translations are still accurate. Yeah, so let me clarify. So for projects that we take on with groups like the UN, UNICEF, UNEP, we have to make sure the translations are very accurate. And so with our 16-year-old volunteers, we select projects for them. So we translated like the Condé Nast Sustainable Fashion Glossary because we thought it was a really great initiative uh, into over 40 languages just through our volunteer network. But for the reports and for the documents, we actually work with professional translators. And so with the money that we have been able to get through grants, through funding, we've been able to translate those, do those documents by using our funding with professional translators. So we kind of operate in like a dual process, but like you were saying, it's so important to uh, ensure the authenticity of translations because even though I love our 16 year old volunteers like the the professional translators do make sure that they're credible so it's just a matter of where the translations are going and like what purpose they serve but we work with both groups all right thank you that makes a lot of sense Merci beaucoup. Um, thank you very much are there any more questions from the audience? 
Maya would like to have a question. Now, um, I have to leave now for another speaking engagement, but it was so lovely to speak with you all. It's, it was such an awesome panel, and I'm sure you guys will hear even better insights later on. So thank you. So now we uh, just to tell you in case you are uh, free at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, today, we have uh, another meeting about still about the same topic about how to scale up, and it's, it's action room number two, action room number two at seven from seven to eight p.m. today. So it's uh, also an announcement for all of you. Uh, it's, it's a very big room, and there will be other associations who are eager to hear about how to scale up. So you'll be welcome. And uh, anyway, we, we get in touch for, uh, for the translation uh, issues as well. Perfect. We'll be in touch. Awesome. So nice to meet everyone. Enjoy the rest of the panel. Okay. Uh, merci beaucoup. Au revoir, Sophia. Merci. Thank you very much. Bye bye, Sophia. Thank you for your participation. I would like to continue because we've talked about the problems uh, that the climate cardinals uh, encounter. Uh, in your uh, initiatives, do you see any limits and problems that you have um, problems to overcome today? We'll be talking uh, in a few minutes with the, about the relations with public institutions. Uh, do you have problems to, uh, to attain to get to your uh, audiences or not? I would like to, uh, to, to, to react to what um, Cedric said about growing by financing the, the workshop. I think that's a question that we ask ourselves within the, uh, our organization. It's very relevant. I, I think that it depends on the, the identity of the structure. Uh, the climate uh, thing is a voluntary structure. We only have a few uh, people who work for money, but in other words, it's uh, done by youngsters but it's also uh, through the, the audience who is uh, present uh, in the organization. I know that uh, we'll be unable to grow uh, only by uh, remunerations. It means that we'll have to so slowly become more professional as a structure. Do the associations want uh, the status of association uh, is it, shouldn't, we have, shouldn't we have a structure that is voluntary? This is an, an objective. People are engaged for a, for a cause and uh, who voluntary without wanting to be paid. Although we should remember that it's, you can make money as soon as you start to fight for causes that are important for you. So I'm saying it depends on the identity of every structure. I don't know uh, that the OSS or climate thing uh, you can ask yourself a question, I will grow by uh, having more employees in the structure. I think it's a question that uh, it is, that is interesting. It's been, we've been, uh, we've, we've existed for 10 years. So it's, uh, it's a long time for an uh, organization of you. And now we're going to stay in this uh, association status that, uh, that is at the heart uh, uh, of our actions. Uh, an association based of on voluntary work, basically. We are uh, a voluntary, so a voluntary, uh, an association of volunteers. There are people who are employed. Yes. They're in charge of uh, the most important part of our work, but there are also hundreds of people who are working as well, who take part in task forces at every level. And these are uh, beginners who organize trainings um, as well as the most, the more experienced one. And there are people in the bureau, in the steering committee, there are some of them are the founding members of the association and uh, take part in the, the most strategic, the most, the most crucial uh, task forces. But these are volunteers, they are mid, uh, mid part, part time workers as well so it's not it, it, it can it can stick together there are also uh, other close uh, minded associations friendly ones who are starting performing tasks uh, sometimes they, they even get money for that not always but sometimes they do 
and it's not you know it's not it's not black and white it can, there, are, there are different kinds of grain in, in between it can be partly cash in hand partly free of charge uh, i've been working for a long time in the uh, in the association in ngos and i think there is a strong limit i mean uh, this 100% volunteer no cash non profit uh, way of uh, of of um, of working is quite limited it's it it's it's strong. I mean, it's nice. It looks nice, but it's strong to have committed people from Monday 8 a.m. to to Friday 6 p.m. If you don't give people any money, so it takes it takes uh, it what takes time always take money. Um, there are there are services, people who work. Uh, it's not illegal, by the way. I'd like to make it completely clear. It's. Uh, it's providing services, and it's uh, it, it is of public interest. It still it still is of public interest. So don't be afraid to uh, to talk about money um, in the uh, in the activist world, where especially when it comes to uh, to left leaning uh, alternative uh, env environmentalist uh, activists. It's not very popular, but it's it's needed. I think there is one thing that I, I, uh, I should remind. I am also talking about not so young youngsters, about, about students, high degree, uh, but there are also workers who are uh, a little bit older. So it's, uh, and they, they work upon the, mo the most important part of our work. The interest being that the youngsters, the volunteers, those who do don't get any cash, need to have access to these most crucial parts. I'm the co chair of uh, climate i'm a volunteer i'm not a volunteer i am a volunteer i used to be a, a full-time volunteer which was has been made possible because it was a volunteer position being a student i couldn't be working back in the days when i was a student i couldn't be a worker not even part-time so being a volunteer you know w when you're young you you can spend a bit of your time in as a as a volunteer and i i think it's the same thing for other people they could say say, say the same thing it's a mean, it's a way to favor, to foster your commitment. And switching back to the question about the difficulties, uh, the LUCA related, this is one of the issues raised by uh, the volunteer way to work. You, you travel and favor commitment in the long term, and that's one of the difficulties when it comes to youngsters. How can I commit myself? How can I engage upon a project for more than six or seven months? This is a very complicated uh, issue because it depends on your life pathway. And your, your life pathway is something that changes very often when you were a student. The diversity of our volunteers is also uh, an issue since most of them are volunteers that are at the same time, at the same time students. And they, they've got time, they've got some spare time to work as volunteers, but they can't work full time. So we have to create volunteer missions that will be shorter and create volunteer partnerships as well. Two missions, I don't know whether or not you, you, you meet the same obstacles. Well, quite, uh, to build upon what you've been saying, since we, we cooperate with students, the whole... Uh, student steering committee there is a strong rotation people come over and then leave us it's quite tricky to um to to be in touch with the same person for six months or one year uh, it's great because you meet many people but it makes uh, make things a bit more tricky when it comes to making your voice heard it's not easy uh, when the the outside world is uh, dealing with um, when, when contact people keep changing when it comes to advocacy and key projects, it's good to have uh, people who stay a bit longer so that, the, so that their knowledge and their competencies grow. Thank you very much for this. Uh, uh, Jan, uh, who's uh, from uh, the city of Paris, just just nine of here. Could you introduce yourself and to answer this first question on how will you take in consideration the uh, challenges concerning the, um, the climate challenges and what are the actions? 
take in, in this context. I'm sorry. It's a great pleasure to be with you. The education for climate, it's a, it's a very important challenge. You've learned that uh, last September we've, we've, we've created the Academy of Climate in the uh, old town hall of uh, the Fort uh, uh, District in, in Paris. Why this project? You know, the Paris uh, is working on climate issues for since 2004, and we realized uh, progressively that we were missing tools. The education made its work, maybe it's not enough, but we can see uh, very well uh, the subjects about the mobility of the youngsters and others, you can see it in many uh, companies. You've trained people uh, to for the uh, about the climatic changes and they ask you why they do this or the other actions every day and then they change the job. If you have to train new ones. So, so it's very important. The education is important and we told ourselves that uh, if we uh, go through schools uh, in Paris, there is no single place where you could uh, change, exchange, uh, discuss and talk about the future and to, to, to make a, a discussion, uh, a shared education where, where you share knowledge and our worries, uh, our doubts and uh, because we've heard uh, lots, uh, we've heard a lot from, from de decades uh, while Jake was talking about the uh, things we're not sure of, uh, uncertainties, and but now we've said of everything. I will not present you the, the Academy of Climate now because it's been presented already here, but it's a shared governance. It's not a, it's not a project only of the, the city of Paris, it's with uh, lots of associations. So we can share uh, different approaches also for the, for the youngsters less than 25 years old. So we, we thought there was something missing and this academy uh, was supposed to deconstruct all this. For now, there's not no, no uh, scheme uh, that uh, tells everything that has to be, to be done. We're making mistakes. Uh, we may have successes. Uh, we have did it. So we are trying to, to make two, two, two weeks of animation around the cop. Some work better than others. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't because there are technical problems and so on and so on. This is also this, the, uh, the Academy of Climate. It's, a, it's an exchange in order to progress together the, ed the education for climate does not, does not belong to one person. I can see that uh, it's translated many languages. It's fantastic. It, this is the idea to share. I am a member of uh, the administration. I'm an engineer. Uh, I work with different cities, and we always share with colleagues. And I think it's the same spirit about the education, so uh, to, to work uh, together and to share our knowledge. Thank you very much, Jan. I like very much uh, what, you've, what you said with the sharing within the networks. I know that at Climate there is a, uh, sharing done with different associations. Uh, it's more difficult with public institutions. So the question I would like to open here for the members of the association sectors, what could be your expectancies that you have uh, from, uh, a public, from the public sector? What is missing to the public action that could uh, strengthen the association associations who are young, uh, mostly the, uh, young associations. What I want to say that with, with the knowledge what I have about the public uh, institution, I'm not a specialist, so I'll make mistakes. So I forgive me in advance. I apologize. What I sense, what I feel today through the partnerships where the financement and subventions that you can obtain, obtain from the public funds Climate is finally financed by the uh, EU. Uh, the EU uh, has lots of possibilities. What we see, there is a lack of certain, of certain accompaniment from uh, accompanying from uh, the public institutions. It's difficult when you're a voluntary uh, to understand the source of financement because when you finance, there is a whole procedure of uh, indicators of the of the of result reporting and so on. If we don't attain the results expected, uh, the, those who finance are not very happy. That's one of the complicated things. The second thing is that uh, quite often, uh, that's uh, the case of every institution, we finance projects. It's great. The projects are financed. 
you can uh, you can you can conduct lots of uh, actions and then uh, human resources we finance projects but projects with who who's going to work inside there, there are projects that are financed by the EU we have one person who has uh, uh, who has remunerated for for working on the European project the, the rest of the work is doing by uh, the volunteers it's complicated because of course the institutions uh, want results and this is this is what is shown to the public behind it the the, the human resources is much more difficult it's very uh, present in the associations how to finance the the human resources so these are the two main problem areas human resources and accompanying but i'm talking about the young people youngsters so this is my experience uh, thank you but you were talking about the, the the budget for the functioning and the fi in fine management the you have human resources uh, and it's not uh, it doesn't met the expectancies you would ha we would have on a project on a project, th there is always a human resources line. Is it, isn't it a, a, a project and a f cost of functioning on the other side? An opposition like that, yes? Uh, the question is for Jan. No, no, it was not, it was not for Jan. I wasn't talking about uh, the city of Paris because I don't know the, uh, the, the financement. The, the tools of, for the finance of the local governments do you feel frustrated sometimes by uh, the code of uh, public tenders and so on because what should we do what should be done better I have got no power and it, it's about the friends that that's that uh, European regulations are, has have an impact. It's very delicate when we talk about that because there's something we hate uh, in the pub, in the administration. Sorry to, for my colleagues who are not French. Uh, it's the management of facts. The, uh, the local government are, are an, uh, they have no right to finance associations above a certain level. The, 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 the idea of financement is to develop projects that would be interesting for the territory and the citizens, not to control it. And we have the right to go above 80% of uh, public financing on projects. So I understand the frustration it creates and the problems uh, uh, connected, although we are less technocratic than the uh, European Union, but I, but I see it. We go through European tenders too. What is complicated for association is there. The, the, the real challenge is how to manage the, um, the finances of an association. This is how you should see at the, the national level. How to accompany the finances of the, the management of finances because we generally, uh, we do a project and then you have to play on the uh, improvement of the, the salaries and the organization of the, the volunteers. This is, this is how it works in, within associations. You have to associate the volunteers with uh, the equivalent of time to, to, to increase the, the finance and to, uh, to get more money. This is, this is a problem of uh, a subject of uh, partnership. Uh, to, uh, you have to, to share with uh, premises, you have to, to, to show all sorts of um, costs there is a dramatic subject on a target like, like us where, where the square meters is very sh expensive. All the, the local governments have to, to have things to, to give at our disposal to, to facilitate the, uh, the meetings, the, the work. We all want to go back, exchange, and uh, here we have a, a role to play as a facilitator and to get back on the subject we have to use the capacities of the collectivities to, uh, to, to, to group partners, institutional partners, but also uh, private, not only public partners, so we can work all together. This is where we want to, we want to be at, around the table. It, it can't be always bil bilateral. We want to create a core of finances. Because uh, you always have the question, so who's financing you behind? 
that could be interesting to develop in all the, uh, the local governments in the regions, etc. Yeah, and to switch back to that, your question, I do agree with, with you that what we lack the most, according to the youngsters, um, is buildings, meeting rooms to gather and talk within public institutions. What we lack is also youngsters, youngsters that would be on, on site and could uh, uh, speak, speak up uh, in the name on behalf of, uh, of the youth in general. My feeling is when I talk with associations and even here during the COP26, uh, there is a, uh, we have the peon go to in order to discuss, but we have to talk with the leaders in order to uh, to be a voice, a boy that has got an impact, and that's a role to be played by the public institutions in the future, to hear, to listen to uh, to the youth's voice more directly. Yeah, to build upon what Manoir uh, said and what Jan said, climate is based in Paris, and we also uh, in partnership with the Climate Academy um, the fact that we've got these meeting rooms, this building, is um, extremely helpful. And I would like to thank the uh, City Hall of Paris for this help. Uh, I also agree with what Manon said when it comes to the place and the role played by youngsters uh, within great, great institutions. We are now taking part in uh, the COP26 how many youngsters have you seen and heard? They sometimes take the floor for three minutes, and that's about it. And the, the Engagé et Déterminé, Committed and Determined, is an isi initiative by which we think about the way to engage youngsters um, during big international conferences. Uh, it's, not about, it's not only about giving them the floor for three minutes, in order to be in the capacity to say, yeah, we've, we've done it. Um, it's about committing them, it's about engaging them for, for, for real, uh, to see that they are taking a, an active part. I can, so that they think, okay, I, I, I'll, I have a voice and it's respected as such, and I can, uh, and I can speak up for the youngsters. The, this is the, uh, the value that delegations, in, uh, no matter if they are French or, or from abroad, uh, need to, to bear youngsters with them. We, they also have a, a, s a certain degree of, of knowledge about the, the topics we, uh, we talk about. Uh, you're, you're, you're right. Uh, there, I, I we share this frustration. We, have the we, we get the same amount of time as cities. During plenary sessions, you get two minutes when you are a city. So the cities are treated just just like youngsters. And they keep on saying that 70 we, uh, cities are responsible for 70% of greenhouse gases emissions. So we, gi we, we, we make 70% of the greenhouse gases, but we don't get 70% of the time to speak. And that's quite frustrating. But you're right when saying that you, you, should have, you should get more space and more time locally whenever possible. And this is a COP. This is about experiences sharing. Um, should good experiences be, uh, be shown, showcased? The access to discussions, the access to, uh, to knowledge is important. We are not there. We're not 100% there in Paris. We've opened the uh, Maison des Jeunes, the house for the youth house. We work with the Paris Council for Youth, Paris Youth Council, that is quite critical about some plans. Uh, some proposals of ours uh, uh, haven't been chosen. Uh, there, is a, there will be another, uh, there will be a representation. I don't know how uh, we have to, there is a message that, that we have to throw within different communities in France and abroad, which is about how to hear the, uh, the youth's voice, and there is a common work to do together to see the young over here, uh, how GMS work uh, upstream. Because there are uh, plenary sessions and conferences that, that should work together, and in terms of strategy, our presence at the COP26 is uh, quite valuable. 
we don't do that we don't do the same thing at the european level and that's a pity that's something we should start doing thank you jan will be uh, we are about to end this discussion. I would like to give the floor to uh, people who are list to have been listening until now for a quick questions and answer session. One question uh, in that case. Y you were talking about partnerships that could be uh, created. And my question that we are, I will ask you, Jan, is about the obstacles you have to deal with when it comes to your work with youngsters' associations. Uh, putting this in the context of, of what William was saying, there is a strong rotation. People sh show up at work, stay for six months, and then go away. So what do you lack the most in this context? What the worst thing? Uh, what could youngsters asso associations do to uh, facilitate cooperation with public institutions? I, I'm not sure I'm the best choice when it comes to discussing about this topic because yes, we, we there is a turnover uh, I within our uh, association because that's how it looks like when you deal with young people. Keeping people is quite tricky and it also takes time. Uh, we are, our association changed its leadership, but we always find a way to talk with the City Hall of Paris who helps us finding people and find helps us finding uh, money as well. Just like with many associations, and not only youngsters associations, some of them are quite rich, some of them uh, fail bankruptcy and change names. It's a good thing to ask um, every time an association has changed its name. It's a good thing, by the way, to ask why they changed their name. Uh, because, yeah, it can show whether or not the association is a, a, a serious player. But uh, the uh, young youth association of the, it's not an issue for the youth association of the city of Paris, William, Manon. Uh, how is it when it comes to you? Do you work upon the fresque? You, as a fresque, do you work? Do you cooperate with associations? Is that a path that you would mention? No, not that much. Rather, we didn't even try because we, we grow too fast. Because the, the thing is, if we were asking for grants, we, 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 we presented our accountancy. Uh, sum up our budget 600,000 euros we got uh, if we were to ask for 100,000 euros more we would get them in one year uh, it changes it changes too fast in two years it would be a, a matter of million euros and not hundreds of thousands so the, the time it takes for you to prepare your your application s means this reality will have changed before your before your uh, your file makes it to the to, to the desk to the final desk, so it doesn't doesn't work. Since we grow, we're growing too fast, and mathematically we are quite young uh, in comparison to our weight and size, and not very well known. I mean, we are a bit uh, known, but mm, in comparison with our size and weight, not so much so. So it's not really a, uh, we don't get any public money anyway. And the good news is, good news are we don't need public money. We, we get private money. We are not that we are against, not that we would refuse, but the fact is we, we don't get any for, for now and we don't need any. And we are more efficient uh, for the time being working as we do now. Thanks a lot. And that will be, I guess, the last question of this round table. Cédric, you've been talking about freedom and about not working with public institutions. Well, it's not, I mean, the fact we don't work with, uh, we, we, we have a certain degree of freedom and we don't work with public institutions, but uh, this wasn't to mean that anybody who's working with public institutions doesn't get any freedom. 
But that was the question I wanted to ask you, William and Manon. Uh, do you feel sometimes cons some constraints, some uh, a, a certain degree of a lack of freedom because of working with public institutions? L not limited, but there is a bit of an orientation of our activities. Because once you are financed by public institutions, you always need to <coughs> deliver some kinds of results. All our activities when uh, taking part in a call for bids, a call for projects, you know what's happening. <laughs> but at uh, a certain moment, the activities you forecasted don't always give you the possibility to um, to meet the objective that had been determined at the, real at the very beginning of the project. So I wouldn't say we're limited. I wouldn't say there are limits, there are borders. Uh, but we are oriented by, uh, by public authorities who uh, give you the money m and expect certain things in a certain way. And uh, yeah, yes indeed. Ah, I quite agree with what William said. Every now and then you, uh, well I do feel quite limited. I, they it's like they give you the money, so they say this is the topic on which you have to work, not something else. Sometimes we also have to think twice or even more, more times about the word we're going to use because it has to be politically correct. I, it ha you have a, a certain degree of freedom, but you're not 100% free when you receive money from, uh, from state authorities. One, one comment upon that. Uh, the public authorities don't have the right to control the activities of an association, but there are two types of grants that uh, are different. There are calls for, calls for bids, calls for projects. When it comes to calls for projects, it's like the state is saying, this is the priority, this is the topic, this is the way you should work. So I, I, I will put some money on the table and you have to meet these requirements. And in that case, you can feel frustrated, but you, you knew right away what you were starting to, uh, what you were uh, coming into. And then, uh, sometimes you have the, the other possibility when you have your project, you create your project and then you ask for money. And that's completely the other way around. And it's quite the opposite. The state authority can uh, give you some money. Uh, they have to give you some money and they, they, they cannot tell you what to do because they've endorsed the project uh, by giving you the, the money. So these are two different things. Call for, call for projects that are organized by the local authorities with prerequisites and projects that are created by associations and then receive money. Yeah, I've, um, I've studied a bit these financing, uh, financement mechanisms and the way through um, a local authority, the, gr the grants for in the framework of uh, the calls for projects in, in the EU mainly when it comes to department communities, the clap hands, sorry, there are grants, uh, but you, you we take part in more and more calls for, for projects, and that that um, makes it mandatory for youngsters to get more and more professional and more and more specialized. When it comes to public authorities and the state uh, institutions, there is a search for efficiency. Of course, they want money to be put in the right place with, uh, with tangible and real results. Nobody wants to waste money, and that's a good thing, I guess. But there are more and more uh, calls for projects in the year, and, and that's, a reason for, for th th that's a reason for more and more controls. Yeah, it's, it's positive and negative at the same time. A couple of years ago, it was quite different, and it's it's quite tricky when the administration is involved. Because calls for projects are more tricky to manage than spontaneous projects created by associations that then that then seek for money. The procedure is far uh, more heavy, both for you and for us. So we see more and more calls for projects in the air, as you were saying, but that's shows a collective need for more transparency. For a long time, the way it has been was that projects, sport projects, for example, would ask for money. Nobody would control anything. We would just uh, throw money 
the call for projects would be, uh, uh, now it's different. It's published. Uh, there are prerequisites. It's, it's written, every many things are written black and white. Uh, there are cities that are hyper-professionalized and work really properly, more than properly, and they look twice at the way they spend public money, and there are cities that are quite different from that, uh, that portrait. So it, it really depends on cases and context of situation and cities, but in comparison to how it was back in the days, it's far, there is far more transparency and far more, far, far more uh, controlling tools. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, thank, I would like to thank all our participants. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to the French Pavilion. We are getting to the end of this round table. Yes, we're getting to the end. So thank you very much to the persons who seen us online, and I wish you a good uh, end of the day. Thank you.
Très bien. Bonjour. Bonjour à tous. Hello everyone. Thank you for sitting down. We're going to uh, be starting very soon. I'm John Sergi, responsible for communication and uh, the officer for uh, in the climate education uh, institution. I will be the moderator. I would like to uh, to thank the French Pavilion that uh, allows us to uh, hold this event, and also our all our speakers who are on stage. I want to share with you uh, things uh, in the upcoming hour. Today we're going to explore the links between the science and the education for climate change within the uh, scholar systems and uh, above it too. We'll make it available for different uh, groups and uh, to open it to everyone. We are with ma Madame Mar uh, Marie de Saint uh, and then Manon and Karine de Rousseau and Mrs. Camera Musica from the Pig Pig organization. And finally, we'll uh, close with Lily from the Office of Climate and Education. If time allows, we'll uh, make a short Q&A questions at the end. With no further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Valérie marson dilmotte who is a climatologist who is a researcher at the CNRS, and she's also uh, the, 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 the boss of the, the Group 1 in the uh, IPCC, and she'll talk about with us about the uh, relations between science and the education. Uh, the floor is yours, madam. Thank you very much for this invitation and thank you that, for being here. I will uh, explain uh, my point of view first. Since uh, 2015, I've coordinated the, uh, the work of hundreds of researchers who were checking the state of knowledge on the climatic change, which fed the red re report on the climate that we've issued this uh, summer, a colossal huge work, uh, there were hundreds of people who participated, researchers and others, and who participate today, uh, they, know they have the best uh, no state of knowledge on the climate. And this uh, in-depth work that uh, we present in the International Debt Negotiation for the Client, it's one of the scientific uh, clients, uh, elements, if we don't if we don't teach these things to people, it will be a lost occasion. It will be lost occasion. We need to uh, to give this knowledge to young people as soon as possible. In order to reach uh, the major part of people, we, there, there's this challenge to make it as available as possible, this information. I will underline what we've tried to do and uh, its limits. In the frameworks of, uh, in the framework of IP, IPCC, we have an assessment made in English, a very technical period. Uh, with a short uh, synthesis uh, for the this uh, for the uh, Dans les, les, les autres langues de for the persons who decide to take decision, and it will be it will go to uh, to the UN. Now we've worked on a glossary which allows you to understand all the terms that we're using, which is an entrance to uh, to ease the, the manipulation of these uh, scientific notions in a precise way. We made a huge effort to assess the changes, the climatic changes at the regional uh, scale, which is important for the people who work in regions. Uh, what is due on the uh, human actions, all that in the context of the challenges at the uh, planet level. And we have a uh, synthesis of two pages by regions. So this is available on the uh, IPCC um, website. You, if you're interested in, in Africa, we have two, two pages in about on Africa. Uh, telling the, start, the present story and uh, what's expected uh, in the future. Also, small countries, island countries, and others, because many people come back with the same questions, and uh, we uh, try to explain in a clear language uh, certain answers to the questions that um, come back systematically. This is an exercise we can do with, without the, the framework of the IPCC, to, which is to, follow, to, to provide with good information uh, and transparent information and balanced information for different regions of the world. And there's all that is left to be done. And why is it important? It's uh, to have the keys 
to understand is the first stage to, to, to feel uh, a party uh, in the actions uh, for, uh, for the climate. The physical part of the climate is important for these kids to understand. And in the framework of, a, of an education, a, a kid, a child, has the, the possibility to understand, it, to, to make its own reasonment. This is the most powerful thing for this uh, mm, scientific information. We are facing a new uh, information, the influence of, our, of the humans on the climate. We have a scientific information that allow us to prepare ourselves. They would if we would use them. And the problem is that uh, most of the decisors today have not been trained. They don't know necessarily how to act. Uh, although even if they understand the, the challenges. So we do it, we're giving keys to understand, but also keys to act with project, concrete projects uh, anchored in the lives of, uh, of, of schools to allow to, to understand uh, what are the uh, greenhouses, greenhouse emissions to confront how the a changing climate will affect uh, different characteristics of climate of every region and critical things like uh, agriculture, water, and the risks. These are elements that are important to avoid being in a, in a bad situation, but to be uh, in a situation in, Europe in which you are an actor, uh, because you're using the, uh, what you know in, in order to act, to anticipate, and to build upon, and uh, to build a resilient, as, as much as possible, to be uh, a resilient attitude, allow everyone to, uh, to participate to the solutions that will contribute to, uh, to reduce the problem. So I insist on these two challenges that seem to be important beyond the uh, scientific uh, information, the keys to understand and the keys to act. And now to, uh, to end up, this is, this is not scientific to, to do this. They, they, we have specialists of pedagogy, uh, people who know how to work with kids. So the uh, initiatives like the Office for the Education on Climate who mobilize specialists of the pedagogy and uh, on training, it's critical to, to create this interface, interface between the scientific knowledge and what is use, useful for teachers, this connected with, um, with the programs in school. The second thing, beyond the knowledge at big scale, for us a region is uh, as a quarter of Europe, for example, one fifth of Africa, so big regions. Uh, it has to be anchored in the needs of every community, to uh, every population. You have to uh, add information that are that belong to, uh, to to the detailed context where relevant for the for the where you live. So I'd like to thank the French Pavilion for again for organizing this event, underlining the quality of the work that is doing, especially on the for the. Office for the Education of Client that has adopted the uh, special reports of the UPC, uh, IPCC uh, to, uh, to work uh, in the school. I would like to underline the, 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 mani the magnificent work that has been done on ocean that would seem uh, abstract. Uh, very soon on one billion that will live at the seaside uh, that will face directly the, uh, the changes of the ocean. Um, uh, we take, we take, we say in 2050, they, they, they were born right now. You have to give the youngsters information so they know what, how to act up, uh, throughout their whole lives. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Well, thank you very much. This is Delmotte for this uh, piece of information about the IPCC report and for your inspiring words that underline the importance we should uh, give to this link between science and adaptation to climate change in order to, uh, to uh, come up with playmakers. Uh, and thank you for the change for our, uh, for our institute. Uh, when it comes to students now and when it comes to universities, uh, representing the RESES, the RESES being a, a student network for a for an ecological and solidarity economics, we have Manon, we have Karine Vatrin. Karine Vatrin is going to take the floor now. Thank, hello everyone, do you hear me well? Je suis membre de la délégation RESES. I'm a member of the RESES network. It's a French network for an ecological and solidarity 
society. We gather 40 students associations and we, uh, we train students. We uh, were into advocacy uh, with, to, um, with ministers and we uh, were into uh, sustainable food and international negotiations. I would like to uh, tell you about a rather concrete experience. I would like to uh, tell a few words about how making it accessible for all. It will be quite tangible and concrete, I think. I guess it could be a good illustration. I, I joined this network in 2018. There was a group that was specialized in climate topics, but it was quite erratic, and there is a, a, a certain degree of eco anxiety among students because tra the trainings seem to be quite not very adapted. So this, this eco-anxiety uh, went to the extent that there was even one student that left school because he saw a huge discrepancy between the values uh, and the facts, between the do's and the says. So we, uh, we started a discussion with the management of the school in order to modify the... Uh, the content. So we started p organizing petitions, demonstrations, but as it quickly occurred, it wasn't needed to to convince people that the uh, the content of the of the school sh should be changed. The question was more about helping us, about how do we train young people, and we've been thinking over, and carri we carried out a first action by creating a delegate uh, a, a delegate position. One pupil has to be nominated by, the, by, by his peers and take, uh, take charge of the transmission of knowledge. And he was, uh, he was uh, a middleman between the management of the, of the school management and the, and the students. And I think that should be copy-paste in most schools, universities, or even high schools, um, or elementary schools, just to get a feedback from, the pup from pupils, from students and for the pupils and the students to hear the voice of the management. Um, we've been working, cooperating with the coal management and we came up with a roadmap about what should be done. The first step being, as say Valérie masson delmotte the confrontation of, um, of topics. We uh, hear a lot about topics, but in a quite erratic way, it lacks stru structure very often. We asked for all students to be trained to these uh, topics and to get a training about the climate system. It was uh, six hours, uh, six mandatory hours, and also about more syst systemic um, topics, sociology, economy, with uh, Arthur Keller uh, giving us a keynote. Um, the idea wasn't for every engineer to become uh, a climatologist, but for every engineer to have a sense of what the uh, climate topics are and that led us directly to see the second step which is now to create uh, to provide the engineers with concrete tools for them to be in the capacity to act to play a, a, a role as engineers so it's a life cycle analysis it's a very important and rich step that gives the possibility to measure different environmental consequences of a product of an activity of well quite about anything and then the next step is about having uh, topic specialized engineers can be buildings can be uh, IT whatever and then you have to p come up with a training that will be based on this specialty as a student you are not you are not specialized yet so that we talked about it with teachers, with professors, who said, no, you know what, we, we lack knowledge too, we know more about it, about it than, we, than we do. So we agreed upon one thing, that we, we should inform better students, but nobody knows how to do it. So it takes some work to be, to be done at the ministry level, perhaps, or at a national level, to find experts and to ask them for help, to help us building the, the courses content with a more top-down approach and what we think is that the uh, Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of, uh, of Education have a huge role to play. That will be our um, experience feedback. So my message would be the following. F train professors, 
train professors and make them meet some experts and don't put everything on the students back because it's not it's not the job of the scientists merely it's not only the job a job a mission for the students as, uh, either Merci, thank you karine for your presentation it was so interesting that shows that there is a real demand from the students, but also from the schools, concretely, uh, high schools and uh, universities to have more education at all the levels. And I would like to introduce Mrs. Camera Vizic, who is the creator of Peak Peak Environment and Peak Peak Service Solidaire, an organization that accompany the uh, ecological transition through uh, workshops uh, raising awareness. Uh, this is for fragile uh, audiences in, in uh, France. Can you hear me? Thank you for being here with, with us to listen to us. Thank you uh, to the French Pavilion for giving us the the occasion to talk about uh, my our things. I absolutely agree with you, what you everything you said about uh, the uh, engagement. I see around the table people uh, that are e extremely engaged personally uh, and uh, in their work, but there is a problem. We all here at the COP26, we are very engaged, but we not only have a few years to change the world, but will we manage uh, on our own a very small percentage of the uh, per of the population is present here. The question is, uh, our grandmother, uh, cousins, and others, have they ever heard of COP26? Who's interested in COP26? Who do knows what he has to do? So many questions uh, to which we would like to, uh, to bring a solution. We've said a lot here before about the ministry, uh, about the uh, scientists, about students, before you were talking about, uh, you're talking about top down. We have great spirits that think about the big, big subjects, and I think that in the, the fresh, what, what we're missing is the last detail. The citizen, who uh, sees that all that from very far away, and is not uh, an on board yet. This is a quick presentation about our, our associations. So uh, all we do is we, we, are, we are at the very uh, bottom of the, of the change. These were the associations that uh, uh, links us with the citizens who speaks to the citizens who accompany the citizens. The, uh, so we are 35 in Ile-de-France. We, we we've been here for 12 years and we accompany the citizens to understand the transition, the change. Everyone knows that, that we have to change, but how and where, in what direction? We don't know. So. Uh, our uh, pedagogical uh, way, we discover the challenge, what the problem is once we understand that th there is a problem, like the waste, like biodiversity, and uh, the mobility, for example, then we propose to people who would be interested to go uh, uh, beyond uh, through uh, accompanying them and uh, other things, uh, and to change their habits. That's what we want to do. We are on all the subjects of uh, sustainable development. This is our specific specificity compared to other associations. We think that uh, enabled to, uh, to change, we will need a, a systemic uh, global approach. Why the popular uh, neighborhoods? This, we've, we've worked with these, the, the most fragile um, audiences economically, uh, people who uh, are unable to act. They may be in prison, for example, or they may be um, disabled or other things. What, what's with these people? They have the lowest uh, environmental impact. Uh, we're talking a lot about excess, 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 excess. It's not them. They, they don't take planes every every year. They don't change uh, cell phones all the time, but they are stigmatized. You always go to see the, the, the poor people. I'm talking about uh, Paris. That would be the, 
the, the thing, the same thing in uh, other countries, in China, why coal, etc., etc., in France, why, uh, why do these youngsters have to, to buy new smartphones? Why do we have to stigmatize them? Besides, the, these are audiences that to, we, to whom we'll uh, propose uh, the, the smallest number of uh, work, of uh, awareness, raising awareness, because they're not interested. We hear that all the time. Don't work with these audiences, they're not interested. Terrible. But there is quite the country and a great reserve of energy and ideas in the popular uh, neighborhoods. These are people who move a lot with the, the, least me the smallest means. Uh, they develop the low tech. These are the ones who are going to, uh, to succeed better than others. We're really part of the uh, movement for popular education, what means to give or re-give re the, the power to act to people. It's not only to be in the junction. You have to, to, to practice part. You have to uh, write spice code. No, we share the, the challenges, and then we, we, gave, we give these people the, the power to, uh, to act. That means three things. Uh, you need to have an information. Then you need to have the means. And the third thing, you have to uh, w want it. If I make a parallel with the, the sorting the, the waste, we tell people to sort the, the the waste. We go a lot uh, to see people, and they have no people, no information that would tell them where the uh, the cans are, what, what, where to put what. Second thing, do they have the means? Do you have do, do there uh, have uh, rooms in win in which you have these garbage bins? Uh, is there light in these rooms, etc., etc.? They know there are garbage bins, but why would I? I have other things to do in my life. So you have, you have to go and, and tell them and do something to make them uh, come aboard. aboard. So uh, let's create the, the, the dynamics in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, you may be a model, a person, or a neighbor, a, a sport, an athlete. I gave uh, an, exam an example with the uh, trash bins. But mobility, that's another example. Do they have uh, an information? They know there is a, there is a problem. I have a car and uh, and I have nothing else. I just have the car. Uh, do they have uh, any alternatives? Do they have the means to buy a bicycle, or they need to want it? No, we say to uh, give them the power to act. You have to, pro pro to to propose contact that is available. When you see what's happening at the cop, it's beautiful. But do people really understand? It's very scientific. Very. I mean, you need some uh, something intermediate in order to simplify, to disseminate, to, to translate into la everyday language and, and get it uh, to, uh, to the level of individual uh, problems. When we're talking about floods, we, heard that we hear that there are people that will be soon f flooded. Okay, too bad, I'm in Paris, I'm sad for them. But when the people have been touched, uh, this year in Belgium, we had floods, we saw uh, we saw uh, cities that were flooded, and suddenly we realized that the same thing could happen with us. So we need to make a parallel with uh, real life. Uh, so interest people, try find communication, and the, the communication, you're, there's, there's a lot, lots of uh, depressive communication, as you said before. You, you feel like suicide with all, all that's happening. What can I do? What we are saying, keep the notion of pleasure of uh, common interest and to find s practical solutions something simple to do so uh, simple communication we valorize the good initiatives everything that people do uh, it's it's excellent we always look we're looking for stars cinema stars uh, athletes etc etc well around us we really have uh, fantastic people around us who do great people uh, great things that should be valorized then we can uh, conduct lots of actions on uh, every day. It makes, uh, it allows to make uh, the entrance through a small door. It's the small door that allows to, um, to become a citizen, so to say. Training, uh, trainings. We would like to, to think all the structures that are present here. There's lots of uh, um, trainings that accompany. Then in terms of limits, who are the limits? Where are the limits for us? 
accompanying in long term is very complicated because the citizens don't have lots of time to, to give us. This is why lots of collectivities of um, populations give a privilege to punctual uh, actions. To find uh, relays in uh, popular uh, neighborhoods, it's difficult. These, uh, these relays are not always uh, the ecologists. It might be uh, a sports club or anything. Let's find all the possible relays, including the, uh, the janitors. We were talking about the, about the, uh, the previous uh, time, uh, money, money. We've undressed, the, this is the associations who work uh, on the ground and you should, we have to give them means. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Ms. Camara, for, for these words that, that show that uh, awareness raising and education should adapt themselves in order to include everybody, because we need everybody on board for this, uh, in order to go about it when it comes to this transition. Uh, last but not least, I would like to introduce my colleague, Lydie lescar montier Office for Climate Education. She's a, a science, uh, science manager, and she will be talking about the need for teachers. Please carry on, Lydie. Do you hear me well to start with? Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks to uh, thanks, thank you for for these words that have been said until now. This is the, the quite the pleasant aspect of COPS is that you meet many people that are very committed, very inspired, and very inspiring. What I'm going to do now now during this presentation is I'm going to talk about the uh, what the Office for Climate Education does because we always we all face children and grown-ups to whom we would like to propose solutions uh, when it comes to facing climate change. And I would like to, uh, to be talking more precisely about an initiative that we, we threw, which is named the COP for Teachers. Uh, and we would like this initiative to be a start, a good start. Uh, and we'd like teachers to tell us shortly thereafter what they need in order to, uh, to work on this topic. Next slide, please. And the next one, all right, general context, some uh, pieces of context, you will know the context, you know the article number 12 of the uh, Paris Agreement that uh, showcased the importance of education, of access to information, uh, this is what Valérie works on, in order to uh, face this challenge named climate change. It has been uh, mentioned in the, um, in the SDGs, of course, and uh, there is also a very important document, a declaration that has been signed by uh, uh, nearly all the, uh, the universities in the world. It's named the IAP. And on the next slide, you'll see another uh, result, of st study result. Uh, it's a survey, in fact, named ALEA. What they've been doing is they, they've asked um, 67 persons from 14 different countries, mainly teachers from kindergarten to university, asking them what they might need in order to, uh, to better face the, the challenges. So it's about professional development for, for teachers, about education at every level, would it be at the elementary school, university, uh, high school, kindergarten, uh, it's about working upon, upon uh, fresh, updated, up-to-date and reliable and quality data uh, using active uh, pedagogy, which is slightly different from the, uh, the routine way of things, the, the usual way, the old way, the top-down one. It's about more giving keys, uh, gi providing the pupils with keys that help them understand uh, complicated and complex topics. The OCE, Empowering Teachers, well, it's, it's more or less what we, th this uh, survey has been performed in 2020. We started working, in, we launched our initiative in 2018. S but I would like to show you what our initiative is about in this context. What we do is we work on, uh, on the basis of scientific data, solid data from the, that we get from the IPCC. We base on it in order to, uh, 
to get a strong support, uh, a strong basis upon which we can work properly, which helps us transforming information not every information is accessible, by the way, so we have to make it accessible for, for teachers. We cooperate with a pedagogical and academic, academic uh, platform in terms of uh, pedagogy. We, what we do is adapted to our, we check whether what we do is adapted to, to our target group. And we are a small group in Paris. We are, we are seven and more, so we can't obviously uh, we can't train everybody, we can't teach everybody, so we, we do cooperate, of course, with local playmakers, with, with local uh, teachers and schools, and we're here to facilitate the work and not to do it all on our own, of course. Uh, so we cooperate with uh, teachers trainers that provide their teachers, that provide teachers all around the world with training. They are very committed playmakers and the, the, our idea would be to, uh, to push forward more initiatives in Southeastern Asia and Africa. So should you be interested, don't hesitate to, uh, to knock at our door and get in touch with us. Uh, what we propose in terms of resources, what we, we notice is that teachers need many, uh, many supports that come in all uh, forms and shapes and colors in order to illustrate one of the lessons they've already created, you see the idea is to, to provide them with scientific content, with that kind, that kind of synthesis. We also have a big scholar book that is divided into two parts. A part is about understanding, its name we understand, oddly, with, um, with different levels of sound, but it's more for pupils aged 9, 15, by the end of this book, you have a part concerning projects. It's about presenting projects that have been already that already have been created, and a description, a short description, that give that allow teachers uh, to use it key in hand. Um, in their classrooms, we have uh, multimedia classrooms. We have webinars with experts. We have testimonies. Uh, keynotes performed by passionate people who tell us more about their everyday life and work so that we, it's very diverse and that's one of the pluses. We also propose trainings, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, the original part of it, of, the, uh, of our initiative, is that we, we try to stick to the complexity of climate science, proposing topics that are interconnected, which is why the work on the projects is, is hugely interesting because it gives you the possibility to, to mix it all over, mm, keeping working about critical thinking, la pensée critique, l'esprit critique. Thank you. Thank, th th thank you. Because uh, lots of information are available nowadays and we would like to help s pupils, to help youngsters finding their way um, and develop empathy as well. Uh, sort things between information and misinformation, between information and prop propaganda, um, and to get them working with their communities. It is a work we start. It is something we launch within classrooms, but then it goes beyond classrooms. It goes, uh, it, it, it reaches the families, the streets, the community. Next slide, please. Now about a few words about an, uh, another initiative that is closely linked to this COP. It's a work we've launched with uh, Dijan a couple of months ago. Uh, there is around 100 students committed into it. Next slide, please. Um, the objective being to organize several workshops with uh, different teachers groups, uh, as we did in Latin America with teachers from Asia or Europe in very different contexts, to whom we ask the question, the same question, should you have to change climate education, make it different from what it is or what it is not, if it doesn't exist in, many, in the vast majority of contexts, because very often, more often than not, there is no climate education. So what would you propose and what would be the limits? And the feedbacks we received could be divided into four parts. Uh, they talk a lot about the programs, about the professional development of teachers, about the uh, pedagogical resources that are proposed, and about the, ro and s the school's role in, in a very, broad, very broadly speaking. 
in a very general way. Last Saturday, b uh, one day, two days before the COP started, we signed uh, a final announcement uh, with all every plan. So should you know teachers or education uh, players that would like to uh, to take upon this uh, this uh, statement and would like to sign it, you can check our website. Now, when it comes to the feedbacks we, we got, everything that's related with programs, you know, in the world, 70% uh, school programs don't mention, don't even mention climate change. So we've uh, proposed two different things. Whether we use it, we use the program and we that exists, already exists, and create links with climate change, which is feasible, which is doable. In every discipline, we've, uh, we've come up with uh, resources when it comes to sport about greenhouse, fen about the so-called greenhouse phenomenon. But it can be linked with mathematics, it can be linked with philosophy, obviously. So everything is possible. Uh, thank you. Uh, or, second option, we change it all and we put climate change at the core of a new, uh, of a brand new uh, school program. You can check our website. But when it comes to professional development, teachers need trust. Need, they need trust in order to be in the capacity to work properly within their classrooms. Because when it comes to elementary school, very more often than not, teachers are have studied literature or languages, but when it comes to science, they are quite less at ease. So you have to build their trust, their self-esteem, their trust towards themselves for, uh, for them to feel legitimate and entitled to tell about science and about climate in order to manage eco-anxiety eco um, and work upon critical thinking. Etc. And then it's about proposing pedagogical resources that might be shorter than uh, what we deal with nowadays, and that would be gathered on uh, accessible and available platforms, uh, being, uh, of course, linked with school programs. Because teachers try to, uh, they, they don't have a whole. They take they take various pieces of the puzzle, but it, it takes work, and it's a bit of an effort. So we would like to make this task easier. And last but not least, reworking s the schools, the, the role the school is supposed to play. So the various contexts, really. Because nowadays, school is more and more seen, treated as just a place where you leave your children morning and you take them off uh, at 5 p.m. So we have to put more value in the role that play that school is supposed to play. Let's treat it as an incubator, as some a place where uh, talents are going to uh, to occur. It's a it's a broad reflection. We've been talking about insulation, uh, but schools heating as well. So it's about coming up with new solutions, brand new solutions, in order to face climate change related challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydie, for this presentation that shows very well uh, that we have to work hand in hand with the teachers to uh, to uh, to play their role to prepare uh, the future generations for the climatic change that uh, is upcoming uh, in future. Our last presentation now. We still have a few minutes before uh, uh, before the. Uh, audience uh, first I have a question let's get back to a subject that have been uh, has been uh, attacked by uh, more or less everyone but I would like to deep go uh, deeper inside the echo anxiety what are your uh, paths to um, to tackle this uh, subject with your audiences let's start with Madame Delmotte for example Yes, I just want to share uh, something that we, we had a meeting with students today uh, with researchers who had uh, 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 written the IPCC uh, report. Uh, a young girl told me I read the, the report, then I cried and they, it didn't give me will to act. It was very hard for, to hear it. It was very difficult when I present the report in different contexts. Uh, in fact, with, with uh, 
uh, with people who are from countries with vulnerable populations. It doesn't concern only the, the children. You know, it, it concerns many people when uh, they understand the challenges and uh, that's where we are today and what is going to happen. And we are afraid of the transformations to be uh, to be carried out. What what the um, what the sciences, social sciences here show uh, that is that the first thing is to have a space to talk about it because the emotions, especially for for the youngsters at the fragile ages, uh, teenagers and younger, it can overfl overflow. And uh, so we have to 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 create dialogue opportunities. This is why with uh, our colleagues we built a game. Uh, a game on which uh, to which you, you can play in uh, you can play in family on a table. Uh, you can you can buy this for this. I don't want to make publicity, but this is this is uh, this is something when uh, you have different generations that could that could uh, play to, together during holidays. You can talk about this. Uh, they can talk about their, their emotions. We uh, we it's a way to uh, to stimulate conversations within families. The second space are the conversa conversation in school. The worst thing for a child, uh, as you know, uh, children have telephones. They get lots of information uh, that play usually on what's, uh, what attracts that att uh, attention. So it's fear very often. So uh, you need to have adults in the school that can situate this element in a solid context that can allow uh, to structure the reflection in, o in order to go beyond the emotions and to, uh, to play on a rational approach, build one. And I sense about the, ref uh, the reference adult, this is how we call them. The fact to be able to talk about uh, emotions and to be able to show not only the, um, how big the chances are, uh, there, there are, and we also need to find the, the, the drivers, that are existing drivers, so it doesn't paralyze emotions. It shows that there are uh, drivers for action, all of us, especially when it's uh, in, a pra in a collective framework. And the last thing, what was shared by the scientists who uh, contributed to this report is the fact that uh, putting, shedding a light on a, on, on a, on a fact and uh, bringing uh, knowledge on the solutions is a part of the solutions. And I will end up with a, an example. I was with, uh, with uh, Maz of, uh, from uh, where I live, and one of the mayors said uh, that uh, I was I was affected by the heat waves uh, because the, it was the classes were too hot. Uh, uh, children couldn't uh, even push back the exams because it was too hot. So he was uh, he wanted to make a, a call for projects uh, for building a school uh, to, to building to build a school that would accept children in this uh, climatic. Um, Situation, but they only worked on on the clim climate to between 2000 and 2010. Mm -hmm. It's not comfortable for the children in 2030 or 2040 because the school will still be there because it's been uh, done uh, used the information from the past. So to use today the information on the climate uh, on the climate that is going to come, uh, like the temperatures, the the, the waters, etc., etc. Uh, beyond the, emen the emotions that uh, we can use may allow uh, while projecting ourselves in 10, 20, 30 years. It's a, it's a wonderful driver uh, to anticipate and to uh, build conditions uh, for a better future. But it requires to train actors, companies, uh, specifications of uh, public tenders to, uh, and the last thing, the students. We need to be sure that those who get to leave the schools in all the sectors, professional or others, they have to be able to use this information for themselves in every sector activity and to act not only looking at the, uh, the mirror, the, I mean the, the past, but look in the future with the uh, scientific knowledge, uh, with the things that are going to change. This is what I wanted to share on this point. Thank you. Yes, good. Thank you very much, Lydie. Uh, would you like to build upon this and take it further? Yes. Uh, I don't know what to add, in fact. The, uh, the answer was quite, uh, quite exhaustive. But yes, this is something we, noticed. we notice every day. It's something that is really crucial for teachers and not easy to manage. But uh, there is 
there, ecos anxiety is echo anxiety, and there, there is children's eco anxiety. Uh, there are, uh, I meet sometimes uh, children that uh, report nightmares, climate-related nightmares. So it's about showing them there are solutions, that information is available, that there it's information they are able to understand, and that, and that there is more to it, that they, they can be playmakers, and that they can have an impact, a positive impact on, on, uh, on reality uh, and upon their community's everyday life. And this is the path down which we'd like to go. Thank you, Karin. A couple of words as well. Uh, I hear you. I, I, I hope you hear me. I would like to talk about my experience as a student and to give you one uh, number. 85% of French students say they are anxious well, because of their future uh, from, the from the climate point of view. And the answer is, the answer we hear more and more, or, or we give more and more, is about giving sense to your work. There is a, a tsunami uh, a spectacular, spectacularly growing amount of students that want to be committed, even on a professional uh, level. And from my point of view, this is the the only way to um, to get over eco anxiety. Uh, sorting sorting your your rubbish is uh, enough to uh, to avoid eco anxiety and to make it to diffuse it to make it go away. Miss Cameron. Do you hear me well? Yeah, great. Many in interesting things have been said. I'd like to, uh, to add three of them. The first thing for our association I is we try not to talk about problems, but to talk about issues or about topics. Uh, it's, it's less uh, anxiogenic. Yeah. So we, we, we don't talk about food waste, about too many rubbish, we talk about responsible consumption. We talk about health. So when talk about topics, some positive things come up, some negative things as well. But if you keep talking about problems, problems, and problems, it's no 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 wonder people get get uh, get depression sooner or later. Um, now, when it in if it comes to when it comes to the way to the approach, it's not. It's about not saying not. You don't keep saying. Do not, do not, do not. Uh, you must, you must, and you mustn't. Try to share. We share topics. We share pieces of information. Uh, we say, do you know that French people, the statistic French uh, citizen, produces one kilogram of rubbish every day? We give information. And then, then people, the people's reaction are uh, more like, yeah, well, in my opinion, it's, it's my case as well, or, it's, or, or it isn't. So... Uh, if someone speaks about, uh, someone, someone's going to say, someone, someone might say, well, I, I lack space in my, in my home to sort rubbish. And that's th th a good way to make discussion appear, occur. It's essential, and that's what we've tried doing. That's what has been taken off the most vulnerable people. And that's worth thing. The most vul vulnerable people, the poorest, always think they know nothing. Not always, but often, uh, think only the scientists know uh, anything. So it's about sharing information. Uh, sharing information empowers people. I'd like to share one example with you that will illustrate my third point, which is about taking off the sense of of guiltiness. There are people who come come over in tears, meeting us, saying, "You know what? Uh, I'm trying to sort sort my rubbish, but my husband spoils it all." Or I'm trying to to produce less, but I can't. I, I'm tr I try to to go work without using my car, but I can't. Say, hey, uh, leave yourself off. Don't don't be so stressed. Just do whatever you 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 can do. You can't. You are not. Impossible things cannot be mandatory. If you cannot make more than you are than you currently do, then you cannot do more than you currently do. See what is feasible in your case. There are people who are very committed uh, when it comes to to sort to waste sorting, and quite less when it comes to transport. Because for life, for personal reasons, 
they need their car every day and that's fine it's not about being a superhero it's not black and white like like uh, either you're a superhero or you're ze a super zero just do what you can and uh, try to remain positive it's about sharing it's about raising awareness but keeping positive just do as best as you can don't try to do more than you can because you will end up just feeling guilty and 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 uh, get off the pitch without playing further so that's that's the main idea we share experiences we share feedbacks we talk about topics and not about problems and we try try to make people not feel guilty for their lives thank you thank you very much to you and to all the other panelists for for sharing uh, Perhaps there will be questions from your side, ladies and gentlemen. Should that be the case, don't hesitate to raise your hands. I see someone has got a question. Over there. So please, please come and join me. I provide you with a microphone. Can you hear me? Well, first things first, I would like to thank you, all of you, for these presentations and this way of uh, approaching topics. I took a few notes. I, I, I'll try to speak briefly. Uh, I, I agree with what has been said uh, when you were saying that not only uh, we shouldn't put only on the scientists or on the students to, uh, to come up with the best ways uh, to learn. It's... it's, n it's at the same time, nobody's duty and everybody's duty. It's a collective responsibility. Uh, as numerous as we are and as diverse as we are, we have this responsibility to uh, forward uh, whatever our status, our professional status would be. Um, this facilitates uh, education and transmission and learning, but we all, we should, all, of, all of us uh, perform Peers teaching is very often more efficient than being in a classroom listening to somebody who will be, t be talking about climate change for three hours. I fully agree as well with what has been, has been said when you, when you were saying citizens are less engaged than they should be. Uh, I think it's an important point. Um, we used to have a huge lack of awareness uh, two years ago when, I w when I'd be saying I, I'd be joining the COP at her. Ah, yeah, the COP 21. I was saying no, the COP 25. So some, some, some other people would think it's a, it's a sport contest and ask me whether I, I, I think I'll be coming back with a medal around my neck. So uh, that it's, it's linked to this um, climate discrepancy that we notice, this environmental discrepancy. But the fact that citizens are less engaged than they should be is tools related or lack of tools related we or before we because we are trying to stay wi within our comfort zone uh, that's a, a question I'd, I'd like to ask how do you deal with that situation when you have people who know what's going on what's uh, that are aware but that who are not ready to make us to take a step ahead since they don't want to quit their comfort zone uh, it takes concessions it's not easy to uh, to make an effort as the name uh, says and that would be that would be about it thank you very much who among you would uh, have uh, an answer miss delmot i see you are in your in the starting blocks yeah, I would li I'd like to, to mention the fact that whenever talking about climate change and climate uh, change related topics, within the rich country there are re reactions you meet very often and that we classify within the not taking action uh, words. So people, f it's about people finding alibis uh, not to act, not to do anything. Uh, what, what I started doing during, uh, during tri uh, public debate is I, I started uh, listening to people and classifying uh, the the most the most um, common uh, sophisms um, it's for brave it's not unf it's unfair for the most vulnerable um, 
it's about finding words, showing them, okay, these are, these are just pretexts for not doing anything. These, just argument, these are good arguments for not doing anything, but no, now let's come up with arguments in order to change something. We do, if we were to build some uh, electric cars, in f for example, in cars, we would also create jobs. Yes, but they say, you know what, if we were to quit now to anticipate uh, fallacies, this was the word, fallacies in order to not do anything. Um, entrance, we could, we could make uh, insurance more expensive in zones that are in endangered by floods. And after having heard non-taking non action, fallacies, arguments, lazy arguments, not to do anything, too fast, sorry. Okay. So we need to say uh, that there's an article in Bapot uh, on the scientific article, difficult to understand. To not hesitate to, do, to, 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 to to read the article I've mentioned. We have a last word from Madame Lezon. Can you hear me? Uh, as an example, 30 kilometers per hour in big cities, people are unhappy, unhappy, unhappy. But the idea is not manipulation, it's psychology. Before getting to 30 kilometers per hour, it's a declaration. Now it's like this. The idea is to take another door. Do you know that there's a lot of uh, health problems because people su suffer from asthma? Do you have anyone uh, suffering from asthma in your surroundings? Do you know there is a lot of problems of safe, safety, world safety? There's so many that it wouldn't be interesting to f all of us to, uh, to do something with it. Would you be able to make a small gesture? It's really, this is the part to help so uh, there's less deaths. Yes, I could, that would be, okay. Uh, let's do 30 kilometers per hour. The, the road is different from just imposing, here it is, and uh, to compare with presenting the challenges and uh, proposing to be a part of the solution. I, I think that this is the story of 30 kilometers per hour was very good because everyone's talking about it and we say people, yes, 30 kilometers per hour, do you know when, when we're doing it? No, I don't know, it's just, uh, to, uh, to piss me off. There's always uh, this pedagogical part that is missing of why we're doing it. Thank you very much for these words, uh, ending words. The pedagogy is very important indeed in the education for about uh, the climatic change. It's one of the conclusions of this panel. Uh, I would like to, uh, to, to thank you all for your uh, enriching, uh, and, and of course for, for, for your, your engagement uh, on, in, on every day's basis and let's help this friendship with common time. Thank you all, and thank you, Jan.
Non, je vais, parce que pour moi, ce n'est pas évident d'avoir le retour dans le, dans le cas, c'est pour ça. C'est moi qui prends la parole d'abord D'accord. Je commence maintenant ou pas Oui, oui, oui. Je... Bonjour, bonjour, Stéphane, Stéphane Paillet. Je, je suis... Hello everyone, Stéphane Paillet. I'm a deputy director in charge of environmental and climate topics within the Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs. I'd like to thank the French delegation and the French Committee of the EU, of the UNFCCN, of the IUCN for organizing this panel concerning climate and biodiversity and entitled Climate and Bi Biodiversity, one fight, one team, one common goal, one common cause. Uh, I'd like to, uh, I will uh, give the, uh, the floor to Maud Lelievre to be the, the moderating. I'll, uh, I'll stick to my presentation in English, by the way. I think I, I know it's difficult and tricky for a, a French diplomat because it's not it's not French speaking pavilion, but it's a French pavilion afterwards. So it would have been more logical for me to keep speaking in French, but I won't be because uh, that's the uh, the uh, the dominating language when it comes to negotiations upon climate and biodiversity. IPCC workshop organized last summer reminded us uh, climate and biodiversity are connected. Biodiversity and, and, and nature conservation are essential uh, to preserve the, the climate. Uh, the preservation of the oceans, the fight against deforestation, the promotion of agroecology, the sustainable use of the ecosystems are key to pursue a trajectory acceptable for reaching the Paris Agreement objective goals. So the nature-based solutions are essential mechanism to the sustainable development and are the response to the challenges of, of, of climate and loss of biodiversity. The NBS would represent 30% of the attenuation measures needed to hold the temperature increase below 2 degrees by 2030. The NBS are also essential regarding the adaptation measures, but they represent only 2% of international finance dedicated to climate action. France has always taken into consideration that link between preservation of biodiversity and climate change. Our international cooperation program, led by the French Development Agency, AFD, plans to increase the share of bilateral climate finance, which co-benefits for biodiversity from 15% to 30%. We call on all donor states and organizations to set a similar goal or approach in order to contribute to the resources mobilization needed for both biodiversity and climate. The One Planet Summit for Biodiversity, which was organized in the beginning of the year 2021, was an opportunity to increase the ambition of the international community for protecting nature and implementing nature-based solutions for the ecological transition. We took the opportunity of this One Planet Summit to launch the Greek Green Wall Accelerator, which concerns a dozen of governments and multilateral institutions. And this governments and institutions pledged to mobilize nearly 16 billions of dollars in international funding. So the objective is to green the Sahel, 
giving new impetus to this African initiative. And the objective is to restore 100 million of hectares of degraded land. France and Costa Rica have launched a specific coalition, which is called the HAC in French language or in English, uh, in order to, to protect the biodiversity. More than 70 countries have joined this high ambition coalition for nature and people, call for a global commitment to protect at least 30% of land and seas by 2030. We considered also the role played by the forest for the sustainable development and well-being of local populations. France has been involved in protecting the tropical forest with a specific initiative called Alliance for the Conservation of Rainforest, which has unified 32 countries against the deforestation. In the current timing, we have a strong political international momentum to push for climate and biodiversity convergence with the COP26 and the CDB COP15. We need to use every relevant international event as an opportunity to engage world leaders to commit to this holistic vision. As such, the IUCN World Congress that was held in Marseille a few weeks ago was a critical moment for both COP15 and COP26. A plenary session on climate and biodiversity was organized during the first days of the Congress. The, manif the Marseille Manifesto that was adopted at the end of this Congress got from Congress events and it, it was a very important commitments and announcements. One of the pillars of this manifesto explicitly referred to the biodiversity crisis and climate emergency. It called for the quick reductions of gas emissions. Second, the prevention of negative trade-offs for biodiversity arising from decarbonization policies and to use technology wisely. And third point, the deployment of nature-based solutions. At the IUCN World Congress, one extremely important motion was also adopted by the Members' Assembly. And this motion was calling to reinforce the links between biodiversity and climate. It stressed the importance of the IPCC and IPBES conclusions during the last summer, and it called for the deployment of NBS in the implementation of the NDCs for greater convergence between the Rio Conventions. The motion also proposed the development of three tools, a policy framework, a platform, and a global partnership on biodiversity climate synergies. The adoption of this motion sent a clear message for alignment to in the International Committee for the coming outcomes of COP26 and COP15. Last point to raise, I take the opportunity to congratulate the COP26 UK Presidency to promote actions that bet benefit both climate and biodiversity. The protection and restoration of carbon-rich ecosystem is the top priority from a joint climate change mitigation and biodiversity protection purposes. We know that actions to protect and restore existing forests, for instance, have a large climate mitigation potential and large biodiversity co-benefits. So it's really important that the UK presidency focus on this specific pledge for uh, supporting the fight against deforestation. Thank you very much for listening. Merci, uh, merci beaucoup, Monsieur. Thank you very much, Mr. Payet. Thank you very much for this introduction and for being here and uh, present during the negotiations during the International Congress of the UCN that took place in Marseille. Uh, so uh, we owe you a lot uh, in this uh, Climate Commission. I am the president of the French Committee with a certain number of uh, persons I would like to introduce. Uh, and we think that the problems with microphone uh, and I will ask you all to speak slowly for the, for, the, uh, for the interpreters that I would like to thank for their hard work. So we'll make the session at the same time in, fr in French and in English. So thank you for introducing uh, that in English for the Americans who are present here tonight, today. I will uh, introduce the panel that is present uh, here. So we have, first of all, uh, the representative from the uh, from the IUCN, 
I will, as we are in the French pavilion, I was told by the French people, we have uh, Marie-Laure Birkan, who represents the partnership, French, French partnership for water, I was going to tell us uh, about it. She, she'll tell us about what's happening in the next month. We also have Brando Crispy, who represents Pro Natura International. Uh, is also with us, and we have three uh, foreign uh, guests. I will invite Patricia to join us too on the on stage. Patricia Zorita uh, is from BirdLife International. Et nous avons deux représentants. And we have two representatives coming with from the states. Uh, Chief Fester, specialist of climate, specialist of biodiversity, and Michael uh, Wilson, that we don't, we don't have to introduce for the members of UCN, and uh, who allow us during the, uh, the, the Congress, uh, the adoption of the commission, uh, we dealt with the climatic things um, in the IUCN. Thank you for being here. A few elements of presentation. So we have uh, entitled our works uh, of, of the International um, Union in a perspective that connects uh, the different subjects. Since the creation uh, of IUCN, we are today in a calendar schedule that is favorable to, uh, to talk about these questions with the adoption and the uh, issuance of the report from June between IPBDS and the uh, IPCC and a, and a calendar of uh, negotiations international with uh, an event that took place in September in France, uh, sorry, beginning of the September of 2021, COP15 that started in this uh, online and the second part will take part in China in 2022, and we're here in Glasgow to, uh, to, to tackle these subjects uh, commonly. It's a good calendar, but also a fair favorable context because uh, because the thing, uh, the, the climate and biodiversity, uh, it's a very important subject and uh, a growing subject, I'd say. We, uh, with uh, uh, we made uh, three, uh, remarks the impact of the uh, ch climate change on the nature, the degradation of nature that contributes to the climate change and uh, and uh, read the research uh, for solutions to fight against the uh, the climate change. That's what the President uh, Macron said at the beginning of this conference. Three pillars that sh seems to be essential to uh, the protection, of course, to uh, reduce emissions, to uh, to reduce the uh, restoration, restore uh, the degraded systems that are uh, places where you cap uh, cap of capture of carbon. That's a that's a growing subject in uh, in the IUCN. New uh, forest practices fight against uh, problems with fishing and especially the changes in the cities. That there will be more and more people living in the cities in the coming years. Uh, Capteur de carbone, mais aussi protectrice de la biodiversité. Beyond the, the actions and the observations that are, that were made from by the uh, scientists who work in the IUCN, uh, the first thing we want to have solutions based on nature. We'll talk about it uh, later. It's a subject, a historical subject, it's historical in the IUCN since 2009. And if we had to quote to the common dates for, for the negotiations, it's uh, the COP21 that took place in Paris in 2015, where for the first time we uh, really spoke of two uh, important subjects. And then the con LY Congress, that is an important Congress for the IUCN in 2016, and adopted two motions. The first one that did the, the uh, which define the solutions based on nature, first of all, uh, and uh, how to use them in the, uh, climatic politics. D this is this is where we hear uh, where we hear uh, our friends from Hawaii. The solution is simple. Uh, we have one here in the IUCN. 
that you can see, but we are convinced that the solutions uh, are, exist, do exist. These are examples that uh, we have to have today, and this is what uh, led us to the ev internal evolution within our organization. This is why we are so, uh, this is why we are the COP26 in Glasgow, because beyond these solutions, the results and expertise, uh, we, uh, we've encouraged uh, members to create a new governance structure, a new commission that deals with the biodiversity subjects. It, it seemed, us, uh, seemed to us essential to act so that these subjects uh, appear as uh, in together. And this commission we'll, we'll talk about later uh, has the solution, that has a goal to create new approaches, new uh, research, and create new uh, tools like uh, red lists, green lists, lists, and solutions based on nature, and to be able to propose common solutions for you. You are experts of the climate, climate so you will maybe be, become our expert too. The, the, so these were the short, years, uh, uh, short words of uh, introduction. And I would propose to start by giving the floor to, to Michael Wilson, who uh, may uh, say something from his point of view. Thank you. Et les intervenants fermeront leur micro entre les interventions. Voilà. So turn off your microphones when you don't speak so we don't catch the background noise. I, merci, I do not speak French except for merci, but I would like to say aloha from Hawaii. And uh, this is the way we greet people to recognize the sort of unity of the human spirit, if you will, which is behind the motion that uh, Maud referred to. And it's a, a motion to create a climate crisis commission that would have as its purpose to save, if you will, those very important human institutions that are at risk now. And institutions such as families, institutions such as educational institutions, the institutions we prize because the Climate Crisis Commission has, of course, as its identifying element, the crisis, the emergency. We are headed towards a future that, from a Hawaii point of view, you might describe as an extreme emergency because extreme weather events may make it difficult for us to have a functioning society, and in addition to that, the rising of the ocean will eliminate our major city. So the motion that became the commission is in many ways a result of the hope that we will save fundamental human institutions. And for that to happen, it appears necessary, as um, I think the minister, Minister Pellier, thank you very much for your remarks. As you referred to, we need to do everything we can. And IUCN has a remarkable range of resources. It has six commissions. Now it will have a seventh commission. And those commissions offer great scientific expertise, but also expertise that reaches to indigenous people, young people. So this is a collection point, the Climate Crisis Commission, for those resources of IUCN that can make a difference in, it's a kind of a specific concept, keeping the earth from heating up to 1.5 degrees. And the message from the Conference of the Parties that we've all attended is that there will be a commitment that will be a new and profound commitment, but there needs to be a facilitation, an application of principles that IUCN has in leading to the solution, such as the importance of nature-based solutions versus 
perhaps geoengineering solution. So IUCN's ability to bring its resources together is kind of captured in this concept. And I have to conclude by saying that it is a French, in many ways, it's a new French organism. It was born with the leadership of the French. Maude Lelevre was certainly in the, in the lead in many ways, as was the government of France, and the president has set the tone for this idea of not giving up, being able to keep the earth from heating to 1.5 degrees, and in where necessary to restore. So I am grateful to be here. I'm grateful for the chance to recognize the importance of working internationally through IUCN and the chance to, uh, again, thank um, France for its its leadership and, and, and Maude in particular. So thank you for the opportunity and aloha. Merci, merci. Um, for thank you very much for these warm words towards France. Uh, it's a common fight. We're, we're, we're playing in the same team. Uh, we'd like to give the floor to our French representatives of the IUCN, by the way. Uh, if, you will, if you would be so very kind as to take the floor. Um, and somebody from the uh, French Partnership for Water. With the it has been created in 2007. We'd like to hear about your uh, perspective, your, your insights and the questions you would like to ask when it comes to the future. Voilà. Um, bonjour. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. I remove my headset on. The uh, French Partnership for Water is uh, yet another baby uh, uh, of the French government. It has been created by the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs back in 2017, just after the World Forum on Water in Mexico, since we've understood then that it was important for all the water playmakers around the world to come up with common standards. Um, we, l we count 200 members, ministries, NGOs, universities, uh, cities such as Paris, Veolia, which is a private company, a private group. So this is what we're talking about, fresh water. And what it's true that um, the French Committee of the IUCN asked for it uh, last year because our members, our governments, has seen within water biodiversity, in uh, through biodiversity, uh, a huge stake. And the IBS report has uh, confirmed that water biodiversity, and especially freshwater bio biodiversity, is uh, the most spectacularly drastically declining. A couple of weeks ago in Marseille, I heard this, uh, this ghastly uh, number, this amount. Since 1950, we made dry 90% of the wetlands around the world in the world. This is terrifying. Uh, this is outrageous. These waterlands are fundamental carbon sinks and leverages, drivers for biodiversity, of course. So it is extremely important when it comes to mitigation. Um, forest wetlands as well are very often close to, 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 to water resources, so deforestation means less water, basically. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. So um, water biodiversity, the, the, the emergency for saving, protecting biodiversity is converging with the uh, adaptation and mitigation objectives, the climate ones. So we are here on stage with our partners, uh, not only on stage but on the field, with all our partners, although we represent the Ministry of Agriculture and private companies, other universities, scientists, cities, we, uh, we are uh, the porte-parole of the, of the water industry, as Mr. Perrier reminded during the introduction. 
the uh, nature-based solutions represent only 2% of all investments, of all measures, steps that are taken to, find, to come up with solutions when it comes to infrastructure building. Well, so in the field of water, there, there is a lot to do still. So if there was just one message to send, that would be this, before restoring, stop destroying, protect first, primum non nocere, stop destroying. It's a good thing to rebuild, but stop destroying at first. That, that would be a, a good step. I don't know whether you see on the, on the screen there is a, a visualization of a publication we, we came up with. This is for the French uh, public playmakers uh, to, make, to facilitate their bringing solutions, nature-based solutions for France. We've made the same thing on an international level when it comes to water, fresh water, I'm using fresh water, fresh water. So this association for nature, uh, this uh, water and water-funded and nature-based solutions for nature, water solutions, ba water-based solutions for nature. Thank you for this publication. Uh, I'd like to give the floor now to Brando Crespi. You are deputy uh, chairman of Pro Natura International. This is a former organi organization. You base your work on fighting against, against uh, poverty, climate change, and, and fighting for biodiversity. What is your, your insight? What, what are your observations on the current situations and when it concerns the solutions for tomorrow? Uh, first Hospitality, thank you to the French government and thank you to IUCN. We've been members <coughs> of IUCN for many decades. Um, Pranatura was born in Brazil and then after the 92 conference, we moved our headquarters to Paris where we have essentially internationalized our work, which has been really focused on um, dealing with the interlocking problems and thus interlocking solutions around poverty, biodiversity, and climate. Um, in terms of biodiversity, with the Museum of Natural History of Paris, we've organized 13 of the biggest expeditions in the world. Um, you may remember the Radeau de Cime, which is a tool, one of many we have um, developed in to explore the canopy of rainforests. And um, uh, our biggest expedition was in Papua New Guinea, uh, now a few years ago, where we brought 180 scientists for a year and a half and came back with one and a half million forms of life, which are still today being studied in about 20 different institutions around the world. Um, we, in terms of uh, agroecology, we've done quite a lot of work, um, including in Israel, and uh, done a lot of innovation where we were able to work with local communities to take sterile Sahara sand, and uh, with a combination of uh, uh, camel dung or uh, compost in some cases, and most of the time by adding biochar, we were able to um, generate 11 harvests a year. Um, so this is quite an example of the resiliency that natural systems, if they are fed, and um, I won't forget the other ingredient, which uh, in English we call elbow grease, uh, which is really the human effort, but um, the, uh, we know today that natural systems are incredibly resilient and that we can regenerate uh, them uh, incredibly effectively. Um, going back to biodiversity and to what we are uh, really addressing here, um, I think uh, what I'd like to share with you is our approach to uh, protecting forests in Africa, which we think is um, based on the philosophy called uh, the Prim Fab Factor by a philosopher designer called Leonardo da Vinci of the 20th century, uh, Bucky Fuller. Um, how do you bring about the biggest amount of change with the least amount of effort? And uh, what 
we know today is that charcoal is responsible for 70% of the deforestation of Africa. Charcoal is the second biggest business in Africa. It kills uh, close to 600,000 women and children a year. So by um, we are now developing, we are opening this week our first factory, not our, but we have sponsored it in uh, Cameroon. Uh, we are opening in um, Nigeria, three factories. We are opening in uh, Senegal and in the Central African Republic, um, factories to produce green charcoal. Um, that is essentially an alternative to forest-based charcoal, which is created by using agricultural waste or invasive species like PIFA in Africa or elephant grass in Brazil. Um, here at COP26, we also announced the creation of Biochar do Brasil, uh, a biochar company to bring biochar back to the Amazon. Um, ironically, it was born, the use of Barcha was born in Brazil, in the Amazon, and it is something which Amerindians used to terraform about 11% of the Amazon and which allowed for the creation of cities which were larger than London and certainly cleaner than London until the white man with his germs arrived. So. In these factories, essentially take agricultural waste, and it's very important that it is agricultural waste, um, and put it through a technology called pyrolysis. And what we get out of that is uh, um, something called biochar, which you'll hear more and more uh, about because it's now being discovered as one of the best solutions we have to fight climate change by compressing it. We can create a green charcoal that burns cleaner and slower and warmer than traditional charcoal. And, um, and um, well, I encourage you to look at biochar and green charcoal as an extraordinary solution. We have embraced it pretty wholeheartedly because when added to the soil, we get increases in agricultural production between 40 and 300 percent. So it sounds quite extraordinary, but now there are 18,000 studies demonstrating the, this, um, the effectiveness of this product. Um, so I thank you all, and i um, happy to be here. Merci. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue. Uh, BirdLife, Patricia Zorita, who represents BirdLife, an organization uh, coming from the UK, but also a world imp uh, important world organization. We have in France an organization that uh, League of Protection of Birds, so it's BirdLife, it's a subject, and we've seen it during the, 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 the Congress, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a subject that, that uh, gathers uh, specialists of both sides of the Mediterranean Sea. So uh, your point of view, I would love to see it. And we'll also, uh, what, what, what do the scientists say about the species and the ecosystems? What is your analysis today? And your solutions for the future? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Maud, uh, for the invitation. And thanks so much uh, to the IUCN committee and the French Pavilion for hosting this very important conversation. Um, it's lovely to hear the remarks from you guys. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, BirdLife International is a family of 117 organizations around the world. We are the largest and oldest partnership for nature conservation of civil society organizations, and we are the biggest compact in IUCN. Um, not only we have to keep reminding people of the importance of nature for climate as a solution, but also the impact that climate is having on nature, but also um, remind ourselves uh, <laughs> that this is the very first COP where the CBD is having an event, where the Ramsar Convention is having an event, 
we have gone through COP since 1995 for climate, and in 2021 is the first time that we are actually having side events that are hosted by the Convention of Biological Diversity and the Convention of Wetlands, the Ramsar Convention. It has taken us this long. And we have to keep reminding people of the role of nature and biodiversity um, for, cl for, a climate, for climate as a solution, but also as an incredibly important element for our own survival. Um, we work very closely with IUCN uh, and are very happy uh, that um, Maud, uh, you got elected. Um, and very happy to hear all of all of these French babies that are coming up as a result of all of your leadership. Um, and we are incredibly uh, concerned about the tone of the COP in terms of how nature is still not being mainstreamed in the decisions. I mean, we have had a whole week of negotiations. There are incredibly important pledges about stopping deforestation, uh, but we're still not seeing the impact that that could have in reality. And unless we actually make this um, a very strong statement of how this can trans translate into reality, uh, it's going to be yet another failed COP. Um, now, why is biodiversity is important? Uh, biodiversity is the tissue, and then, as you said it so nicely, uh, the minute that you have nature and that you give nature a chance, it comes back. It is that tissue of life that enables everything to function. Us, the services that we get, I mean, we were talking about water and the, wet, the role that wetlands provide, and you said it so well. 90%, we have lost 90% of the wetlands in the last three centuries. 90% of the wetlands. Um, and without this nature, we're not going to be able to have food, we're not going to be able to breathe, we're not going to be able to have water, we're not going to be able to have uh, the quality of life that we're all aspiring for. Um, and the problem that we are seeing is that the loss of nature is exacerbating the, the, the climate change impact. So it's not only that it's actually being impacted by climate change, it's actually enhancing. I mean, we have seen the, the fires in California, we have seen the fires in the Pantanal, we have seen the fires in the Amazon. This is the, uh, there were a couple of events, multiple events actually, talking about the role of forest as not synced anymore because of the incapacity of uh, securing carbon, because we have affected the system so much. So we do have to invest in nature, and I am so happy to hear from the minister about the call for getting more funding for biodiversity as a role, as, as a key role for the uh, uh, for the uh, for our action on climate. Um, but we also have to remember that th this has to go on parallel with stopping fossil fuels, right? I mean, this if we really want to have impact in terms of climate change, we have to stop fossil fuels flat out. Period and go in parallel and invest in all of these biodiversity measures. And I, I couldn't agree more, it's not only about um, investing on the, on the restoration, it's about stopping the destruction, and that has to go also in, in parallel. Um, we, we also have to remember, and you who have worked in the Amazon so much, um, and for those of us who are all over the world working directly with indigenous peoples and local communities, that um, environment and a healthy environment and a healthy planet is now, um, we are advocating for uh, that to be a human right. Uh, BirdLife International, alongside with the Uni uh, with, uh, United Nations uh, um, Commission on Human Rights, have been campaigning on ensuring that the General Assembly um, of uh, Human Rights enshrines the right to a healthy environment as one of our fundamental rights. Uh, the COVID pandemic has shown us how important nature is for us and how decimating it can be the minute that we're actually uh, facing something like the, the, the pandemic. Um, I will just want to highlight to finish a couple of p particular outcomes that came out of the Congress in Marseille um, and congratulate IUCN for pushing it forward. Um, we, we, as you heard, members of IUCN endorsed the motion of an ambitious nature positive um, post-2020 global biodiversity framework. We had a very good initial element of the COP of biodiversity in Kunming, and we're hoping that the negotiation that happens next April will truly translate in a strong biodiversity framework uh, that brings together the conventions, not only the CBD and the UNFCCC, but also the conventions on migratory species and Ramsar. 
uh, the Marseille Manifesto, we have heard it, uh, recognizes the call from across the Congress uh, of, of the UN states to recognize the right to a healthy environment. I talked about that, and it was really nice to see that in the manifesto, uh, acknowledging that a healthy planet is our human right. Um, and the members committed to further prioritize climate change across the Union uh, with the establishment of the new Climate Change Commission. And we are very um, much ready to make sure that this commission works on ensuring that solutions are put in place, that more financing goes to nature, and that nature is recognized much more forcefully as, as, as a solution for climate. Um, the principles of nature-based solutions that were adopted uh, to ensure the key work for biodiversity and local people and indigenous people, uh, and that they focus on protecting, conserving, and restoring all types of natural ecosystems, including the oceans, uh, which are incredibly important for climate and for climate stability, and that they don't act as a substitute for the wider decarbonization. I talked about that. We have to stop fossil fuels. Um, I just want to finish by thanking you guys again for having BirdLife, um, for remembering that um, you count on us, that we are here to keep pushing nature as a key solution for climate change, and that we know that the climate and nature crisis are just the two sides of one same coin. Thank you. Merci, merci Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you for reminding uh, about the conclusions of uh, Hawaii Congress. Now, Mr. Fletcher, make us dream. You are a uh, climate specialized scientist. So in a few minutes, since we have to leave the place for the next panel, but can you, can you uh, provide us with food for dreams? <coughs> um, good evening, good afternoon, thank you uh, to the French Pavilion. I can, I can talk about food, but I'm afraid it's not food for dreams. Since the dawn of civilization, humanity has caused the loss of 83% of all wild mammals and half of all wild plants. Humans have altered 70% of the world's lands. That's 70% of the world's lands with mines, roads, industrial farms, cities, and airports. 40% of the world's original forests have been eliminated. The oceans are hotter, more acidic, and dissolved oxygen will continue to decrease for many centuries. By 2050, 99% of coral reefs are projected to experience annual bleaching. On average, 1.3 species go extinct each year, over 15 times the rate of extinction prior to the 16th century. Since 1970, food crop production increased 300%, and half of all agriculture expansion has come at the expense of forests. In 2019, we deforested the planet at a rate of three football fields per minute, largely to raise cattle and the grain to feed them. 43% of all ice and desert-free land on this planet, two-thirds of all freshwater use is for food production, and over 80% of farmland is used for livestock, but it produces just 18% of food calories. Cattle and the grain they eat use one-third of available land surface on this planet, 16% of all available fresh water, one-third of available grain production, 86% of all land mammals are now livestock or humans. The number one most important thing any, any of us can do is to stop eating meat. You can preserve nature, you can stop deforestation, and there's a medical benefit that you'll probably live longer. So the dream the uh, optimism is that right there in front of us, three times a day, what we decide to do with food is the most powerful individual solution that any one of us can take. Thank you. Merci, merci. Et puis, alors peut-être on... Thank you very much for the conclusion, for you all who are here together with us. You are a part of the solution, so uh, you work within the UICN, you could bring your climate experts. Thank you for bringing your expert insights. Uh, I hope, I do hope France will be pledging, will be playing its advocacy role to push your agenda forward. 
and thank you for sharing the message and make it so loud that they hear us over there in the plenary session uh, meeting room. Thank you very much. Bon, well done, c'était pas gagné, hein? C'était, on était beaucoup et tout, hein?
Oui. Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Est-ce que vous Can you hear me okay? Uh, put the heads, headsets on, please. Very well, it's, it's okay, everyone, yes, no? There are some problems with the microphones on? Okay, we, we're good, okay. Hello, everyone. The French Partner, Water Partnership is delighted to welcome you to the French Pavilion of Paris for this session the entitled How to Improve Knowledge for a Better Adaptation, Knowledge for a Better Adaptation to the Climate Change and Water Management. An event that was organized with the National Office for Water, OYO, and the National Center of, for Space Paris CNES, and supported by the World Meteorological uh, Organization. To begin and open this event, we have the honor and the privilege to welcome Mr. Crouza, Ambassador for France in charge of negotiations on climate change, renewable energy, and climate risk prevention. I am therefore pleased to give him the floor for a few uh, words, words of introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the French Pavilion. It's always a, a pleasure to come back to the Pavilion. Uh, uh, I don't like this uh, negotiation rooms. There's no air. Uh, at the end of this uh, week, we have negotiations that uh, progress slowly, but uh, the outcome will be positive, we hope. So welcome to this se session that concerns the mobilization of uh, scientific knowledge so we can adapt uh, the the, uh, the the things to make the, the societies more resilient. Thank you, uh, Madame Delmotte, Jaris Kuhlman, uh, who uh, shed on a light and I remember uh, the Partenariat Français pour l'eau, l'Office International pour l'eau, and the CNES, and the uh, World Meteorological Organization to have organized this event. In 2021, we had the report, Zizek, uh, that Valérie, you will, be, uh, you will uh, present to us, well, the main conclusion in terms of uh, water. Uh, so we know that human ac activity accelerate the, uh, the change uh, the change, the climate change. So we need to change our practices. We can also um, uh, talk about the the, uh, the joint report uh, of the U.S. and uh, uh, the IPCC about the loss of biodiversity. So in the cross uh, section of uh, society and uh, other things, uh, there is water that is w everywhere in our lives, and it's unfortunately on in margin, usually in margin of our discussions. But there is so, although it's important for the organization of our society, so the resources of water that will create uh, conditions for survival, that will cause migrations and uh, sh problems with sharing water. We have to be prepared for risks like, um, like uh, typhoons and uh, storms. And also uh, we have to reorganize uh, the resources in drinking water. And for this, the, the scientific knowledge is of uh, great importance to help us in this task. Uh, there's also the experience of the in ground, on the ground. And since 2006, Paul, uh, France is uh, to, uh, uh, implementing a special program together with the agencies of water and gives a priority for uh, solutions f based on nature. Uh, so the adaptation is compatible with the preservation of the ecosystems. And we are planting us also uh, an international strategy of water for the period 2020-2030 that will make easier uh, the access to, uh, to to drinking water. So to act at the same time on the ground, in international level, and to adapt to uh, to this future situation. Here's a program that will develop. With, within this panel. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much for this introductory words, Mr. Ambassador. Now uh, we want to understand better these, uh, we have the hon honor to, uh, to welcome today Mrs. Valerie masson delmotte co-chair of Group 1, which focuses on physics uh, of Group 1 of Climate Physics of the Universal Panel of Climate and the Grand World Panel of Climate IPCC, but also Director of Research in Climate and the Grand Pool Panel of Climate Changes that will uh, shed a light of the new uh, proposal of the uh, IPCC. Hello. Thank you very much for this uh, 
invitation to share some uh, aspects of the, the recent recent report of the Czech. It's available in English online. The uh, translation will come in a few weeks, so it's uh, an assessment of the state of knowledge on the physics of climate to observe the causes of what is we're observing and what to expect depending on the emissions of uh, the, 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 the pollutions to come. Next slide, please. So if we take the level of uh, heating uh, that is observed today, it's 1.1 one deg degree. The best, our best estimation that is fully due to uh, human activities. Mainly because of greenhouse gases and partly hidden by the cooling of, uh, of uh, production particles. The one going down uh, the most are carbon dioxide and methane. This uh, level of heating is uh, a relevant indicator when it comes to, to climate uh, change because it's directly proportional to the, to the level of, uh, of climate heating overall. An um, important part of this assessment is to show that human influence on climate is not only about, about temperature, about changes when it comes to rains, but also when it comes to extreme weather phenomena like heat waves huge rains and droughts. The region that are shown here has, uh, has six angles forms. The colored ones mean you have a very strong signal of, uh, of upgrading. And we also show the, the trust, the level of trust we have in our scenario, saying that it's a human, uh, it's human action. Sometimes data are not available, is not available on a certain or not precise enough. Sometimes we lack attribution works, and it's an important access. And here there is room for progress in order to better understand the cause of the changes observed. Observed. Next slide. Next slide, please. Five big scenarios. Five big possible scenarios when it comes to the evolution of greenhouse gases emissions. We have a, a yellow scenario, which is a stagnation for for a long time before, go, before it goes down, in which case the heating level goes beyond 1.1 on a, on a 20 years period, two then 2.5 two then 3. Uh, if the greenhouse gases emissions were to go down, it's blue and deep blue scenarios, then we'd have one degree and a half in the upcoming 20 years, but we could limit this enhancement during the next, during next 50 years uh, beneath one degree, which will depend upon our capacity to limit very quickly these greenhouse gases emissions, there are two key uh, conditions. We have to uh, avoid accumulation and to reach as fast as possible the net zero goal, and then to, we need the ha to have the possibility to act quickly for the benefit of the, of the climate, putting down um, uh, methane emissions and water treatment solutions thanks to methane. So you will find here on this uh, interactive atlas uh, a gold mine of uh, information with the possibility to get data. Uh, I'm showing now at the level of the whole planet the structure of temperature changes. It's very, very strong when it comes to the, to the Arctic. And Next slide, please. It's same thing for, for rainfalls. There is a whole chapter um, about water, about rain, we show that a, a warmer climate seems that the water cycle is getting more intense because hot air contains more water vapor. There are changes when it comes to uh, in Western Africa. Um, it's also uh, less and less rains in Mediterranean climate zone, which is proportional to the level of war of world heating. Next slide. Another consequence of our of the more and more heat in uh, 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 in the ocean, the uh, the rise of the level of the sea, 20 centimeters already is going faster. It's 3.7 centimeters per year at this moment. The more greenhouse gases we have, the the quickest the quickest. Uh, the the uh, the level of the sea will rise, and it goes the other way around as well. If we were to limit, as uh, the more we build the capacity to 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 diffuse greenhouse gases emissions, the better it will be in terms uh, of 
sea level. Plus, water is getting sol salty more and more. In this report, we underline the, uh, the numerous aspects of changes in, in different regions. We have 33 indicators linked to the dry level the, and the water. It's relevant as well for water management. There are other coast aspects. In each region, you can find a synthesis of the numerous features that have been observed and are already changing, and those we are waiting for different levels of heating. The, the, the small icon you see shows region for which we expect more and more drops for every fraction of expected portion of climate warming. It's in both hemispheres. So for each region, more and more changes, simultaneous changes and multiple changes for this impact generating changes will occur with climate warming. Warming, you see on the, on the upper side intense heating that can be dangerous for, for physical work outside and the amount of days worked goes up with for each fraction and it affects wider and wider regions. Bottom, you see, uh, percent percent-wise rains per fraction of heating of, of climatic warming. You see that it's more intense in the rain, the heavy rainfall period um, regions, and you can you can see that many solutions are are chosen uh, based upon the on, on the past, and that's not that's not the way to do. Science says that it's a part it's a part of the solution if it's integrated when you dimension works and you have a physical knowledge of the level of warming. It can be integrated uh, starting today to prepare the decisions who will look in, in advance. So it's clear that in terms of uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, the climate with which we're going to live in the far future depends on the, the decisions we take in every day today and in the next coming 10 years but uh, we'll try to reduce the risks by integrating it in the decision taking in order to prepare and to reinforce the res resilience of infrastructure uh, uh, infrastructures uh, dealing with water uh, this report has 30 uh, the pages and uh, the technical has 60 pages so that's for engineers in different sectors of activity now there is a survey that's been open to know what the synthesis would be uh, useful in different sectors of activity. Regional uh, synthesis to, of two pages, and it, I think it has a great value to understand the, the, the challenges in every region. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Pour compléter cette in order to, to fulfill, we have a video now, as Mr. could not, uh, Dominique Béraud, who is the chief of the division of the surveillance of the terrestrial syndrome, we wanted to uh, il illustrate us uh, the subject. Alors, bonjour tout le monde, et je remercie les organisateurs d'avoir associé l'Organisation Météo Mondiale, l'OMM, euh, à, à cet événement. L'OMM, c'est l'agence de l'ONU qui est en charge des questions du temps, du climat et de l'hydrologie, hydrologie opérationnelle, et en particulier dans les questions de l'observation du système de la Terre et de sa modélisation pour ensuite en faire des, des, des prévisions et, et des, des, des meilleures connaissances de, des développements futurs. Et cet aspect Terre est tellement important parce qu'on a affaire à une complexité naturelle absolument invraisemblable. On ne comprend toujours pas bien à, à tous les niveaux comment fonctionne le cycle hydrologique. Et, et c'était très important d'avoir une approche intégrée parce qu'on a affaire à des domaines naturels qui sont interconnectés en, entre l'eau, euh, le temps, le climat, euh, l'environnement au sens large. Et on doit refléter cette interconnexion. Et c'est pour ceci que l'OMM a, depuis bientôt deux ans, euh, adopté cette approche du système Terre dans son intégralité. Et ça permet premièrement 
d'interagir entre les, les domaines physiques et ça permet également de manière pratique d'avoir des meilleures interconnexions entre les systèmes d'observation eux-mêmes, systèmes d'observation de, de l'atmosphère, du climat, de l'hydrologie des océans, et puis également d'avoir une meilleure interopérabilité de toutes les différentes sources de données, des systèmes de gestion de données et des systèmes de gestion d'informations. Donc on, on s'oriente dans cette direction-là pour mieux servir ensuite les, les différents pays membres de l'OMN. Et ça s'est traduit également par cinq décisions absolument critiques pour l'OMM. Il y a des décisions historiques qui ont été prises par le congrès de l'OMM il y a environ deux semaines de ceci, qui visaient premièrement à avoir un réseau d'observation mondial de base, ce qu'on en appelle le GBON, dans un premier temps pour améliorer toutes les prévisions météorologiques. Et dans un deuxième temps, on va étendre ces, ces services également au monde climatique, au monde océan et au monde de l'eau euh, avec du temps. Et pour vraiment asseoir euh, ce, ce réseau mondial, il y a deux structures qui ont été décidées également. Euh, la première qui est une euh, décision sur la, la, le partage des données euh, de manière unifiée. C'est la politique unifiée de l'OMM pour l'échange de données pour accroître l'échange de toutes les données qui existent déjà. Et on, on sépare entre ce qu'on appelle des données fondamentales qui sont obligatoires et d'autres qui sont recommandées ou qui permettent d'améliorer encore la, la qualité. Et en retour, les pays qui partagent ces données ont des, des, des bien meilleurs outputs, des modèles euh, atmosphériques euh, de, de haute qualité pour ensuite développer des services euh, de prévision et, et de gestion. Et, et, et l'autre élément d'appui, c'est un nouveau mécanisme de financement euh, global également, avec beaucoup de différents partenaires qui, qui, qui appuient et qui appuieront euh, ces développements. Et un point particulier, c'est que ce mécanisme de financement n'est pas seulement là pour les nouveaux équipements, mais également pour assurer la, la maintenance et, et, les les, et les opérations de ces systèmes de, de mesure. Et euh, j'ai parlé de... de Cinq décisions, il y en a trois. Les deux autres concernent directement l'hydrologie et l'hydrologie opérationnelle. Euh, premièrement, en, en adoptant au niveau du Congrès euh, une nouvelle vision de l'OMM en manière d'hydrologie et euh, avec un plan d'action associé qui fait euh, pratiquement plus de 100, pla de 200 pages et qui inclut également une nouvelle stratégie de recherche euh, appliquée pour l'hydrologie opérationnelle dans les années qui viennent jusqu'en 2030. Euh, c'est historique parce que euh, ce ne sont pas forcément des activités nouvelles, mais la manière d'approcher ces activités, de les structurer et de travailler en partenariat est nouveau. Et puis d'ailleurs, ce plan d'action a, a été l'objet d'un euh, processus participatif euh, très ample et qui a duré euh, pas loin d'une année, où, où tous les acteurs ont pu euh, s'y retrouver, faire des propositions qui ont été intégrées dans la, la version euh, telle qu'on la voit aujourd'hui dans le document du Congrès. Et là, la dernière décision importante qui a été prise par le Congrès, c'est une déclaration de l'OMM sur l'eau euh, qui vise à améliorer la situation, notamment par des, des, un meilleur accès à, à toutes les informations et alertes précoces d'ici à 2030, euh, une meilleure intégration des notions de climat et d'eau euh, pour le développement et notamment l'atteinte les, 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 des ODD, et de manière générale, un renforcement des capacités pour la connaissance et, et, et des systèmes de formation. Et tout ceci, à nouveau, dans un partenariat et qui se traduit en termes politiques par une coalition eau et climat qui vise à accélérer l'atteinte des, des, des ODD, et notamment le numéro 6. Euh, et, et tout ceci va appuyer la démarche, j'allais dire, plus traditionnelle de l'OMM en matière de, de monitoring de l'eau et des, des systèmes de... de d'observation avec la nouvelle génération du monitoring qui, qui vient, euh, qui intègre euh, toutes les, les sources de données possibles. Hein, et en plus des traditionnels, vous allez retrouver bien entendu le satellitaire, euh, des nouvelles technologies, les observations citoyennes, euh, l'Internet des objets et, et toutes ces nouveautés où on va essayer de trouver des, 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 des ponts pour construire des standards pour pouvoir comparer ces données et, et les utiliser de manière interopérable dans tous les, les réseaux de mesure. Et de manière concrète, euh, on, on est en train de développer des projets, notamment euh, dans l'océan Indien, autour du bassin du lac Tchad, la région d'Afrique du Sud, euh, les îles du Pacifique, etc., pour concrétiser cette nouvelle approche de manière, euh, de manière unifiée. 
et, et, et on ne veut pas s'arrêter aux données, parce que les données, c'est un outil, c'est encore pas le but. Le, le but, c'est d'avoir une meilleure information, et c'est pour ça que l'OMM développe également le système qu'on appelle HydroSOS, pour Status on Outlook System, qui permet, en gros, de collecter toute l'information existante et de montrer euh, quel est l'état actuel de l'eau dans le monde, les eaux de surface, les eaux souterraines, les lacs, etc. Et également d'avoir des modèles qui permettent une simulation pour le futur, dans les, les, les semaines qui viennent, voire les mois qui viennent, à, à une échelle euh, subsaisonnière, euh, pour informer les décideurs, euh, que ce soit le privé ou le public, sur les, les mesures à prendre pour éviter des, des crues, pour éviter des sécheresses. Et tout ceci s'intègre finalement dans une, une chaîne de valeur complète euh, qui incorpore autant les aspects climat que les aspects eau et, et les autres aspects euh, propres à l'OMM, pour construire cette chaîne de valeur euh, avec une dimension participative, avec une, une vraie écoute auprès des utilisateurs pour comprendre leurs besoins, comprendre leur fonctionnement et développer les outils qui sont les plus utiles. Et je pense qu'à l'heure de la COP26, je pense que c'est une contribution de l'OMM qui, qui est très appliquée, très pratique et qui permettra d'atteindre au mieux les objectifs du développement durable. Et avec ceci, j'en ai terminé et je vous remercie. Eh bien, nous remercions. Well, thank you, Mr. Perro and uh, Miss Delmot for these words that gave us uh, the possibility to um, to draw the uh, the basics. Now, I would like the, our panelists to uh, join me on stage and um, show the basics when it comes to special building and operational services. Miss Jean-Luc Rodo, chair of the task force upon water and climate changes inside the French Partnership for Water. The PFE has been reminding that water is the main impacted sector, but that um, effects can be very different depending on the territory. Why do we in insist on this problem? Why do we insist on the problem of knowledge of the impact of the water regime and quality? I hear, I hope you hear me well, for a simple reason, which is uh, our motto from the very beginning has always been we ha in order to do properly manage water, you have to know uh, basic elements of hydrology. So that's our motto, better know in order to better manage. Next slide, please. From a water resources management perspective. It works, yeah? I, I won't be talking about the cycle of water because you know, you know it's very hard, but uh, as you see, the whole activity is quite tricky to manage. Next slide, what do we need? Well, we need, of course, data, climate service uh, data. You see it at the bottom of the screen. This is necessary, of course. Uh, it is quite developed in our country. We've developed as well new services, such as the alarm services. We have some uh, heat alarm, hurricane, hurricane alarm services. These are indicators that show that the situation in which we are is society is, is links, linked with the fact that society asks for more and more information, which doesn't always mean that you manage everything properly. There have been floods in Aria, and there has been a disaster anyway. So why our data, as it was rich, wasn't sufficient? Because as you see, you have to know the hydrometrics, the uh, uh, about the rivers, but you, you need as well, what you need as well, is what usage comes afterwards, comes after it. And you have to know what what are the issues with water quality, what are the hydrology uh, features. And then you have to connect all these data with, with data with the data banks. Um, and it's very uh, important because agriculture can represent a half of the flow of all the rivers. It's the same thing with big industry, it can, ha it can have a uh, huge impact. So you need the whole thing in order to come up with multi-usage models. It, it's uh, environment management, depending upon the climate, but depending also about, uh, upon human activities in this environment. So you have to build the whole thing, which is exactly what we try to do. It. I'm going to show you with a couple of slides to, to what it led us. Uh, for instance, uh, five, six years ago, we've come up with an ex a program called Explore. They aim to forecast what is going to happen, what is to happen 
we got our rivers, so you can see we, which, which regions in France are going to be affected. It is a year mean reduction, so you see in south western France, but also Paris region, oddly enough. Uh, and, the, uh, and the center part, the mountains, Larzac and such. There is a second slide. This is what is going to happen when we, uh, we can show you, you still have western and southern France, the Paris region, and eastern France as well. Both criteria are important since. Si on veut faire des barrages, encore faut-il qu'on ait les bons écoulements. C'est pour ça que c'est important. we need to have both. I will uh, talk quickly. Uh, on another criterion, uh, the quality of water. You know, we have this directive on water that bases on data, uh, chemical, uh, everyone's oxidable, uh, phos phosphorus, and all that, everything was toxic, but also on data, uh, hydrobiological data. This is very much impacted by the uh, climate change. Of course, all the chemical pollution uh, depend, de depend on, on the water but on the hydrometry, sorry, on, on it's, it's much worse for the biology because we have problems with temperature and uh, invasive species. W we know, for example, that uh, we have in France, uh, we had an invasion uh, of these insects. This, this is a kind of flight that is very dangerous and an invasion our uh, 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 rivers of big fishes that uh, took the place of noble species. So we really have important, uh, impact uh, this is what the framework directive uh, forces to uh, study and uh, we've created an important network why do we estimate that uh, at the uh, world scale it doesn't work what i've presented you uh, on france is well is uh, good is the same thing for, for the whole western europe this is a slide from our first publication on the evolution of hydrometrical uh, uh, stations in africa um, a thousand, 1,000 stations, we had a fall of uh, a network of measurements in the last years. This is due to the fact that uh, in Africa there's many states that are on war, where the administration is completely uh, inexistent and, uh, and the hydrometry is abandoned. This is serious. I could do the same reasonment for the agriculture. We know very well that the agricole is the, the one that takes lots of water, the principal, the main uh, usage of water. We want them, them to manage the water. We have to train them and we have to, uh, to, to, to give them uh, warning systems to follow the, the soils and the, uh, the rains so they know exactly when they have to uh, uh, bring water useful for the plant, not an excess. It's very important. You know very well that in, in most regions of the world, is the agriculture water uh, that is the principal source of pollution and, uh, and uh, the, the, the losses in the uh, underground water. So we could think that the best thing to progress would be to, to save water by allowing uh, the agricultures to better uh, manage water. So our gen general idea is that there is a need uh, to, to reinforce the expertise. To get back to uh, I, I'll let my, uh, the, the next person to say that there are means to, uh, to, to fight with these challenges, but I'll let uh, Mr. Zaman to talk about the solutions uh, to, um, to, uh, to, fa to, to face these problems. Uh, this is the last slide. We think that uh, we cannot, uh, we, we don't have the expertise tomorrow, today, the one we really need in order to uh, to make real models uh, of uh, climatic changes. We need to go very down on the ground. In France, for example, it's true that there are regions when you have uh, droughts. Donc c'est très différent. Donc la situation peut être très variable. This will be very variable depending on, on the place. Uh, you have to go really low if you want to, to, uh, to help the irrigation. So the water, we've said it uh, many times for long years. The, uh, the IPCC made out an expertise in, has expertise in the water, but it's not about all the knowledge. There's also a governance party, there's the monitoring, uh, monitor, uh, managing the, the usages, and uh, 
uh, great progress to be, could be done in terms of uh, water management. Maybe not exactly what is done in developed countries, but uh, there's many countries today when uh, the, the water is wasted. Uh, this is due for a, a due to a bad expertise and bad usage of the water. So this is a point on which we could uh, make important progress, especially as we know that the principal impact of the climate change will be on the water, on these two aspects, these excess and the lack of water. So uh, we really appeal, uh, so uh, the, the IPCC makes us a, 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 an expertise of the knowledge. I'm saying it knowledge on the subject because uh, on the site on um, the financement organisms we like to, to finance things but whatever what there is knowledge and governance it's not a priority that's why that's not this, uh, clear enough we have to uh, to hit them with a stick this is my message thank you thank you very much mr Rodon, for this uh, word of warning that make us understand that knowledge is the, the basics for for understanding both quantitatively and qualitatively for resources and a better forecasting of the impacts of climate change. I think we'll be, we'll switch to Philippe Maison Grande. Uh, would you like to come here and take my place? Philippe Maison Grande is uh, accountable for the spatial, uh, for the land and hydrology science program manager. He is land and hydrology science program manager, what kind of knowledge bring your uh, knowledge in when it comes to water cycle in general? Thank you, Alexandre. I'll try to answer the question. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be taking part in this session, and I'll be trying to show you uh, to what extent and uh, how the special industry and the CNES, the agency, for which the agency for which I work, can be useful when it comes to water management and in order to face the topics, the uh, challenges linked with climate warming. So I've been trying to uh, represent the, uh, the what's at stake, the challenges. We have a sustained SDGs that are at the heart of our objectives. We have data that is a synthesis at the core of these SDGs in terms of uh, demography, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of global heating. When it comes to demography, uh, the uh, figures are quite approximative, uh, but quite, but close to reality, we are, we are expecting 2 billion more people by 2050, which means, which means increasing pressure on energy and food. When talking about food, we always talk about agriculture. Agriculture represents 75% of the fresh water that's available. So 75% of our resources, uh, when it comes to fresh water, goes through agriculture. Agriculture is always linked. There is a cor correlation between the need for agriculture and demography. There are political things at stake as well. Borders, uh, different countries uh, upon transboundary, the amount of countries on transboundary basins um, has gone up. There are biodiversity issues. The biodiversity, the uh, earth observation has been crucial in order to describing uh, housings. It's a very, a very useful indicator to describe housings, given the fact that rivers, wet wetlands, and uh, coastal zones uh, gather lots of population. The, the, the lion part, the main, main part of the world's population, that these regions are also quite affected. There is uh, connectivity issues because of dams and pollution-related uh, issues uh, that that are always correlated with health issues. And finally, global warming plus two degrees by 2050. Um, I, I remembered one, one thing. I, I observed that uh, plus two degrees by 2050, this is quite plausible and this will have impacts when it comes to this water cycle with an acceleration. Uh, but it just means more rainfalls, more intense rainfalls, and it will have an impact upon the water cycle on the very uh, short, on the very short term, which will cause extreme uh, weather events such as floods, droughts, uh, fires, all the register, all the scale of uh, natural disasters that you know by heart. Uh, as we heard, 
the network of in-city stations, uh, in-city networks are melting, they are falling apart, as you see on the right part of the screen. What you see in blue is still operational. Uh, this is a slide, uh, an additional slide to what we've seen earlier. Um, it's additional information to what Jean-Luc has been showing earlier. This is, these are the topics. So it takes uh, seas of adaptation, lots of adaptation projects. Next slide, please. And that will imply, that will impact, that will affect different levels, uh, economic levels, security levels, uh, environmental levels. So we need reliable data. We need long-term data, both at national, international, and local level. This is a picture of the first information we gather when it comes to um, sea level. The on est environ on est sur une moyenne de de growth. It's 3.3 millimeters per year since the beginning of uh, of the metrics we we came up with in the 1990s. You see, it's uh, 2.9 somewhere in the middle. Now we we've got uh, we deal with 4.4 millimeters per year. This curve, this trajectory is quite interesting since this is the result, the integrated re result of everything that occurs at the continental level because there is a dilatation part in this curve, in this trajectory, and a part that is due to the heating, to the global warming, and to the sea level rise. So we have also to take into considera consideration the, the time aspect, the time dimension, because historically we've seen we satellites you know, satellites give us informa vision information, but time information as well, and we need even more of them. When it comes to hydrogen, different types, we, we have several tools in order to visualize uh, data. There is a need for precision, for, for big resolution, and we see the extreme um, weather phenomena uh, need readaptation of the metrics, of the tools. This is, this is the, time, the time thing once again. So when it comes to the resolution, to the precision, nowadays we have Sentinel satellites, so it's, um, we have time scales. Well, it's a very, a very five days. This is our precision when it comes to our time-based, time-wise resolution. In addition, the precision of this data is crucial. This data has got to be reliable, unless it's quite useless and pointless. So this data is validated uh, after in situ campaigns. We need in situ for the uh, for the satellites in, si in situ uh, information. Metrically speaking, we need you know you, it's a synergy between the satellite based information and in situ field information. This results from a synergy between satellite measurement, in situ measurement, and modelization. When lucky, you have you have got. Uh, you've got reliable day, satellite based data. Sometimes it's more complicated, sometimes it becomes more tricky because it involves uh, um, a, a whole range of information that you don't always have. And that happens to be quite complex sometimes. So, that sat sat satellites are very useful for certain kinds of information. So, this slide is showing the uh, continental surface aspect as we saw. You can see here uh, the time uh, time evolution since the 1990s with evolutions, hydrologic evolutions. Where we have rainfalls, we have islands. This information changes the scale because it's not a world scale anymore. It's a, a basin scale. And you see the management going downwards alongside along the, the scale you, c you come closer to management so that it means you can um, base upon this information to work on field in situ these measurements as show this slide are validated in situ they are available on TEA you will find thousands of virtual stations that are at the uh, crossroads between rivers and measurement stations and find many stations, many measurement stations on the lakes. Next slide, please. Don't remember whether, whether or not I, I told about it, but it's very useful uh, since it gives you a very important component of this water cycle. Each 
part of this equation has got its uh, Earth observation satellite family, uh, which you can measure you're using gravimetric uh, satellites, 1% of them uh, representing the variation, the evaluation of what you observe on the surface of the Earth. You can see there are also more superficial thickness has been involved into it. On the right side, you see all the insides. You have waste holes, of course. so-called sweating, which is the most, the most complex uh, variable. It takes mapping, it takes meteorological tools, and appropriate uh, assessment to see what, what the evaporation looks like. We have, uh, we have the Krishna mission uh, that will be Krishna mission that will uh, last until 2024. And the flow that I've been showing earlier in 2022 and 3, we have the topography of the whole surface. Next slide, please. I try to go even faster. This is the convergence of the altimetric family and the um, visual family within the CNES. Every 21 days, we propose uh, pictures of uh, water levels and lakes and rivers above uh, 100 meters wide. We have these levels of water and flow, river flow. There is an illustration at the bottom of your screen showing you the Senegal River. You can you can see the classic way on the right side and the modern the modern way on the left side, covering the whole story the the whole story of the river during 21 days. This one of the we 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 were looking at putting in place uh, a new metrics family with a date with daily updating within the CNES. This is one of our projects. This is Trishna. This is a Sentinel-2 equivalent. It's a Fra France-India mission that, we, that is to be launched in 2025, the aim of which being to show transpiration evaporation. Two object we have two objectives, agriculture and coastal hydrology with a resolution, uh, a 57 meters resolution for continental and coastal areas. The, the topics platform. It's a pole thematic. It's, uh, it's named pole thematic. Uh, it's, uh, it's about infrastructures and services, IDS, so-called IDS. There is a second component, which is a, a research part with centers of expertise, scientific, um, with scientists coming up with algorithms in order to come up with uh, information we need and, and regional animation uh, ingredients in order to uh, orchestrate the transfer towards end users, those who, uh, who need it the most, the uh, stakeholders. The, this is now a slide showing the Venus satellite. It's, it's a French Israeli. Uh, it's revisited every three days with a five meters resolution. You, as you can see, we can see uh, the evolution of, uh, of irrigation uh, just as your human eye sees, the satellite looks looks at things the same way, with an updating a five days, five day phase update. So we can buy, we can perform some mapping with soil occupation, and these are the uh, the transpiration maps I've shown earlier. Next slide to sum up the three pillars of the CNES when it comes to Earth observation and programs, infrastructures, research, and downstream progs. Which downstream progs? Give us several examples. We have some in, in Africa, Senegal, Ni Niger, Chad, Congo, Burkina, Tunisia, Morocco. These programs, uh, both for SWOT or SCO, which is another yet another form of program with more climate approach, these naval Programs are elaborated in cooperation, implying institutional stakeholders, regional ones, private ones, and of course, universities and research. This is something new. Within the CNES, every special program 
has a got its aval, its, its downstream side. And the Moses project to end, we've been talking about it uh, yesterday, it's a very nice illustration of what this type of project is able to do here in Senegal, for instance, on the basis of, uh, of optics, the OMBS has got information when it comes to uh, water management uh, in these uh, places where people grow rice. Uh, in that case, this is one example of uh, how we can use spatial info. So the key messages that I would like you uh, to take home, and it's linked to Luke's presentation earlier, management requires measurements. Uh, that's obvious. These measurements require reliability, accuracy, and frequency. This is something that is uh, a specificity of our work. It is uh, one of the features of the tele detection. Maybe, maybe not. We don't have any monopoly on that. But and if uh, well, success of services rely on three pillars: operational infrastructures. Both words are important, infrastructures, because we often lack them, and they are, and they are of, of course, very expensive, and they have to be operational. That is something we forget about sometimes. Second fundamental filler, pillar, research. Research, research, and research. Uh, I guess you are convinced of that it is hugely important. You, can't, you cannot work without research. And then, of course, the co-construction with end users. I already mentioned talking about the Moses project in Senegal. Thank you very much. I'm ready to answer questions. Should there be any? Thank you, Mr. Mezangon, for this complimentary uh, light. By talking about users, we will precisely launch an intervention made by you by Mr. Laurent Viardier, who is the Director of Planification and Program at the Water Agency, who will talk us uh, about uh, the actions uh, implemented uh, and what the uh, satellites can bring to the water agents. Bonjour à tous. D'abord, je regrette de ne pas être présent avec vous et de pouvoir participer au débat. Euh, et puis j'espère ne pas être redondant avec les autres intervenants de cette réunion. Je, je vais dans cette séquence vous présenter le, le point de vue d'un établissement public en charge de la gestion de l'eau sur le, un grand bassin hydrographique qui est le bassin Adour-Garonne, euh, qui représente le grand sud-ouest de la France. Euh, tout d'abord, pour vous dire que d'une manière générale, euh, l'utilisation de la connaissance est vraiment primordiale dans l'action, dans la mise en œuvre de l'action pour l'adaptation au changement climatique, dans l'objectif de l'accélérer. Euh, cette connaissance, c'est à la fois la connaissance du passé, euh, même récent, pour euh, objectiver l'impact du changement climatique, notamment en suivant un réseau de stations sur lesquelles nous allons examiner les impacts du changement climatique sur des stations qui sont peu influencé par l'activité humaine. Et ça, c'est particulièrement important pour objectiver les chiffres du changement climatique. Mais la connaissance est aussi au service de l'avenir, euh, et notamment euh, dans notre bassin, au service des acteurs locaux pour les appuyer dans la gestion euh, quantitative, puisque c'est un des enjeux importants de notre bassin sur le bassin d'Orgaronne. En application de notre stage et du plan d'adaptation au changement climatique, qui a été validé en juillet 2018 chez nous, euh, le comité de bassin a mis en place une stratégie de retour à l'équilibre quantitatif qui se décline en, en plusieurs axes, que je ne vais pas forcément décrire ici, mais cette euh, stratégie s'appuie sur la connaissance pour éclairer les décisions euh, politiques, les décisions publiques, et pour donner aux acteurs locaux les ressources, à la fois scientifiques et techniques, pour passer à l'action. Et notre conseil scientifique, le conseil scientifique du comité de bassin à Dourgaronne, est mobilisé pour se tenir en centre de ressources euh, auprès de ces acteurs-là pour mettre en œuvre cette stratégie. Alors dans ce cadre, le recours aux technologies satellitaires est un 
des chantiers que nous souhaitons vivement développer. Parce que ces technologies pourraient nous être utiles à plusieurs titres. D'abord, parce que nous avons besoin d'une meilleure connaissance de la ressource existante. Nous devons mieux les connaître, mieux les localiser, mieux appréhender aussi les volumes qu'elles représentent afin de pouvoir mieux les mobiliser dans le futur. Euh, c'est les volumes, c'est leur disponibilité et pour ça, les imageries satellitaires peuvent nous aider. La deuxième chose, peut-être moins implicite, c'est qu'on pense que ces technologies satellitaires peuvent nous aider à la gestion dynamique du soutien des étiages. Alors, notamment, on doit rechercher, on doit pouvoir rechercher à partir de ces images, de ces images satellites, à mieux connaître en temps réel les prélèvements qui sont faits dans la ressource en eau. Euh, et pour ça, on pense que utiliser la télédétection pour améliorer la précision des données qui sont utilisées dans tous les outils qui permettent la, la supervision de, euh, et le pilotage euh, de, de, du soutien d'étiage va intéresser les acteurs, les acteurs locaux dans la gestion des lâchers d'eau, par exemple, la gestion des stocks disponibles en eau. Et enfin, un dernier point sur lequel on pense que les technologies euh, satellitaires peuvent nous aider, c'est aussi une meilleure anticipation de l'intensité et des risques liés aux périodes de sécheresse, et notamment la sécheresse agronomique des sols. Euh, on pense que les technologies satellitaires peuvent nous aider au travers de tout ce qui est fait sur les données d'humidité des sols, euh, peuvent nous aider dans les bassins versants à être utilisés en gestion préventive, c'est-à-dire pouvoir éclairer les décisions, notamment de tous les partenaires agricoles, en matière de gestion des assolements, de répartition des cultures, mais aussi nous aider en période de crise à prendre les bonnes décisions et à bien les anticiper en matière de restriction d'usage, euh, voire suspension des usages, puisque c'est des choses qui peuvent euh, généralement arriver dans les périodes de crise. Alors, pour faire tout ça, des collaborations sont d'ores et déjà mises en place entre l'Agence de l'eau et euh, notamment le Centre d'études spatiales pour la biosphère, le CESBio, qui est basé à Toulouse, mais aussi et surtout, on va dire, en partenariat avec des acteurs opérationnels, et on peut citer par exemple des projets qui ont été mis en place entre le CESBio, l'agence, et la compagnie d'aménagement des Coteaux de Gascogne, qui est un gestionnaire de l'eau très important sur notre, sur notre bassin. On se nourrit aussi des expériences qui sont menées avec l'aide de l'agence et d'autres partenaires sur le fleuve Sénégal. On parlera notamment du projet MOSIS, et ces, ces expériences-là, viennent notamment contribuer à l'amélioration de toute cette connaissance, à la fois sur les données de prélèvement, sur les sols, etc. etc. Dans l'objectif de donner à tous ces outils et à cette gestion des images satellites une, une, une dimension très opérationnelle, une portée très opérationnelle qui sera vraiment au service de la recherche de l'équilibre quantitatif sur notre bassin, dans un contexte où, on le sait dès maintenant, le changement climatique a d'ores et déjà un impact très fort, très très important. Voilà, je vous remercie de votre attention. Nous remercions encore les, les agences de l'eau du coup pour cette participation. Thank you very much for this uh, remote participation. I'll give the floor to Madame Agathe Bezel, uh, who is the director at CNRS. And she's responsible for ecology and, uh, and water at the CNRS. Madame Zen, as a researcher in anthropology and uh, sciences of the environment, what type of knowledge uh, seems to you necessary to answer uh, to the problems and of uh, global changes? Thank you very much for this question. We, we are four o'clock. Thank you for, have, for inviting me to, um, to add uh, some information to answer to the challenges of the, the water, uh, completely uh, tied up with the uh, cl climate changes, something that is integrated, fully integrated uh, in a whole uh, group, not only uh, climate, that's much the water management. Uh, merci. Thank you for the slide. Uh, is apprehended uh, is in the CNRS. You, you know that it's, it's uh, the biggest institution uh, in Europe uh, uh, in, res uh, in research. We have 210 laboratories in Europe uh, interested by the, the subject. 
That's 2,900 uh, scientists going from the climatology through the hydrology, the economy, the geography, the, the, the uh, chemistry, and, and, and so on. Just to show you that the diversity of knowledge, we're talking about the knowledge, we should go, we should say the knowledge is that answers more the, uh, the size of the challenges connected with water. So all these scientists uh, allowed to answer at the same time to uh, scientific uh, challenges because there's a lack of knowledge. Everyone's going to produce in certain uh, areas, not only because we have no ways to monitor it, but, but there are new challenges that appear. Uh, environmental challenges, we know it perfectly, we are perfectly aware of that, and society uh, challenges. Well, we'll see that the physical data that is fundamental to take in consideration and to, to monitor are directly in connection with the human, the human in the territories. And the knowledge is produced by diversity of knowledge uh, of the scientists who come in from a very different experience who will help and uh, will cross with the, all these uh, mm, elements in order to answer the uh, the challenges. So we have to mobilize all these elements to elements to help the decision, decision makers, the managers uh, on international level, but also at the local level and regional level in a very precise way. If we uh, sum up this knowledge uh, concerning the water, that there are disciplinary, uh, uh, transdisciplinary, pluridisciplinary. They are necessary to answer to the complexity of the challenges. We're talking about measurement and the capacity by uh, observing through the satellites and also the necessity in complement, uh, complement with observation downstairs uh, in situ. We have monitoring, it means uh, training, it means capacity to collect the data, to interpret the data, and then to do something with it. So this is a whole uh, a group of processes uh, lots of data, it's very difficult to, uh, to use it. So observe, measure, experiment, how we can simulate with a certain uh, number of data, the fact that we are X plus X degrees, how the environment will react, how the, uh, uh, how the, the vegetation will uh, react, what type of resilience the cytites will be able to, uh, to create, to, to live, with all that and, and uh, also to uh, uh, produce um, mitigation. We have this, mm, this kind of very precise uh, con um, data through the sat satellite and others, plus the, the, all the, uh, the history of societies that is fundamental to be taken into consideration because this is going to help us to better anticipate, to better accompany the so, yeah, societies and the territories in the process of transition through uh, which we have to go. When we're talking water, of course the data as we've seen uh, on the uh, icebergs, we, we've seen the, the rainfalls, we're, gonna get in, uh, we're going down in uh, lower zones like lakes, like uh, the rivers, the small ones and the biggest ones with all the transborder questions that may appear. Everything that is underground too, so this is a, a whole uh, spécialistes de mais aussi en interdisciplinaire. On all the continents is present. On small and big basins, in all the envir environments, continental, desert, tropical, on the poles, with plus the traditional uh, dimensions. Now let's get back to the previous slide. We have to take it into consideration. So, of course, when we're talking about when we're talking water, we have all these uh, compartments that's relative to um, related to usages. Uh, it means uh, in that industry, agriculture, uh, household usage that requires management. That has to be studied depending on the context. Context uh, at a different scale, demanding uh, depending on the communities, uh, the, the population that is uh, that are considered. In other words, uh, demographic uh, elements have to be taken into consideration. So that forces us to, to think about the governance, governance. I heard in these days that we are referring to the French model in terms of uh, water management. I have competition here. 
That this is the, the traditional dimension to take in consideration with a future report to water and the environment. The populations being uh, in com direct communion with uh, the, these elements. If we don't take into consideration these aspects, it cannot uh, function with the management, uh, long term management. So, this is where the governance plays not only uh, by integrating all the actors of the society, the, the traditional populations that have a role to play with the water management because they consider the water as a common good. So we use whatever we need, but only when we need it, not in excessive uh, uh, way like uh, uh, like to, uh, to create economic activity. That answers also risks of uh, degradation of the quality of water, for example, uh, if there are uh, pollutants that will um, degradate the, the environment and risks, extreme, extreme risks that are uh, more and more frequent uh, floods, uh, droughts, etc., etc. So I've mentioned uh, the perceptions, the practices, etc. And these are questions that are studied also by the science and uh, that have to be taken into consideration because we consider water and the climate we hear, the water and the health Chikonkonya, water as a vector, but also uh, with all the challenges to connect with the, the problems, uh, bacteriological problems with water. For example, COVID period. period. Remember, some researchers with the pub in partnership with the public actors and private sector were able to make, uh, to proceed to a monitoring in the framework of a, of a project that is called Obepin, uh, that is uh, watched internationally to use water as a warning. In other words, to measure in rivers the presence of COVID, to monitor the emissions and to anticipate the place where there was uh, some number of uh, infections and then to uh, use the water as a mean of analysis, analysis of the quality of the environment. It's uh, monitoring at a very small scale to go to, very, uh, to the much bigger scales. The water and the, uh, the food we said, which we, we talked about when we're talking about agriculture and through evolution of practices, food practices, water and the culture, hey, here they are again. Here they go again. Uh, there are also the, all these uh, ceremonies uh, in, repo in uh, relation with the environment, uh, the, the fact that people dance that they explain the reasons for, uh, for rainfall or lack of rainfall, uh, this relation with beliefs. This is something to, I'm sorry to use the occasion of what is happening around us to, uh, to mention this dimension without which, uh, in certain contexts, uh, adaptation and development projects cannot function. So if we don't work together, the scientists, the communities, the users, and the uh, actors of the socio-economical uh, world, we won't be able to preserve the resources, or the resource. So I continue, it allows, uh, uh, as mobilizes uh, very m many disciplines through all the cycles. It, uh, we, we, we talked about the cycle of the water, but the uh, carbon cycle is also very interesting, and other cycles, they all together. It's interconnected, the interfaces, We've mentioned the atmosphere, but, but we also have the surface and what's under the ground. This is all interconnected, of course. Of course, this allows to consider the socio-hydro socio systems by integrating their societies and uh, territories uh, with the uh, hydrogeological processes that are in the world in order to understand the system uh, in which we are. We're going from the global to, uh, to local, and we go, we're talking about quantities, availability, access, or the lack, and the quality. Quality uh, on the uh, moni monitoring. Oh, here's the next slide that uh, says what, what I just said, but on an, in another uh, form. We know it. We, we know the cycle. Of course, we all know the, the scales, but, but when we replace the, um, uh, the SDGs, uh, we see uh, that so many people concern us if we 
and think about the water access for the human uh, usage and the, the access to, to sanitizing. And let's not forget the, the question of resources, which is connected with the, uh, with the environment and good health, the biodiversity, as ensured biodiversity that that is uh, that, that ensures the preservation of resources and the maintaining of its quality. We've heard a lot to talk talking about the bi basis, social basing on the nature and the roles that uh, human zones could have. So it's water that is here, but also the mangrove is when we're in the uh, continuity term uh, because we're connected with salty, salted water, saline water, and uh, and all the other elements that are represented through uh, the objectives of uh, sustainable develop development that are ac actually a uh, means to attain these uh, goals. The, all that is integrated in and in dialogue with the objectives of sustainable develop development. Like to the two other conventions with the desertification and biodiversity, to, to consider them overall, it will be very difficult to tackle the, uh, the challenges we are facing now. So as far as possible, we have to integrate them all to the context in which we are working, which is precisely what we try to, to do in the framework of a program that has won an international contest. I, I think uh, it's not an IPCC report. It's not a water report for the IPCC, but it's a program that, we, that is going to be funded by the French government, aiming at considering water not as a service for us, but as a goal in itself, a common good. Uh, the aim being to develop research and innovation to accompany transition. So that's what we are at at this moment, me measurements, systemic measurements in order to face upcoming challenges and consider water as a common good. It's a 10 years program mobilizing, mobilizing the whole water French water community, um, and we do hope this program will allow us to accompany, to support this transition. It's quite necessary when it comes to management as well. And there are six main challenges in a nutshell. It's about anticipate, anticipate, anticipating, meaning it, it has been great. There, there has been a law concerning water in 1964. In, uh, in France, it was a, a, a tremendous uh, legal framework, a legal tool that favored the fact that water quality and water management um, in the world hasn't been as impacted, as, it, as affected as it could have been. But things has, have changed since then. The approach is far more dynamic, far more global. The climate consequences and other phenomena uh, to momentum, so other possibilities are uh, taken into consideration when it comes to it with adapting our management. So the, it's about positioning ourselves on other scales in terms of basins globally, but also locally when it comes to uh, very specific challenges. And there is a footprint. We, you've all heard about water footprint rather more often than not more often than not in quantitative terms. So it's about, but what's, what we are interesting in is to uh, make it meet a qualitative approach as well. We are less used to it, but it's very, it's very useful as well. And it's very linked uh, with, with human activities. Water Sentinel, we've talked about it, so talking about COVID, but we might use water as a middleman, as, a, as an indicator, as something that will crystallize some issues and that would be extremely relevant for health problems and for climate and for environmental issues. We have to come out this silo. We, talk, we have to be talking about water, about the oceans, about biodiversity, but we have to uh, draw the dots between these topics to come up with solutions that will be adapted and resilient. This should allow us to support the transition towards a new resources governance and a, mo a more sustainable society. The sustainability science favors an approach that takes into consideration both 
uh, knowledge and data production fundamental ones and much more uh, specific specific approaches with playmakers from the social and economical world while uh, with mobilizing playmakers from every part, every stakeholders, NGOs, population, companies, private companies, uh, governments. It's, it's about institutionalizing, institutionalizing within a scientific approach, this kind of approach which is, in our opinion, essential. And of course, we have to share data. We cannot stay at home. You cannot keep your data for yourself. And that concerns uh, international institutions but also universities and researchers and governments or private companies, what's at stake is even bigger now. So we have to share data for common good inten on a, on a, uh, intentionally. So it's a huge program. This is to last 10 years and mobilize many scientists in France from various fields of expertise, sociologists, historians, chemists, biologists, anthropologists, etc. So it's within this dialogue logic uh, in order to, um, to speak up and reach out to the youngsters, those who are to manage water in the upcoming years and decades. It has to be, of course, uh, it takes dialogue within specialties, within fields of expertise, but also transversal, transversally between fields of expertise to share knowledge and build together knowledge and data for, for, for our common interest, for the good of us all. Thank you. <laughs> Merci, Madame Ozen. Thank you, Ms. Ozen, for this shared vision that allow us to understand Data are not always figures. Behind every figure, there are many various human and natural causes, factors, that uh, give us the possibility to take into account sustainability science. I would like now to, uh, to propose uh, questions and answers or comments and answers session. Uh, should anyone want to? Uh, if anyone wants to take the floor here. Yes, I'm just going to uh, switch it on for you. Hello, Pierre Poulka, uh, Sustainability Development Group Suez. About the satellites, I've been hearing about uh, biodiversity measurements thanks to satellites. I don't think you talked about it. I don't think you, you, you mentioned this aspect. A couple of words about it. Did you hear me? Ça marche. On va y arriver. Uh, oui, effectivement, je à propos de that's right, when it comes to biodiversity, uh, I was mentioning, uh, I did mention this, uh, this aspect, saying that uh, Earth observation by satellite is as it at its best in terms of efficiency. Uh, when, it, when it comes to building observation, housing observation, housing is conditioning, so to speak, the, pot the uh, charge potential because you see population dynamics that depend yeah. upon the environment. It's a theater that is created by several indicators. This is one of the first uh, uses of uh, Earth observation uh, by satellites. We have uh, species density, mangroves, uh, various types of housing, uh, spatial and dimensional um, and time frames in order to determine the potential of biodiversity, first thing, second thing. Uh, it's an aspect that is a bit more um, shown in the media. It is what we do using satellites to localize uh, animals in order to, to see uh, in what direction 
the movie is very it shows well in the media uh, it looks nice on TV uh, but it's it's less efficient in fact and there is something in between as well uh, the other day I was interviewed by um, a journalist from uh, France Info uh, not on my field of expertise because biodiversity is not my field of expertise but yeah, there is visualization tools that allow following the um, trace of penguins you follow penguins uh, thanks imagery pour voir l'évolution you follow the the moves which is why you can know the a bit of your behavior but this remains uh, quite it, it shows well it looks nice on tv it's interesting for and it's it's efficient for two three four species but it's in fact quite limited in quantitative terms uh, i was spoke talking about the data pool this data pool is within a, a data terra in which this research infrastructure is in close relation with our research infrastructure in link with biodiversity and ethical measurements this data terra um, this it's an, a research infrastructure specialized in uh, research and in situ information it's another way to to um, to gather together two types of measurements well data terra uh, wide data I, it's it's a network a, a data production and biodiversity monitoring tool when it comes to the penguins you were mentioning the penguins but we do the same thing with turtles we follow their migration their migration paths we we, we see um, where in what direction turtles are aiming so that you can measure uh, temperature water temperature at different depths that are not accessible to us humans so that uh, the animals give you the possibility to measure things that you humans wouldn't be in the capacity to measure because it's not your depth thank you the cost question a question about money perhaps do you hear me yes Cyril Anquilo, I'm uh, the direct development director of agro paritech for world chair we manage projects in Africa and Asia. I would like to thank all the experts that, uh, that took part in this discussion. I was at the plenarium yesterday, and that's yet another error. We were asking questions about the reality. We used to ask question, questions about the reality. Uh, now it's over. Now we know what's happening, and we are starting another era. It's all about how to manage, how, what to do, and what to do. Uh, we we are gathering gathering more and more data, and now it's about comparing data, about the reliable reliability of data. Uh, very often on field, people struggle. We we send surveys, by the way, to our par uh, our partners, asking how are you going to ensure the quality of data, of the data you will be using to compare things, and second thing climate warming extreme weather phenomena will have impacts when it comes to infrastructures which is key uh, when it comes to water treatment so perhaps perhaps you would like to comment on that and thank you for for the uh, the huge quality of uh, uh, of your presentations thank you Thank you very much. What I would want to mention is that in this whole work we've been we've, we've uh, come up with identification of the uh, impactful climate phenomena. It comes from a, a survey we managed with climate services mobilizing key users, end users, and their knowledge for the for information building within an IPCC report. You cannot go to that. To that, you can. You cannot reach that level, but you will find the most, de the deepest methods existing nowadays in order to build data that will help decision makers. It's event 
studies, specific ones that will really have been a huge impact in order to see why, what has been modified and why, what are the implications for the future, and to what we could get prepared. And that can be solid, but there is also data quality, you mentioned that, very clearly. So you have observations and there are limits. You have observa observations to answer specific questions and there are limits. You have uh, analysis and there are limits. And you have climate models, global models, regional models. Every time it's, it's a huge work in adequation with the question being asked based upon the data you have and the question of understanding of uh, processes understanding because this is the, this is the physical understanding that will bring trust to a result plus five percent close this couple on is physics uh, basic physics this is what gives a very solid result between the uh, the heating level and in the intensity of, uh, of rainfalls for example that was very short indeed but I would I wanted to mention the need for deep methodology and the need for common construction between the scientists, uh, climate services, and the users. Uh, this common approach can, is something you can learn. Um, so you, can, you could put it into training, and we need it at, in every aspect, this capacity to, to update knowledge uh, with time. We have to leave you very fast because I have a, there is another panel in which I, I'm supposed to take part. I'm used to say uh, that we shouldn't be talking about uh, climate change, but impact uh, of climatic change and global changes. This is the example of big cities uh, in Africa. We know very well, we know very well that they will have two big problems: uh, the the raise of level of seas and uh, very abundant. The rains, uh, especially as we have this bidonville, uh, that's a problem. So uh, sanitizing water, they will have pro quality problems, very serious, uh, that the that the uh, that, that the urban uh, flood problems. There will be problems to exit the water uh, because of the raise of the level of the sea. So we cannot s change the climatic change with global changes. And so for me, it's fundamental. Thank you very much. A uh, last question, okay. A uh, small question to to, again, to, assign, to associate the socio-economic world that doesn't have the same approach uh, uh, that uh, things in terms of risks and opportunities with this notion of uh, common good. How do you still imagine to associate it and how do you, in a certain manner, as the adaptation problems approach, there are there is so, some emergency to do pragmatic things. How can we, uh, how can we, uh, uh, marry uh, all these stages with the, the expectancies of the social economic world. Well, it's a program for 10 years with a certain number of actions, meaning that there is the remobilization of the knowledge that is already acquired, because the, we have lots of it, but we didn't use all of it. Maybe there is a way to answer certain questions. This is something to see. We've, we've already identified uh, quite a lot where there was a void in data. One of the first actions we'll try to deploy as a number of uh, sensors in experimental zones, but at the scale one, in order to have a monitoring of data, bigger one on the regions. This relying on, uh, on, on existing uh, uh, tools like uh, these workshop zones, where well, we have at the, at the same time a certain number of systems uh, for measurement uh, for there for 20, 30 years that could be, com uh, that could be uh, uh, completed and can uh, buy other data and produce new actions. So we can cross section the, um, uh, the existing data that, like we've never done before. That would be the first exercise 
This is the first uh, uh, work uh, year. Uh, throughout this first year, we have to continue to advance uh, certain equipments in order to, uh, to bring new data. This is the first training. Uh, moreover, there's a whole process that will consist in dialogues. This is exploratory, this, uh, this, uh, this program. We'll try to organize a dialogue, a little slightly different from the existing one, in order to build together a certain number of questions and to bring uh, together answers by mutualizing our knowledge, measurements, whether it's measurements, uh, monitoring, or anything else. So we will create a think tank that will maybe organize all that uh, thematic schools, uh, academic schools for students, but also in a dialogue with the, the world of territories. So this is it. We'll have a panel of uh, tools that will allow uh, in different times to bring answers and to build, uh, to build a puzzle, if I may say so. And we've built a program, uh, a program for 10 years that's just to give us uh, time to, uh, to do things. We have so many answers. We try to find answers to the questions we're going to, uh, to implement. Okay, well, that's, it's ambitious, I know, but it has seduced the uh, International Scientific Council and the government accepted and, uh, and we'll have time for financement. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll take on the challenge together. Thank you, Agat, for this answer. We'll have to, to close the, the session of q and but we'll give the work the, the work to um, Eric Tardieu to close this session. That has been uh, very rich, Mr. Tardieu. Merci. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Um, Alors, je, je voudrais commencer par une, par une citation euh, qui, qui me vient à l'esprit euh, euh, à la fin de cette session. C'est euh, une citation de Topaz, hein, Marcel Pagnol, qui dit à je ne sais plus quel cancre euh, au début de la pièce, « Je vous condamne à l'incertitude ». Et j'ai entendu cette phrase assez jeune et elle m'a toujours <rire> marqué « Je vous condamne à l'incertitude ». Et je crois que ce qu'on a essayé de, de regarder aujourd'hui, c'est comment justement faire en sorte que cette incertitude qui est l'une des caractéristiques fortes des impacts du changement climatique, en particulier dans le domaine de l'eau, puisse être levée euh, le plus rapidement possible et à, et à plus, le plus en plus d'échelles euh, possibles. Euh, on ne peut bien gérer que ce que euh, l'on peut bien connaître ou bien mesurer. C'est euh, l'une des phrases qu'on prononce souvent, vous le savez, à l'Office international de l'eau. C'est un peu simple, un peu simpliste sûrement, mais euh, c'est effectivement... Euh, une vérité assez euh, universelle et nous voyons bien des, des variations de fréquence, des variations d'intensité de, euh, des événements euh, les alio, liés à, à, à l'eau et donc euh, ces, ces incertitudes nouvelles nécessitent des connaissances nouvelles et à cet égard, je n'y reviens pas, le, le rapport euh, du GIEC, le tout dernier, constitue des avancées vraiment intéressantes en ce sens qu'il descend dans des échelles territoriales qui, qui se rapprochent de plus en plus des besoins de, de la décision des acteurs publics, des acteurs privés. En France, on a l'habitude d'être fiers et à juste titre, je crois, de notre réseau de suivi hydrométéorologique hein, qui est mis en œuvre par un, un grand nombre d'acteurs publics. On a une agence de l'eau en témoignage tout à l'heure. Et c'est vrai que ce système d'information sur l'eau euh, français, qui est un modèle reconnu, euh, atteint ses limites aussi hein, dans, dans le cadre des nouvelles modélisations qui sont nécessaires et de ces nouvelles euh, incertitudes. D'autant plus qu'au-delà de la connaissance sur l'eau euh, elle-même, et euh, Agathe Eusen a insisté là-dessus, on a besoin de connaissances au pluriel, hein, de plusieurs disciplines qui doivent être mobilisées euh, de façon à ce que des connaissances diverses, des connaissances pluridisciplinaires permettent d'appuyer les décideurs et les acteurs dans leur euh, territoire. Ça may help uh, the actors in, on the territories. That means also the innovation, uh, new technologies, special technologies are uh, uh, new innovation, uh, extremely important. We are very happy that the CNES uh, witnesses it 
just mentioned that we uh, follow uh, together at the OEO at the scale of basins, which is uh, we are we very much and the basin of the of Congo, the second uh, biggest basin in the world. That was the the object of mobilization of these special technologies uh, for uh, special usages for the Congo, but uh, which is the navigation. And we also work on other geographies because uh, the, the French Guyane, uh, Brazil, and Suriname uh, possess two subjects to uh, knowledge about using the spatial for water and the biodiversity. And I think that we expect a lot from these new sources of knowledge, uh, whether they could be connected with new technologies or new practices, new capacities to mobilize the society, the users, and these subjects will uh, bring a lot. As finally, and it's been said, it is about adapting not only our usages, but also uh, to adapt our societies and uh, no, our behaviors uh, in our relation to the water resources in uh, challenges concerning the resilience, protection of uh, population, and we need we not knowledge, knowledge uh, renewed all the time on systems of uh, early alarming because uh, water may uh, uh, may uh, may create uh, disasters. We know uh, we know we know uh, uh, that this is one of the biggest and well-known uh, impacts of the uh, climate change on the on the resources in water. So all these usages of water. And uh, so it's the, us the user that will have to adapt, and that should enrich not, not our knowledge, shared knowledge. Uh, I think that's uh, an element, particularly important element, remembering this, that every context, hydrographic and human, is different. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the challenges are crucial. And relation to human uh, relations with the resource and with the users, that also has to be analyzed scientifically and valorized. So this is uh, how, by sharing our experience in the, uh, of all the, our knowledge, we'll, we'll, obtain, we'll, we'll manage to take on the mm -hmm. challenges of the climate change by marrying uh, different uh, territorial scales, globally but also locally, by marrying uh, the, the, the different uh, science disciplines without ever forgetting that this knowledge, the new knowledges, these networks, monitoring uh, reinforce networks will serve to taking decisions, better taking better decisions and to uh, create solutions and also uh, to, to engage uh, better uh, Compartments. Thank you very much to all our speakers and all of you for your attention. And I think that this, uh, with these words, the, the session is over. Is over. Thank you very much for the uh, for the speakers and uh, thank you also for the technical team.
take it. Um, it works. You can listen to me. Okay. On va commencer. Show is stars. Bonjour tout le monde. Oui. Everyone, both here and online. Uh, bonjour à tous, bonsoir à tous. Welcome everyone. As we are broadcasted on YouTube, I will moderate uh, this uh, panel in English, but I saw that you all have headsets, uh, so we'll have a mix between English and French. In English, and there will be a mix between French and English speakers, as you all have, you know, a translation. Thank you uh, for this translation. Uh, you will all be able to follow this uh, panel discussion. So I'm very glad to welcome you today in this panel discussion, artists committed to climate and the environment, but maybe what is under is the most important. New actors, you know, of environmental mobilization. And I'm very glad to welcome in this panel discussion four speakers, very important uh, and very much engaged in these environmental uh, issues. Uh, welcome, John Girard. Um, so you will tell us what happened this morning, something very big in the uh, University of Glasgow. You're an Irish artist and uh, you are here as also a part of the Art Climate COP26 program by Art of Change 21 with the support of the Schneider Electric Foundation. Lucy Otta, you're also part of this program. Thank you for joining this, uh, you know, this um, initiative linking art and the environment here for COP26. Lucy Orta, you are an international artist uh, from the very renowned duo, du, duet or duo, I don't know how to say, Lucy and Rory Orta, and you also chair of art and the environment of the University of the Arts London. Welcome Cédric Carl. French uh, visionary, pioneer, and also co-founder of Solar Sound System, Paleo Energy, and many other initiatives. And thank you very much, Gilles Vermoderoche, Senior Vice President of Corporate Citizenship of Schneider Electric. Um, Schneider Electric Foundation and Art of Change 21 team up for like more than five years together, we are bringing art and innovation at each COP since COP21. And here again, we have, you know, this program with this foundation. Uh, and so Gilles will uh, tell us more about how art and youth are important in his action. And now, uh, the camera can't show uh, Yuli, but he's here, and it might be a very good transition when we will talk with John. You will understand why. Yuli Lucy, artist and activist from Tonga. So I would like uh, to start uh, maybe with the slide which is after, just to tell you that, as you have understood, there are three artists and innovators who are part of the, our program here, uh, Art Climate COP26. And there was also another action, uh, which was a mass book workshop which took place uh, some days ago, and which is part also of this initiative. And maybe you will understand something later on the slide, that's why I want to show it to you now. So mass book was part also of this program, with, uh, with um, a workshop which, is, uh, which took place and which had a great success uh, here in Glasgow. So let's start 
let's start with the next slide and let's discover and let's discover a sh very short video, just a few second video of Flair Oceania by John Gerard, just which uh, just you know, and start this morning at the University of Glasgow. We will see the image sh should move. Yes, so you can see a flare. Okay, you can also all go and see that now at the south facade of the University of Glasgow. And so, John, uh, thank you for joining our, yes, our Art Climate COP26 program. It's a great pleasure to have you. Can you please tell us a bit more about this huge installation and, okay, what is the story and, um, and why, as an artist, is, was it important for you to be here in COP26? Okay. Um, thank you very much, um, Alice. It's wonderful to be here. Um, this is, you can hear me, yeah? Um, so this is a work called Flare. Um, it is exhibited on a six meter by six meter LED wall at the University of Glasgow. Um, and you can visit it tomorrow between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. and then it's finished. It's only two days, so you have to go quickly. And the work uh, responds to a meeting with Uli Losi, who's here. Hello, Uli. Uh, which happened last year. Um, this is Uli. Um, which happened last year at Madrid at COP25, in which Uli responded to work of mine called Western Flag that you can see here, which is a flag of smoke, which is a flag which remembers what's called the carbon legacy on Earth. And Uli said, this is very interesting, John, but I must tell you that the ocean is burning. The ocean is heating. And I went away and I thought about this idea of the burning ocean and came back to Uli with the idea of making an, a flare as an alarm for the heating ocean. Because Tonga, as the ocean heats, is threatened. The nation state is threatened. And this is both a flare but also a flag. It's a flag for a nation and a home, an ancestral home, which may simply disappear, which would be a great tragedy for both the Tongans but many people in the Pacific Oceanic region. But the reason, Alice, I think it's important to bring art to COP is because, in a sense, um, art doesn't achieve anything concrete. But what it can achieve is to move the public uh, in two ways. One is to feel more, to feel the fact that the oceans are heating, that they're absorbing up to 90% of the heat that the Earth is producing that's been trapped on the Earth. But also to move individuals to innovate, uh, to invent new worlds, to tackle the crisis that we are immersed in. And um, uh, Art of Change 21 is supported by the Schneider Electric Foundation, who are also very, very passionately supportive of innovation in electricity and in the digital, you know, to try and resolve some of these issues. So I just think it's important to bring big artworks here to try and move people to do, to, to do more. And John, just uh, maybe uh, a quick explanation about the technology, because some people might think it's a video, but it's absolutely not. Okay, so maybe step back one slide and just play it once more. So this is a simulation. So it's a virtual world. It's based on a portrait of the ocean in, 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 in Tonga, which Uli, Uli took pictures of for me. And it's produced in what's called a game engine. So it's a simulation, a virtual world. So it looks realistic, but it's completely and com totally algorithmic. So in a way, the reason it's interesting to put it in the world on an LED wall is because you have the real, you have the University of Glasgow, and then you have the virtual, and there's no border between them. They rub up against each other. And of course, it also looks a little bit as if the water has risen up to the level of the university, which would be an extraordinary thing. 
Okay, so I hope you will share this flare image and ask all your friends to go there tomorrow uh, to get pictures, to see it in real, because it's a great experience and a very strong message too. So now I would like the next slide, please, for Lucy. So today was another very big day uh, for our, you know, uh, art climate COP26 program. As Lucy was like, um, I would say, uh, oh, not in a jail, that's not the white word, but she couldn't share her, her experience with the outside. She was within the university, uh, the Glasgow School of Art, with students where she had an activation, activation uh, around Nexus architecture. Please, Lucy, tell us. So this is in the minute, one image we just came out from what you have just done at the uh, Glasgow School of Art with students. And when I was joking with the jail world, it's because no one was allowed to enter the university except you, a photographer, and the students. So we only have images to, to share now. Yes, and there will be plenty more images to share in the coming days. So I've been working um, all day with students at the uh, Glasgow School of Art on a customization of the Nexus architecture. So Nexus architecture is the uh, collection of overalls that you see here that physically link people together, creating these momentary communities. And what I thought was important about this COP, the COP26 coming out of the pandemic, was to link young people to draw out the voices of young people, voices, the youth voices for the climate, climate justice. And so I decided to uh, work with Glasgow School of Art and the students there will be collaborating with uh, students at the University of the Arts London to create this collective manifesto for climate justice. And we will be parading them after they've completed their customization because this customization is going on all week with students uh, from Glasgow and London creating this chain of solidarity between the two cities and we'll activate it in the public space so this body, this collective body will take over the urban environment in London on the Wednesday 10th of November as a culmination, a coming together of all of these youth voices around climate justice. And Lucy, maybe uh, we have put other works, one about Antarctica with your main project about uh, no borders and how we share, you know, uh, this Antarctica which belongs to, to any country now. Um, which is a symbol of our, our common interest, but also out of water uh, as culture from what you do around uh, water issues. And from Amazonia also related to biodiversity challenges um, in your career, like 30 years on social and environmental uh, challenges. Um, you include in your work like so many issues and maybe there is something why there is something to, to which is very important in your work you try to be between solution with kind of functional sculptures as your boat sometimes help to depollute water for instance and also a work of art you between you know the two Absolutely. We feel it's really important to bridge art and life and to take art out into the wider community, uh, this practice of social engagement, of co-creation, of uh, bringing different voices forth into the public sphere. And um, Alice mentioned the Project Antarctica is also about the unification of, uh, of uh, nations coming together to create this no borderless community, a world community based on common values of peace and equality. So all of our work is uh, tackling these crucial issues of our time uh, that now we can't dissociate the social from the ecological, from the environmental, from the loss of biodiversity. And uh, we hope that uh, the works, for example, like Amazonia Lifeguard, this life 
guard who is out to collect these species that are in danger of disappearing are also bringing forth these critical issues to wider publics. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you, Alice. Uh, so um, now we will switch into French. You will uh, you will speak in French, um, Cédric. So you are also part of our Art Climate COP26 program with Paleo Energetic. We are very proud and happy to have you in this program. Yeah. We have collaborated for you know, for a long time together. Uh, and um, so can you tell us about this project? And this project is now in an art gallery here in Glasgow up till the uh, 12th of November. And you present what we call the Paleo Energetic Fresco. So Cédric, tell us more about that. Merci, Alice. Um, thank you very much, Alice. Uh, my career as, a, as, a, and as an artist has been oriented upon uh, uh, teamwork and design. We've been working since COP21 upon a collective intelligence project since working upon the trans energetic uh, transition topics. We uh, noticed that many pat patents ha had become public, which was very important, of vital importance um, alongside the climate um, emergency topics, the question being how, many, how much time do we have to go about this transition. So we decided to collect collaboratively, collectively these patents, these inventions that had become public and that we would throughout a collective intelligence project in cooperation with citizens, with engineers, with artists, with scientists, and I want to talk about scientists, I, I, it's not only a, it's a, uh, human studies as well, sociology, uh, art specialists like Jan Thomas from the uh, Sorbonne, Paris 6, working uh, upon the way art affects society, about the impact of art upon society. So this project gathers communities, very wide communities, uh, around this uh, topic about patents that have become public. So it's a connection in space and in time, bringing up, bringing true solutions that are public, meaning they belong to us all, because when something is, so something is of public domain, it's available for us all. So you can, so you can uh, find local solutions, which are very often uh, technology-based, which allow local communities to um, to appropriate, to, to, uh, to be empowered by technical solutions that are of public domain now. One example, one concrete example, our jewel that we uh, took out from this project. This project, it's a book, it's an, uh, it's an exhibition, it's transmedia, it's a project that is as well, that sh it's a virtual museum as well, and it's a, a project that is reinvented progressively, so its form is changing day after day. Uh, so it's not one jewel, it's a, we have several jewels that we found in the history of patents with a system. A, back, back in the 1980s, there, is, there was uh, a way to, to replace alkaline uh, single-use batteries, uh, not as the ones we use now. They would be used, they would be one-time shots back in the days. And it, it's a $18 billion market per year. We get 216 tons of batteries each year. So it's, wha it's one million, uh, you, you get to one million very often. It means you have 500 million tons every 10 years. So it's a, it's a, a huge ecological problem. Uh, I don't have time enough to speak about Africa, by the way, but it's linked with that. So we, we, find we found a patent uh, that had been established back in the 1980s uh, by an a guy from Austria who, uh, who would be working in the United States with the NASA. Uh, he was working with the Apollo mission as well. He was specialized in batteries, and we, we are showing that in the past many, many great ideas appeared 
and are now available for the wide public because the, pa the patent is over very often and it's in the public domain. And as it, as it happens, we have open source solutions. So here in Glasgow, uh, there we have this fresco, this pa paleoenergetic uh, fresco and the discovery of portraits of uh, some inventors, like this lady who created a solar, a solar house at the beginning of the 20th century. That's right. We've found some of them. We've printed them in uh, real size. We want to take the ghosts out of the cave and we printed their portraits one-to-one uh, -one scale. You can admire them in the gallery and we've also remodelized in 3D digitally their inventions to bring life back to them since they truly deserve it. So you, see you can see the posters at, uh, uh, in the gallery. There are QR codes. Uh, it, it, it gives you a link to some video and audio files which uh, brings life back to, the, to their inventions and take these valuable ghosts out of the cave. Maria Telkes, this is the lady you were, you were talking about, an engineer. It was in 1937 and she would be projecting and building uh, solar houses, passive houses. She, she, she wanted already in 1937 to store energy in private houses. It was just before World War II. That's incredible. That's um, an extremely valuable ghost. And as, as it happens, the past is rich when it comes to that kind of investment. In your afternoon, this gallery to, uh, to welcome the public and to explain. Yes, we, were, we, we spent a whole uh, week here. And then the Sunday, we'll give these, uh, the torch to, uh, to the students from from Oxford and he will go to Oxford for a, for a future ex exhibition and the idea is that uh, this exhibition will stay here in the UK and so because we also ex we also are showing it in different schools uh, it's inspiring when you want to rebuild um, uh, the, the, when you want to illustrate the the, the subject of uh, of the transition that is a big task and not easy task Okay, so, so it's a very good uh, transition with Gilles Baudelage because this down uh, keywords that could the action of the foundation, the youth, the access to energy, uh, to renewable energies. And here uh, you can see Gilles, uh, his tongue in the cheek. Gilles has, uh, uh, has participated to the Mass Book Project. We had the chance to celebrate five years of the uh, Paris Agreement last year with the French uh, diplomatic network. We were uh, were projected like this in the, the whole world through this project and uh, who uh, had become the symbol of the celebration of the fifth anniversary of, uh, Par of the Paris Agreement. So Gilles made a creation and uh, he shows re regularly on a regular basis in your social uh, uh, networks, the, your, your, your mass portray is someone who has a very serious uh, function in a big group, but who's able to play the game also uh, together with us uh, about the creativity. So, uh, youth, art and creativity, youth, that's something uh, on which you wrote a book, you've expressed very uh, often uh, personally, the art was maybe uh, less used in the, in the field of uh, sustainable development. So Schneider Electric is a pioneer in accompanying our actions. How do you see? <laughs> How do you see your role in the framework of these uh, mobilizations, youth and art? So you are masked too, I can see. With uh, a little bit less of uh, artistic design. The question I'm asking myself quite on a regular basis, uh, 
since I've uh, been uh, dealing with uh, uh, the sustainability of uh, in uh, state electric, the six cap French capitalization um, uh, company that uh, has transformed to uh, to do uh, energy efficiency and others. I'm asking myself in my life, in my choices, am I piloted by my knowledge or by my, my emotions? Est-ce que uh, la plupart des choses... Uh, most of the things I do, is, do I do them because I know them or because I feel them? I don't like this reflection, but I will take it as an example. I'm always, uh, always watch at this uh, big CEOs who say, I've changed a lot because at, at night I see my uh, kids at, uh, eating at the table. They say, daddy, mommy, what are you doing? The plan is important and so on and so on. So I do things. I have a list of uh, CEOs who explain their engagement for the sustainable devel development. You say, I don't like it. It means they don't listen a lot to their uh, collaborators. But it means also that the emotions, the engagements, the convictions come also from things that are not really linear. So we have a person from the CNRS. Uh, we had Valerie uh, before. All these linear subjects that that say that we should st radically change everything. And nobody does it. Uh, some do, but, but not enough. Lots of do it. Not enough. I would say I, it seems that we all have to contribute, artists and others. And there's not many uh, artists who uh, take this subject as a key subject. When you're at the, at the COP like here, we can be amazed of all the people who are here for the first time and you see them in groups, and you, you ask yourself, say, why, why these people are coming at the COP? I met this morning a group of uh, mm, women engaged for the climate. Why this group, not another one? Why a group of youngsters or others? Okay, we made an event with Alice. I would like to thank her very much. And the country like her. We made an event in Marseille uh, a few weeks ago with artists like that uh, around biodiversity. One of them said, I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what I'm looking for. I don't know the, if the artist has anything to say on the subject. Yes, they have lots of things to say on, this, on the subject. Me, uh, this morning, uh, when, I was, uh, f when I was facing the flag, uh, the flare of John, there was an emotion. You can read a big book, a very thick book, uh, to explain how the nations uh, of the uh, OCD nations uh, became rich thanks to petrol. Well, this flag, this flag in the sea that has a, a, a power through the carbon emissions says it all. In one image. And, that, and so uh, per subject emotions, you have to call them to progress and in a uh, in, a, in a company that is absolutely rational, like General Electric, where you have only engineers who design solutions of uh, energy efficiency, energy piloting, measurement of energy, its consumption, and so on and so on. All that to, to reduce the level of uh, consumption. Uh, they want to integrate also the uh, renewable energies. It's very interesting to, uh, to take a transversal uh, path, pathway, the pathway of art, To, uh, to call people, to, uh, to make them move a little bit, and also to create coalitions, weather coalitions of, of thoughts and reflections. Second point, uh, that was first one. Second point, I am amazed and interested uh, by seeing how as I've been dealing with uh, uh, sustainable uh, development for 22 years that's Schneider Electric and I'm not the only one here and at the beginning of my career they, they, people would ask me well, what, what's this sustainable uh, development why why do you try to do that there was artists uh, he's, he's, he's somewhere here the art has mobilized a certain number of actors that try to uh, to mobilize others at Schneider Electric with our foundation we try to open new pathways, complementary pathways. 
And I think that the evolution of the usage of uh, sustainable development expression today, we are happy to see the touching the climate. All the companies, when we ask them what, their, what is their policy of sustainable development, they say that they talk about climate because it's essential for our century. But we managed to do it uh, uh, so the temperature does not rise more than 1.5 degrees and 80 percent of uh, 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 percent of humanity in 2050 uh, are below uh, above the uh, the poverty threshold it will means that we reach success this battle for climate and the battle for humanity uh, of the fight of youth of youngsters there are three reasons because never been so many youngsters on the planet 1.5 billion uh, on the planet between 15 and 25 years this is a great growth of demography. These young people need to find a position like in the society, especially when they are from uh, the uh, developing countries. We can see what what the COVID crisis made to the young generations for themselves and for, for the future, and also because they are the innovation of the world. The study you've talked about, uh, Alice, is to show that if the knowledge or should I say the knowledge is theoretical. If, uh, if the double prices belong to people that are usually more than 40 years old, the tradition is to, uh, to find the, the solutions that, uh, that change the world uh, happen in the heads of people who are under 30. The easiest thing is to talk about uh, computers, Facebook, everything that is digital. We all know here that this was born in people that were younger than 25. But you could, uh, since the beginning of the industrial era, you could take lots of lots of initiative of uh, translation of science into reality. It was very often uh, entrepreneurs who was under 30 who, uh, who, was, who was the leader. But let's not forget that it's the, the young people who are going to, to find the solution of the, the upcoming century. We, have, we need to save the climate, we are here for this, but uh, they, they have to be interested in saving a piece of humanity because it's also with them and for them that we'll have this approach. The logic that we're doing with the artists uh, is to, uh, to, uh, to, put, to, to create this bridge between humanity and the environment. I cannot resist to Arthur Bertrand has stopped at the French Pavilion, and I told him, come uh, wave for us. Come and uh, come to tell us a few words, Jan. It's not a coincidence that I am meeting you here at the same moment uh, while we're talking about art, or creativity, or climate, and of the role of, of the artist today uh, in front of the climatic crisis. It's a happening that was not planned. You came here to hack the, the conference. Alors ça c'est quoi C'est un c'est sur des diodes, c'est quoi These are these LEDs. What does it look like? It looks it looks extremely beautiful. <coughs> Amen to that. It's great. I don't know what to say. Uh, I mean, cops are useless. Since 1992, I take part in cops and nothing changes, in fact. The, the level of uh, di uh, carbon dioxide has never been lowered after a COP. COPs don't change our level of uh, fossil fuels consumption and, mar and carbon dioxide. COPs are not marvels. Uh, COPs are not superheroes. People can be superheroes. Don't, don't wait for, for policy makers, for decision makers, for politicians. Politicians are driven by electors, and we are the electors. Citizens can, can be committed. Uh, now, I see artists are, are starting. I've been into uh, environmentalism for 20 years. I, I attend art galleries, and until now, what I had noticed, I, I had observed little commitment. Uh, sorry to, sorry to, to say it, but uh, on the other hand, I see it's changing. And you're a good example, 20 year old. Now, uh, back in the days when I was 20, I wasn't afraid of the future. Now, are there any youngsters that are not afraid of the future? 
And yeah, that's, that's sad indeed. Uh, I won't be speaking longer, but talking about art, uh, I, I was taking part in a, a conference about art last week, and I, I asked a scientist to be more committed. I was calling upon the institute to, be to become a, a platform that I could invite Greta, for example. Nobody reacted, so we'll keep on fighting. Uh, I think that, unfortunately, there is a generation between 60, 80 year old people aged between 60 and 80 are, lit are a few are rarely committed. I've been trying to do what I could for my uh, for my for my children and the youngest. And uh, I will, and yeah, and I love you. Only love can save the world. Thank you. Yan, tu es Yan you are awaited over there, south south wall. There will be a photo call with John. He will welcome you. Uh, what are? I, I uh, the exhibition starts at eight, but you can you can pop it any any time earlier. You feel invited. So, the connection the connection has been created. Yes, and with there will be a legacy uh, projection with a, a last movie. You will hear Sting's voice during the the green cop, the green zone. Yeah, it's tomorrow at six p.m. If I'm correct. All right. So. That will be about it when it comes to art, creativity, and uh, people being committed and being involved, practically involved. As you see, there is a, a scope. Jan was t talking about the, uh, the, uh, the, the lack, but uh, there are artists that are committed. There are some, yes. Many, many, many artists. Two people are talking at once. At uh, Art of Change 21, we have rewarded 21 of them and we will continue to, to support. And we had more than 300 candidates for our art and environmental initiative. So um, we are. We can see that everything is changing now. The fact that John Gerard, who is a Pace Gallery artist, is here, and Lucy, international, well, an internationally re renowned artist, is here. We at COP, what is missing is the fact that people who are just focused on sustainability understand that the cultural, uh, you know, the, the, the ecological transition is a cultural transition. We have to change our mindset, and this is where culture is so important because it influences the mindset, what is, you know, the, the values, but also new aesthetics, how we can we live together, how we can change our values. And that is why art is so important because, as Gilles said, we can have the data, but it, if we don't do the cultural, you know, shift, nothing will happen. And uh, so that's why we are not like uh, Jan. We believe that we are strong, we are many, and uh, things will happen. We want to be positive. Um, okay, so I would like to share a question with all of you. It's about this role of artist. Here you hear, you, you, you share project, you, you collaborate with uh, uh, students, but what would be the next step? Let's imagine together, okay, the next cup or later, what could be the, the role of an artist? Would, would it be to be at the table of the negotiators? Where, where could it happen to get uh, the, the right leverage? Uh, why not? Uh, why not have an artist pavilion here at the COP uh, in the Blue Zone? Why not invite the artists to create their pavilion and to invite other people from around the world to come and converse? And so we're creating these bridges that need to be built between different people and different communities. Why not? You mean the art pavilion? Why not? It's a project, but uh, we have to work on it till the next COP. Uh, on pense qu'il faut créer un, un pavillon. Uh, uh, 
a, a pavilion, uh, an art pavilion, yes. We would invite artists and uh, ask them to uh, to commit themselves to uh, to inspire the upcoming generations. Because art schools are full of quite committed and motivated youngsters who would be happy to uh, to meet. They would work upon an, a commitment, a program. I I think it would be important. Uh, I work a lot with uh, art schools. Uh, and you do too. It's very important and it can be extremely valuable. I would say that um, it's important uh, to remember, you know, it, 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 the, the importance of, of a kind of a poetic or a sort of a poetry or um, a communication which is, you know, more subtle. Um, and obviously, um, COP26 is, is very focused on outcomes, but um, getting back to the idea of artists moving the public in different ways, the way that poetry can, or you know, the way that words, spoken words, ne don't, cannot necessarily move, move the public in the same way. So I would say definitely bring artists to the negotiating table, but um, Perhaps not as individuals speaking, but as strange poetic interventions at the table, you know, which will cause, you know, anxiety, you know, uh, different types of emotions that, that, that are, you know, distinct from the ones emerging from logic, you know. Um, but to bring all together. Five years ago, Schneider Electric during uh, COP22 in Marrakesh, Morocco, had thrown, uh, had installed its pavilion, its camp, its base camp, with uh, a, a, an artist specialized in upcycling. Well, it's, it's a bit of a buzzword today, this upcycling, and it doesn't sound as original as it would five years ago. And this shows to what extent the world has changed, which is good news. Uh, artists back in these days, in, s w in s some manner or another, would cross actions and thoughts uh, in a way that would precede what we, what we see nowadays. It, it, he was a pioneer back in these days. At noon, I was, uh, I was working with, with young people this March for Climate, uh, we see the potential in terms of commitment among young people. People want to express their, their, their worries, their emotions. Uh, and this is, this is what we see and what we hear. It's quite, it's, it, it's something you can observe in many places here during, the, during this COP. And I think it would be, uh, it would come handy to uh, to get some artists expressing the same feelings, the same these emotions, this anxiety, this eco anxiety. Let let's make the artist the tool that will push mentalities forwards and put commitments, push them uh, forwards. That would be extremely valuable. Uh, it's to make. <coughs> Artist can be uh, can be useful, uh, and artist can be essential when it comes to mobilizing crowds, when it comes to mobilizing hearts and souls. Uh, they they move us. Artists have the power to move us, and make they can make us build new things and build motivation. Vicious circle because I remember John uh, when you first came at your first cup I guess it was your first cup in Katowice uh, the cup 24 uh, we invited you it was not <laughs> that easy because that was not the most you know successful cup that we had with you know that was not crowded and but you met a climatologist, uh, you had this report uh, about what makes the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. 
and you get information. And I think that what can be also, also accelerated uh, is uh, more interactions between artists and scientists, because as soon as you have the info, um, you know, things are going faster. And you said about the artwork uh, inspired by Yuli that you didn't know that uh, the climate change was such a big threat for ocean, which is heating, and which might also uh, uh, provoke sea level rising, which is a, absolutely a big, big issue. So it's also um, the fact you know the information, in an, even in our, our super informed world, mm. you know you as an artist, it was not that clear no. uh, that you got the information of the importance of that link. And it's when you realize that, that I should do something. So there is also, uh, it sounds like we have all the information, but the mm. most important information with the good hierarchy is not always delivered. Yeah. Well, I mean, very specifically, I did not understand that the ocean is the great heat sink, you know, that it absorbs 90% of the, you know, excess heat that we're producing or that's being trapped by our activities. But funnily, you talk about Poland um, because when you invited me to come to COP, I had, it wasn't something I was familiar with you know, in COP24, you know, COP, it wasn't something I was familiar with. Um, you know, United Nations, Congress of the Parties, you know, it wasn't something that I knew. And I, I would observe that anybody who is, um, you know, connected with current affairs now in 2021 will know what COP is. I mean, this is becoming a much, much bigger deal in what I would call the common consciousness, you know, where people know about this gathering. Five years ago, they didn't know about this gathering. They might have heard of Paris, you know, as an agreement, but they didn't fundamentally know what it was. And I would say in terms of the role of artists, I think you're going to see many more artists coming, turning up, you know, saying, you know, we are part of society. We should be part of this gathering because our voice is important and can be valuable. So, and actually, Uli, you said something very interesting to a group of students this morning. Well, you might even say it again, where you told them you know, that their voices were important. Uli, you want to come here? So, Uli, Lucy, you're an artist. Uh, yes, I okay. am. Yes, I am. From Tonga and did when you both yeah. met, came the idea of flair. Uh, absolutely, and I believe everything happened by design. Whatever that design may be, it may be science, it may be art. Mm -hmm. But I just want to acknowledge that. I want to acknowledge the energies of Scotland. Being here, it takes me three and a half days. Without John, Gerard, having this conversation in uh, Madrid. Mm -hmm. And when I saw what he was doing with the flag, Basically, I was challenged as him to see beyond the eyes of our ocean is basically it's not only burning, but it's on fire. And it, it will be become untainted for all of us. But for me personally, what I was sharing with the students, what matters for me is the voices of the youth. That's what I'm here today. I'm here, took me three and a half days or four days and I was the only official to be able to get out of Tonga. And I, there's an honor for me to acknowledge my ambassador of Tonga to the United Nations. He's humbly sitting here with me. He has a knowing what's going on. So, and I want to add on what the voices matters. Your voices matters until the end of this COP. And I have a strong feeling I've been finding this, like everyone else, this COP, it will tend, the only reason why I wanted to, to, to say this, it's we are now negotiating, my feeling, this is a personal feeling, the negotiation is over. It's a matter of pushing, emphasizing what we can go forward and, and accelerating it. And I want to say something as an artist, 
how important art and how important science. What has been missing in the United Nations and the COP is uniting, is uniting the science and art like an, like an aeroplane. You have left wing and the right wing. Don't use that image. <laughs> so it's pretty much what I want to say, and I want to acknowledge on behalf of the children of the ocean from the Kingdom of Tonga, and I want to salute and say thank you, John, and thank you, Ella, and thank you for everyone for raising their voices for us. The ocean is on fire, and it's basically we are the second country in the world which is vulnerable for any natural disasters. And I must say that your voices is matter. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was I was joking and I said don't use the image of the plane because <laughs> but um, thank you so much. It was so important to have your voice, Yuli, because you are the starting point of the this artwork and you also are an, in the front line, you know. We are all facing climate change, even in Western countries, with heat waves, with uh, also uh, extreme weather events. But more than, uh, more than Western countries where we live, you are with the sea level rising and more extreme weather events, uh, you are in the front line. And uh, I think that artists feel that solidarity we have people here working very much with communities. I'm thinking about Lucy, always including communities, people in her work, in always, of course, uh, uh, Cédric too, participatory project and how it can benefit, uh, you know, other countries uh, with the these uh, open source solutions. Now there are many projects in many countries people can appropriate because they don't have to pay patent. And with Lucy, what you do for the seven by five, seven by seven or other projects is always related to community to bring people and to try to spread. And the Antarctica World Passport, thousands of people now have this passport like I'm a citizen of the world and I think that um, artists have the ability to gather and to, to spread the world and to gather many people and to feel united uh, to, to be to, to feel all in the same boat to feel all in this with the same heart uh, and uh, so I think it's very important to make understand that what you live is the same story than our. We are not different. We are in the same boat. And so we must be all responsible. Uh, okay, so we have seven minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe um, the Lucy and, and, um, and Cedric about this community, the fact you have worked, maybe Lucy, with so many communities, people. How do you see, you know, the, the, the possibility uh, of art to gather, to mobilize? That's why the title of the, of the panel discussion. Because you know how to bring, you had sometimes more than thousands of people in your event. How do you do that? Sorry, art, yes. Art has this tremendous capacity to allow the imagination to run wild, and it can help people to think of a new kind of reality. It can uh, drive positivity forward, empathy we've talked about with others. And um, I really believe in this uh, a new practice of co-creating together. In fact, it's not a new practice, social practice. Um, which began in the early 70s, but is now coming very much to the forefront of uh, a new kind of engagement where we're working together in collectives, creating common messages and uh, allowing those meshes, messages to infiltrate uh, the convenings like the COP. 
So um, it's very, the, all the work that we've been doing over the last uh, 30 years is now coming to this important crux point where we now need to get this out even further and to activate other people into the messaging that needs to uh, find solutions. And art has this capacity for us to imagine those solutions and dr drive those forwards. For me, the, this, 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 these words are, go uh, very well with the collective intelligence. Every cop is a new surprise. Each time we open uh, the box, we discover a, a small bomb. I, I was 20 years ago that I met uh, people from uh, IPCC, and I started to act immediately because Martine Lalleterre, 20 years ago, she told, she, came, she showed me curves. Uh, I could see that uh, it was accelerating, that it was going faster and faster, and she was right, unfortunately. Which means that the shock that is provoked uh, was uh, transformed into action. And usually the shock paralyzes, it's, it's scary. I think that uh, collective intelligence and the engineering of the change is to transform this uh, fear into action with positive force. So I think this is something, it's like doing Aikido with this shock and uh, to, uh, to, launch the, to relaunch the ball. So uh, the society and the artists can do it. And I think this is um, the message you have to illustrate, to, uh, to tell and to make luminous visible because future is anxiogenic to this topic. I hate the, the word utopia because that means that it won't work, it's too far. So maybe uh, we would have to invent the word to, to, to talk about the future that we are creating together as is possible. James Lovelock uh, calls you Nova Sen, uh, the era after the Anthropocene. I think that's, that's, a, that's an inspiring word. Uh, before uh, passing the floor to Gilles, I think that COP should force the nations to unite. <coughs> and that, that will maybe the next COP will belong to artists. I know John, Jen has a project to make the new society dance. The society has to dance together. I think that is this is what, what we have to do. We have we need to dance together. Gilles, uh, I'm giving you the last word as the President of, of Change 21, we have a road. Uh, it's been six years uh, since we've uh, shared the, this conviction that art should be present during the Cups. We, for each Cup, we, we uh, managed to uh, invite artists and to create pros propositions. Whether the, the audience is big or small, we, are, we believe in our convictions and we go forward and we are convinced that we're opening precisely doors that some people don't always see, but are necessary, uh, absolutely, and more and more. So I wanted to thank you for uh, this uh, common adventure this year, and I would like to give you uh, the last word of the uh, afternoon. Sorry, I'm speaking French again. Well, make a quick conclusion as you are able to add youth Cup and you who uh, are uh, very uh, powerful influence with lots of influence that is something I appeal to the French million that to uh, that, that I think that I think for uh, uh, that, that is helping us I'm sure they will uh, find a new problem for next year and they're gonna help us in this concrete idea that we share so uh, I am loving you uh, to make the final conclusion. If the microphone was working. There's no conclusion, there's an opening. Art is made uh, when you face, uh, I don't know, uh, a text or a play in a theater. So you're not like before. So the, the challenge of the COP is also uh, to make us different from what we were before.
because we don't know always why are we coming to the cover, not to negotiate the text. Not only, uh, it would be uh, ridiculous to, to think other than we are coming here to change other people. What should has to be used use for all of us? You are not negotiators. We're coming uh, to the COP to change yourselves. This is the first point. Le deuxième point. The second point is that uh, it's essential to, to be mobilized today for the COP of next year. Imagine that the civic society was not present during this COP. The text would be the same, the one that is negotiated now. But probably at the end of this negotiation for the text for next year, we would say, okay, uh, the, the youngster uh, seems to be happy. Uh, there are no demonstrations outside. The companies uh, say, uh, okay, they, uh, they deal with climate, so uh, they don't have to come anymore. The NGOs think that we are big enough to uh, not to move, and, but we'll, we'll work on our own. Now, if we're here, it's to, to remind uh, to people to, um, to be careful that the t tomorrow's solutions are not the solutions of today. I don't sh share the pessimism of Jan Tumerson uh, while saying that the emissions did not, were not reduced uh, as we wanted them to, to be reduced. We don't know what they had been if, uh, if there was no, no the, the, this mobilization of the 15 in la of last year. The demography has changed uh, over the last 20 years. Lots of things have changed. Lots of efforts have been uh, implemented. Maybe not enough, but you have to, uh, to say it because if we say anyway we, we, we go in the w head in the wall, we have to, uh, to aim at the world uh, 1.5 degrees. That it's not a staircase. You have to, 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 to make a maximum all the time to target this uh, world. Even if we don't manage, we have to, uh, to do our best to say that it's not true that we didn't do anything. The fact that we're changing our uh, modes of consum consumption and others, when you take the curves, you can see that things have, lots of things have changed. And again, I think that the future is probably this, uh, the type of COP, COP did not change a lot, but the, the societies have, have changed. Uh, they play the, the challenge of biodiversity uh, that is being created a lot in reflection with, uh, with, the, uh, with the interaction between biodiversity and uh, the climate. It's not right now who's going to tell uh, who's going to uh, deny it. She's she, she wrote a lot of things about it. Everything that you see in the whole world about it, we see uh, that, the, uh, that the climate is against poor people, but we're not against poor people. But the artists have this uh, ability as an avant-garde to, uh, to bring us to the synthesis of this subject. We cannot cut it like a, like a sausage uh, uh, repair uh, one slice and then uh, take care of them the next. Nature, climate, n humanity are com complementary sides of the same reality. So whether you have a bigger capacity to make a synthesis than others, thank you for your mobilization and uh, bring all your uh, friends artists will be happy to see them too. Well, uh, thank you to the French Pavilion. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, my uh, dear speakers. And uh, okay, let's continue the journey. Let's all go to visit Flair at South Facade of the University of Glasgow. If you do the march tomorrow, it will be very easy to find. It's very close. And uh, please follow, please visit the exhibition, please follow the images from this activation, and please go on artofchange21.com where you have all the agenda of our program Art Climate COP26 and supported by the Schneider Electric Foundation. Thank you.